world, and welcome to CNET's live coverage of the Consumer Electronics Show, CES 2016. It's the biggest tech show of the year, and we're coming to you live from the CNET stage at the South Hall of the Las Vegas Convention Center. I'm Bridget Carey, joined by Jeff Bacalar, and we kick things off every day this week with our show, Inside Scoop. This is the second day of the CES show floor that it's open, and we spent the past few days covering the future tech coming in 2016, including uh, smart home appliances, concept car tech, televisions, of course, TVs, it's not CES, without a giant TV that no one really needs, and a few robots and drones, naturally. There's even a robot that you can ride, and we'll get to a live demo of that in just a few minutes. But first, I want to talk about what the health side of wearable tech just continues to grow and take new forms. And some of it makes sense, and other things can be a little strange. You know? just, just a little strange. Yeah. Well, One of the bigger trends that we're seeing at the show, wearable tech. Now, for a few years now, we've seen companies want to strap all sorts of things to our bodies yes. at the show. So you and I were talking about this backstage before we came out here, and one of the first kind of companies that uh, was making a lot of headlines yesterday was Fitbit and That's their right. new initiative to sort of take over maybe a more higher-end smartwatch. Right, kind of getting closer to that Apple Watch side of things or that Pebble Watch has a color screen on it. Now, this isn't doing everything that a smart smartwatch can do, but you are getting some notifications from your phone with right. texts and side of things. Right. We're seeing video now uh, where the new model, the Blade, and you can switch it out with different bands. So a little more style. You know, Fitbit's popular, but you don't usually have a lot of options other than rubber. And I mean, if you go back and look at what that brand has done, a lot of their products have really focused on subtlety, whereas the Blaze sort of comes out and says, hey, this is a piece of fashion. It, you know, it's a, it's a fashionable accessory. Right. This, is, this is jewelry. This is something you want to show off. So definitely a change of pace for that uh, brand, but then, we got we to gotta talk about the elephant in the room with, uh, with Fitbit. Yeah. They're uh, at the mercy of a, a class action lawsuit dealing with uh, reporting inaccurate heartbeat uh, readings. Right, the same day that they came out with this new Blaze uh, watch tracker is the same day that they got a class action lawsuit over the fact that the claims are it's not accurately tracking your heartbeat. In fact, some in the claim were saying like half of the heartbeats per minute were being counted. Which is which is shocking. I mean, I don't think anybody ever accused a, you know, a fitness tracking, you know, uh, sort of biometric scanner device to replace a doctor or any kind of realistic medical advice. Right. But at the same time, it could be used as this complementary product. You need to be close. Definitely. I mean, none of, if you wear like five of them on your wrist at once, you're going to get like slightly different things because right. none of it's perfect. It's, it's like how you're going up and down is a step. Sure. But... It, yeah, I it's, mean... It's definitely, you know, I think if, if anything, uh, I think it will shed a lot more light on the category as, as a whole and sort of say, hey, let's take a step back and maybe look at just how accurate or inaccurate these devices are reporting these pretty vital metrics and uh, kind of go from there. You know, so with Fitbit being one of the stars because everyone you know knows Fitbit, there are some other ways of tracking that aren't something you put on your wrist. Right. Um, like the Hexoskin Smart, it's a new biometric tracking shirt. Uh, this is the second generation. So this thing has been out, but now it's got Bluetooth Smart, so the battery life is better. And here's some of the stats. You can work out in this shirt. Not only is it tracking your heart rate, your breathing rate, your breathing volume. So if you're like a heavy, Breather. <laughs> like so, it, it can tell you just like how much, you know, cubic volume of air you're sort of <laughs> breathing also, in. Insights on on your recovery, which I do not want to know. Like I rather just know how well I did, not right. how pathetic I am after right. the run. Right. And there's also sleep quality, but I hope you don't like track your sleep after you run because that's just nasty. It just sounds that's like I'm nasty. wearing this shirt for a very long time. I hope uh, there's some sort of laundry in between well, that. Okay, so speaking of that, you can work out an hour a day for five days a week and not have to charge this shirt so for nearly seven weeks. So the charging you don't have to do every day, just please, please wash. Be on the charge at least as much as, as, as other you know, devices. I, ho I hope they're sort of doing some sort of antimicrobial you you know, know, cotton 
right? You would hope. And then also, speaking of things you can wear, there is the Lumo Run Shorts. Okay. Now, the shorts themselves, the fabric isn't smart. It's what you put in your shorts to right, make them is, smarty pants. This is butt tech. This is, this is butt tech, it's butt guys. Tech. But it's butt tech. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Butt tech. <laughs> um, it, it is a, like, basically a, a device that you put in a pocket. Okay. And this thing is tracking not just how long you're running and how far you're running, and how, uh, but also... Uh, other kind of analysis, like your pelvic twisting. Right. Uh, so it's doing this all in real time and sending that data to a phone, which you're seeing on the screen here. This is the, the real time, uh, uh, you know, what your run is and how long you're running. But okay, that's a little different, you know, how you're how you're moving your pelvis. It's a step in an interesting direction. I think we're bombarded by all these pedometers and and you know products that kind of all do the same thing. It's nice to see something maybe thinking a little bit outside the box. But this next product I'm very psyched about. I'm sure you are as well, because finally there may be a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to not looking like a damn fool when wearing some sort of smart glass technology. Oh, yes. And this is thanks to uh, Carl Zeiss, the glass maker, lens maker. They've uh, sort of been working on this prototype, this tech that will introduce uh, the ability to sort of see things in glass, in your glasses, without, like we said, looking goofy. You don't have this giant thing hanging off the right or left side of your face like right. you do with Google Glass. This is this is the idea that the frames look normal and they, they've they uh, worked on the lens so that when you do put computer technology right. inside, it'll just look like the screen's floating in front of you. Now if someone looks at you, it looks like you got like something they'll on your, it. something's on your glasses. Sure, they'll be like, hey, wash that off. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least you don't have like, you know, a giant camera like Definitely, no, and I think, and, and yes, they're not inventing the, the actual computing tech. They're sort of just saying, hey, here's this vessel. We, could, we figure out a way for it to be displayed without a overbearing sort of contraption. Right, so when, so when the, the glasses do become something that you know, is a little more common, they're, they're there to rescue us on the fashion right, side. Right, you weren't too, too hot on Google Glass, right? Yeah, I mean, you're like fun for the moment, but you're not really wearing this thing right. all the time, right? Exactly. Uh, so here's something else mm -hmm. that may make you look a little crazy. Yeah, speaking of looking dorky, this goes <laughs> in the other direction. This is from Samsung. Um, all right, we talk a lot about the fitness tracking stuff that you wear on your wrist. Right. On one end, they kind of went smart here. This is called Tip Talk, and it's a traditional strap that you add to, um, or it's a, wa it's a strap you add to a, tr a traditional watch, I meant to say, and it'll do your fitness tracking, but... It takes phone calls. This is and cool. To, and to take phone calls. This is kind of, I can't tell if this is cool or not. To take phone calls. Yeah. You stick your finger in your ear. Right. And then. And go, happens? hello? Yeah. Kind of like some sort of get smart situation. Here's Seamus. Uh, actually, you can see a picture of him trying it out. He said in his review that he was in a really loud conference center and it was a little muffled, but he could make out. And that's the cool thing. Like, they figure out a way to, uh, is it bone conduction? It's not bone conduction, but it is going through your organs. It's just and, like, finger the conduction. vibrations are just traveling through your blood. So your finger, <laughs> yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> so your finger is actually the earpiece. Right. Which is crazy. And I think that's just on, you know, by itself, that tech's kind of cool. I mean, it is something out of out of a TV show of the past, but it was something ridiculous. But, you know, maybe if you had to take a quick phone call, you sort of, hello? Hello? Yeah, I mean, and people people will still think you're crazy in the supermarket. Right. But. Well, you see all those like <laughs> Secret Service guys always going like, you know, I want to do that. Yeah. I want to make. You look thing. important. Yeah, I'd be like, come again. Well, you know. And it, and they say the target price is eighty dollars, so it's not so it's far not, out that you might want to try it and yeah. not feel so bad. It's um, not over the top. I think it's something we may want to look out for. Right. And Samsung has a few other things they've been working on. They have a whole division of some strange wearable tech. Yeah. Um. And and that got people's heads turning the other day. So. How about a belt? Yes. How about a smart belt? It's not just a belt. It's called a welt. So don't, I don't think you should call your belt a welt, <laughs> no, right? No. Okay. We don't, as long have, as we we don't have to go with the weird name, you know. So why is this a smart belt, though? What does it do? Well, um, it's tracking how many steps, like everything does, because I need to know how many steps I take all the time, right? And how long you've been sitting. Okay. And this is the part I don't really feel comfortable with. Well, sitting is the new smoking. Oh, yeah. Well, so they say. Yeah. And then they also tracks your eating and your waistline size. Sure. So if you ate a lot one day, this belt's going to guilt you and say, if you keep eating like this... I won't fit you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It's right. like, like, you will gain two pounds in a month. Yeah. That's... I don't need my belt judging me. 
Um, there's enough judgment in my life from other devices. <laughs> exactly. That's what, we're just entering an era of judgment tech. That's all yeah. it is. But uh, yeah, I, I guess it's something that uh, someone out there might find interesting. This is more of like a prototype situation. Uh, we'll have to see if there really is a demand. But there's one product I wanted to talk about before we have to hit the break. Uh, they have a, Samsung also has a smart business suit okay. that, with right. NFC technology. That's they gonna, already sell this in Korea for $500. I don't but they want to like expand, expand it. So you'll be able to share your contact information by kind of literally rubbing up against somebody. <laughs> well, like it has NFC in the sleeve, right? Right, NFC so, in the sleeve. So, so it would be like, hello, what's your Jeff. Number? Oh, that's what's your not number? creepy. We just <laughs> met. Like you're obviously just meeting someone if you're exchanging information. Let's rub wrists. Let's see how, like, just like that. There you go. Hey, see, there I feel go. violated, but that's fine. <laughs> there you have You'll it. You'll never forget that person, though. No, you that, won't. That's a rememberable business card. <laughs> Uh, also, there is tech for women too. There's, yeah. there, there's a purse okay. that you know it doesn't have that creepy factor with you know rubbing purses or something. But <laughs> it does have solar panels on the side. It's called the Soul Bag Purse. It doesn't. Here's what I don't like about it though. They kind of missed the perfect point. Aside from looking like a honeycomb on the front, right. um, it doesn't store the power. You only get the power in real time. It, it charges your phone when your phone's inside of the purse. So, so you're getting a charge if you're laying out in the park and you have direct sunlight. Other than that, you know, you're getting like itty bitty charges at a time. That's a very specific situation. Yeah, I need that to look a little, a little cuter. I don't need yeah. the, I don't, you know, like I don't. And Function over fashion, I guess. I, I guess if you're going to the beach, but, right. but you know, I have a feeling that it's not going to be too cheap, you know. Well, apparently, four hours, right? Four hours of charging. Yeah, it 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 can get four hours of charging on a phone, but once again, you got to be outside. So right. you know, also put on that sunblock while sure. you're charging for four hours. <laughs> Interesting. All right, I, w I would like to check that out. I don't really. It would maybe get me to go out in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that's not really our expertise, it no, seems. No, it is not. <laughs> well, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be joined by a guest that's bringing a device that, well, it's what you get when you blend a robot with a hoverboard, and I want it to be my friend. So stay tuned.
Welcome back to Inside Scoop, live from the CNET stage in the South Hall of the Las Vegas Convention Center. I'm Bridget Carey with Jeff Bacalar, and we have a very special guest with us. All right, so not only is it a guest, but you brought also a robot friend. This is Achin Bomek, and he has brought, uh, he's with Intel, and this is the Segway um, personal transport by the company Ninebot, and it also is not just a, not just a personal, you know, transportation device, but it's also a robot. Yes. And that's, and that's where the Intel magic comes in too, right? Yes. All right, so can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so you are all familiar with the transporters. We all love them. Yeah. Right? We take them to the park and we take a little ride. But what's new about this is addition of human-like sensing and understanding with Intel RealSense technology. Okay. So I actually brought a little goodie to show you here oh, to your cool. audience. You are showing it for the first time today. Uh, oh, you get that, this everyone? Is the, this is premiering on Signal. So there's the special Intel RealSense module okay. that's specially designed for robots and drones. Mm -hmm. And with this, the robots and machines are able to see the world in three dimensions, understand the world, recognize humans, follow them, and then navigate by itself so it doesn't so, run into things. So when you're not riding it, this transforms into a robot around the house and the robot uses this technology to not run into things because it can, it can understand and process quickly that there is a table there, a wall there, yes. and, and what else can you do besides just know that there's a wall in front of it? Right, so let me explain some use models of why you'd care, sure. why you'd love uh, such a device. Yeah. So besides being transporter, um, let's say you have taken it to the park and you want to take a little walk. Oh look, our, our, our robot's having, is blinking, he's waking up. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, so it's transforming itself from being a transporter into a personal robot. Yeah. So when you're in a park and you want to take a little walk, the robot can recognize you and follow you like your dog does. Recognize me, Bridget. Yes. Okay. And then it will not just follow anybody else random and walk out, but it will actually stay locked on you and follow you like your dog does today. Right? <laughs> so that's in the park. Imagine in the home. Yeah. So as a personal robot in the home, it's able to go and answer the doorbells for you and recognize who's there, because you have trained that robot to recognize your friends, right? Your personal little robot. It can help you carry luggage or heavy weights. A lot of different things oh. that you want a personal robot to do. Do you want to answer in your door? I don't, <laughs> well, yeah, your friends? Don't, can you expand on that? Because the, to me, the, uh, that would you know, freak out my friends. Right. <laughs> yeah. So now, imagine the future where you are uh, letting people in because you know them, because sure. you recognize them. Right. right. So now if the robot can perform the same function, with very high accuracy, it's able to recognize people and you have given them permission to come in. I guess if you know you're having a party and people are coming over, you don't have to stand by the door all right, the time. It okay. could be like your little Jarvis. So I guess I would be okay with Well, we all got familiar with uh, a little pet pet uh, dogs in sure. our homes or cats. Yeah. Very soon I'm sure that we'll get very familiar with having personal robots in our homes as well. All right, so it recognizes my buddy, it recognizes you know all these people. What about somebody it doesn't recognize? That, that can it zap them? It. So, <laughs> so this dis uh, robot has been designed to be friendly, okay. not to be uh, uh, doing no, something harm. No, no force, no, no harm, excessive no harm, force, no, okay. But it is simply not open the door, perhaps. All right. right? Or but come I and report to you that, hey, there is somebody at the door that I don't recognize. Right. Do you want to let him yeah, in? Yeah, maybe we should check this guy out, okay. How much of a, I mean, smart home tech is a big deal at the show always. What, what else does this kind of, how does this fit into the whole puzzle of the smart home right. tech? I mean, not only is he just a buddy you can ride, but like, will he yeah. talk to other devices? Right. This is a very good question you bring up. In fact, we are very excited about this particular platform because Intel's collaborated with Segway to make it an open platform. What that means is the few functions that I've explained are the ones that you've already thought about, but because the developers can actually build a lot of different things on it as an open platform, we envision that this would become a hub of your home where it can communicate with other smart devices inside your home, mm. be a control function for other smart devices, smart and connected devices. So when you say it's an open platform, there's there's you know uh, software out, software out there that lets other developers sort of take that and say, hey, we see a viable application for our product to interface with the world. Totally. So yeah. Segway plans to first distribute a developer platform yeah. in the hands of software developers who can build new use models beyond the few that Intel and Segway are going to collaborate to build. Very cool. By the time the product comes to market, we hope there will be many compelling use models for it. So in terms of actual, as a, as a people, as a person mover, what, uh, you know, I know maybe you can't speak exactly on behalf of Segway, but from, you know, what we used to see with Segway putting out, where has that sort of technology improved? Right. 
So for that, I'd definitely refer you to Segway sure, yeah. because they are definitely the leaders in the world of, of uh, transporter robots, and they're improving that technology as well in terms of how easy it is to use. In fact, you'll be surprised how easy it is to use. Yeah. We've had complete strangers who have come and never used Segway robots try this out, and it's very comfortable. Mm. But it's the new stuff that you're adding, the intelligence. Finally, it's able to recognize the world in 3D, recognize its users. Those are all the new intelligent functions that we're adding to it, which is making it a really a special device. Right, very cool. So are we going to get more of a, a riding demo? Is that, are we able to get that right now? Or, or, or can, you, can you talk with this yeah. thing too? Like yeah, it has a voice interface. By the way, we are challenged here because of the it's a little lot sure. of interference of yeah. wireless, but uh, we have shown a demonstration of this in our CEO's keynote at CES, right. uh, where you're able to voice interface with it, give it commands, and it understands and speaks back to you. Right. Uh, obviously, it follows you when uh, it's in the robot mode. Sure. Now, now, right now it's in robot mode, but if someone wants to get on and ride it, it'd have to kind of go back to like, we will and it switch gears completely. Totally, it will push a button, so it'll go back to the transporter mode. And can, we, can we in fact, that? right before this uh, segment, we had somebody riding it out. Okay. Uh, do we have Lee oh, here? Oh, so here we go. Our lovely demonstration. Yeah, I want to see that transformation. Of, That's uh, cool. The transformation's great. Oh, he's slowly going down, down. So once it's gone to the transporter mode, now we can just ride it. That like was pretty quick. Segway transporter. And a, a oh, it's like a it's like a buddy that travels with you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've no, and it's got a bunch of LEDs sort of constantly buzzing around. Is there beyond just sort of looking cool? Is right. there sort of functionality there? So that's the if we consider the sensor and the processing technology to be hardware, yeah, and the understanding to be software, we consider this to be the art. How do you make sure that the device comes across friendly to you. Sure. Right, the way, you'll notice that it has eyes, right. and it's blinking, mm -hmm. and looking cute, and when you're having a conversation with it, it will look cute and connect with you. So all of the lights that you see on this, and the display with face and eyes are designed for it to be friendly. And we continue to learn more about what, what humans feel personal and personalized and sure. continue to improve those. Very cool. Some of them are obviously indicators to tell you whether the battery is low and stuff right. like that. But then more, it's the personalization aspects that Fantastic. we are working on. Now I hope Very next cool. year's CES, it also grows arms that can do my dishes for yes. me. You know, so like. Now we're talking. <laughs> we actually have the arms now. Wait, you okay. have arms? Yes, yeah. so yeah. we can we can actually in the in Intel CEO's keynote, we okay. have shown that we can add arms to oh, it. Oh, right. And the robot said, wow, are these my arms? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> These so, will be useful. <laughs> yes, and just like in the software applications, we expect innovations. Because this will be an open platform, we expect people to come up with accessories. Right. right. ARM is just one thing. Because we'll of that expect, open platform mentality right. as well, yeah. Think of you have heavy grocery, sure. and uh, you want it to carry it for you. It's people will come up with platforms to be attached. My right. robot pet slave. Yeah. I'm oh. all about that. Well, thank you so much for coming thank at you, and I appreciate it. And thank you for showing off the very cool Segway robot, buddy by Ninebot. And CNET's coverage will continue from the show floor all day. We're going to take a break, but stay with us.
Welcome back to CNET's live coverage of CES 2016 here in Las Vegas. I'm Connie Guillermo, Editor-in-Chief of CNET News. Patent reform has been a very hot topic in the tech industry for a while now. And here to give us a lay of the land is Michelle Lee. She's the director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And I will say she's the first woman to lead the office in the more than 225 year history of that office. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, one of the topics I just want to get out of the way right away is this whole issue of women in tech. tech. It's been a big topic of discussion for the past few years in technology. It's actually been an issue in tech for a very long time, but there's been a lot of heightened awareness about what is the reason that we're not seeing more women in tech. You lead the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. You have degrees in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. I would imagine that you know a few women in tech who are actually very qualified to be in the industry. What do you think of the whole issue? Well, I think it's important that the United States take advantage of all of its talent. Uh, we, our technical innovative companies are looking high and low overseas for talent. And we've got a lot of indigenous talent here in the United States, 50% of our population, that all we need to do is continue to develop and to promote and to encourage. So on, on that issue, uh, being the first head of the woman of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I took a look and I saw how many patents were being issued to women. And in a study that had been conducted over the 30 to 40 year time period, fewer than 15% of the US based inventors listed on a patent were women. So I think we can do a lot better. And as the Innovation Agency of America, the United States Patent and Trademark Office's mission is to promote American innovation. And in my mind, that's across all geographic regions of the United States and across, across all demographics. So we've got a lot of programs to encourage our young girls to invent, to make, uh, to create things, and hopefully one day to file patents and become future customers of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Let's talk a little bit about your background in patent. Uh, law and technology, you were the first patent officer for Google. The first head of patents and patent strategy for Google, correct. And so talk a little bit about what your experience was like in Silicon Valley in terms of innovation, IP, that's a big, um, you know, IP is everything in technology and one of the innovations in patent law. So my background in innovation goes back even before my days in Google. I was born and raised in the Silicon Valley and as a young girl, um, believe it or not, Connie, I built a handheld radio kit with my dad in our living room and I didn't know that's not what most girls did as an activity and that sparked my interest in creating and uh, inventing and from there I studied engineering. I've always worked in the tech industry either as an engineer or a computer scientist or later on representing some of the most innovative technology companies in our country and it's been a real privilege and I started with Google when it was a relatively young company. I uh, had the privilege of leading its patents and patent department and from there it went to a multinational corporation. When I first joined it had a handful of patents and by the time I left it had over 10,500 a little over uh, eight and a half years later. So when people talk about patent in the, patents in the tech industry these days, it's always about the lawsuits between companies fighting over their patents. I know you've made an effort to help, I think the word was uh, clarity, making pa yeah. patents clearer to help minimize these kinds of patent disputes. So right. can you talk about that? So businesses use intellectual property assets as a business tool. So if I invest in research and development, I want to protect that invention so that I can commercialize it and recoup the benefits, the financial gains of my hard work and innovation. So I've been on all sides. I've written patents. I've asserted patents in patent infringement lawsuits. I've been on the receiving end of patent infringement claims. And I've licensed and bought and sold patents oftentimes for very large sums of money. And at the USPTO, I bring all that business experience to what I do at the agency. And I think the USPTO has a real role to play in terms of issuing the very best quality patents possible. Because if you think about it, if a patent issues where the claims are too broad or not clear, businesses don't have the information they need to determine what space is safe to move into without stepping on somebody else's intellectual property rights. So the USPTO has a job which is to issue accurately and clearly patents so that businesses can make smart, informed decisions and really most efficiently allocate their very precious research and development dollars in new areas of innovation and not litigation. Well, if you're an Apple or a Samsung bringing a patent dispute, which has been a very famous one in Silicon Valley for the past few years, 
you have resources, lawyers and IP uh, experts looking at your patents. What if you're a startup entrepreneur? So thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> we have an office in the Silicon Valley, newly opened in its permanent location right. in downtown San Jose. And it's precisely aimed to bring the full range of resources that we offer to innovators um, exactly where they are. So for the first time in our country's 225 plus year history, we are now no longer in the Washington DC area. There's a lot of innovation occurring across the country, including in the Silicon Valley where we have an office, the Denver area, Detroit, Dallas, and really, we're bringing information about how to file for patents, how to register for trademarks, why is intellectual property important to all the work that you see going on, all these incredible exhibitors, all these innovators here at, at CES, how and what should they think about in terms of protecting their incredible technology so that they can bring their innovations to the marketplace and recoup the benefits. And we are there to partner with them to help them through that process on the intellectual property front. So how about a simple how-to? One thing that you would advise a startup. Don't forget to think about an intellectual property strategy early. Every one of these companies has a brand that they want to protect. They have probably some special sauce, innovation, or invention that distinguishes them from their competition, that if their competition were to copy that, they would lose their competitive advantage. So you can never start too early in terms of formulating your strategy, and it will change over time depending upon the competitive landscape and your business goals. But have a strategy from the start and begin implementing and consistently revisit it, and it will help you achieve your business goals. Let's talk about why you're here at CES. Um, I'm sure you see very early a lot of patents and get a bead on a technology that is going to be coming down the pipeline in the next few years. That's why all of us are here, to see what's coming next. So what are you excited about in terms of the technology that you're seeing? Well, I had the privilege of spending yesterday roaming the aisles here uh, in Eureka Park, where a lot of these startup and entrepreneurial uh, companies are. And there are so many amazing technologies. I'm a computer scientist by training. I worked at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, drones, driverless cars, 3D printing, virtual reality. I had an incredible demo uh, yesterday on virtual reality. And each one of these booths, as I said, has intellectual property assets. And we're here, we have a booth, I'm here with my team, and we're here to share information with these innovators, with these entrepreneurs, again, about how they should start thinking about intellectual property, how they can go about protecting their inventions that will allow them to succeed in the business market. So we're very excited to be here. There's no better place. Uh, I come from a tech background. There are some incredible innovators here. And I would say that these innovators should think about using our regional offices and taking advantage of them, uh, because oftentimes they're smaller and they don't have as many resources to fly out to Washington, D.C., sure. but now we're here on the ground with them. You opened the office in Silicon Valley back in October, which seems kind of late to arrive in Silicon Valley. Why, why so late, actually? Well, that's a good question. Um, any business that has a lot of customers in an area probably will open up an office there fairly quickly. Um, through the passage of the American Invents Act, we had congressional authorization to open up regional offices, right. and that uh, uh, act passed in 2011. So we went across the country. Almost every city across America wanted the United States Patent and Trademark Office in their hometown because we support innovation, we support economic development, uh, we support entrepreneurship. So we went through a whole bidding process and we chose four cities across the country, across all continental time zones, really to promote and encourage and foster innovation within those entire regions, not just those cities, those entire regions. So we're very excited to be out there. It's absolutely the right place for us to be. Okay, last question for you. Do you have a favorite patent that we should go up and look and read up on the on your website? Oh, I can't speak to, it's like choosing your favorite children. <laughs> uh, there are so many cool technologies in such a wide range of areas, but I, I fundamentally believe that if we don't have the intellectual property system that we have, our country would not see the innovation that we do. And part of our economic success and our continued rejuvenation hinges upon having that strong intellectual property system. So it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be a part of that. All right, well thank you very much for joining us here at CNET at CES on the stage. And uh, we'll take a quick break and then get back to our coverage with Bridget Carey.
with CNET's live coverage of CES 2016. I'm with Parham Arabi. He's the CEO of Modiface. And I'm also with Miriam Petian, who will help us show how this high-tech mirror works because this is something that we can have a little fun with today, I think. Absolutely. All right, this is, a, this is a makeup applying mirror, but actually the one you have on stage isn't a mirror. It's an iPad app, right? Correct. So this one is an iPad app. We have versions that are actual mirrors that are being used in stores. And the idea is, in your live reflection, we can showcase makeup. And like real-time makeovers. Exactly. Instant recognition of your face and application of makeup. OK. So uh, let's explain what Miriam is looking at right now, or what she's doing on her app. She's able to just kind of change it up with like just di different makeup palettes. Exactly. So in this version, we have different looks that are mm -hmm. created by makeup experts. And so she can select them. Adjust the intensity, so this one is a bit too intense, so she can actually make it less intense or more intense. And just try different looks to see what look is best for her for, for today. Okay. I guess, that, I guess the idea is that if you have this at a store, I'm walking into a Sephora or whatever kind of makeup shop would work with you, and then, oh, I want that shade. What would it look on me? It's kind of trying to be as close as possible as an example without having to go into the, the, the bin of samples, which I don't know how many people have tried. Right. So <laughs> Normally, you would try five samples and buy one. With this, you could try 100 samples and really be sure about what shades or shades are best for you. Now, I've seen technology that kind of puts 
colors and, and e e even webcams do silly things by augmenting your face. But can you tell us about like where your research has gone to make it so quick? Because I see how she changes it and it is instant. And, and she can like just move wherever she wants and it's not lagging behind. It has come a long way. We started this eight years ago. And back then the technology was really not there. So you had to upload a photo, wait for it to be analyzed. And even then the, the points and rendering wasn't perfect. So mm -hmm. it's taken a lot of research, a lot of data being collected. But it's, um, I think it's there now that you can really feel that it's real makeup. Can anyone try this at home if it's an iPad app? Yes, the app, you go to modface.live, you can try it out, and, and soon it'll be in many stores as well. Now backstage, there were a couple other uh, interesting things too, like if you lifted your eyebrows, like things could change, or you pucker your lips, it could also change things, right? Yes, we have a few surprises, so instead of trying to actually touch the screen, you could actually raise your eyebrows or, or pucker your lips. Um, you can also try contact lenses, change your brows, so there's quite a few hidden gems inside the app. Okay, well, can I take it for a spin? Of course. If you don't mind? I, I, I got to try this out myself. It's just too irresistible. All right, so it's just going to instantly know my face. There's no, like, setup time? No, it's instant. Okay. And if I just hit a couple shades here, I can increase the intensity. I don't know if you're getting this. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh la la. See, I'm working on my Vegas nighttime look right now. I don't know if you can see this. But uh, it, is, it is luscious. Even though I have makeup on already, I can kind of see like, like extra what it would be like. I'm going to change my eyes, though. Let's see. I'll match my jewelry. So now I have green eyes. That's pretty cool. And uh, how, about, how about something a little more crazy for Vegas? How about some <laughs> cat eyes? Yeah, how do you like this, Bonnie? I'll, I'll just come up on stage like, like this tomorrow. I think, uh, I think we'll get a lot of viewers that way. <laughs> um, I, and I remember backstage you're saying it can also whiten my teeth. So I think I can, uh, yeah. hey, oh, I can use that. Oh, that, that is nice. That is like, that is like TV star white. I can, I can just walk around like that. Right. So it's kind of fun that obviously you could do these kinds of things and have these cool effects. And right now I look like a crazy person, but I can quickly switch to just different makeups very quickly, actually. Um, why would a retail store want this when ideally don't you want to be touching the product too and seeing how it feels? I mean, what's the benefit for a makeup store to want to have something like this? You want to, but most people don't have an initial idea about what shades out of the thousands that are there are best for them. So this helps them narrow down and be more sure about what they'll buy in the end. Mm -hmm. So we've found that when you put this in stores, it actually does increase sales. Oh, I got Barbie pink lips now. I like this. What, here, but here's my question, too. So it's fun to say, oh, look what I look like with a bunch of sparkle eyeshadow on right now. But how do I apply it? I mean, can, can you show, like, like is, there, um, is there like a way to like, get tips on applying something? Or? Yes. So if you, for example, apply this look, there is a button you can press on top. It actually, oh. step by step, tells you how to get that look. It actually highlights the color and where I should be putting it. And the product, yes. And, and what product. Oh, and on the bottom it says, it's, it's Slate Cosmetics NYC. This is the brand. This is the color. Okay. So right about there. Okay. I could use the help because I, 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 this doesn't happen without help. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the demo. Now, um... I guess I'll give it back to you, though. Actually, do you want to try some makeup on? That might be. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, that's kind of a nice look. I don't know if you can get this. <laughs> I would tone down the intensity a bit, but yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. Um, and people can try this out. At, is, is there a booth people can just try out on the, on the show floor, too? They can come to the show floor and see the various versions of this, or just go to modifist.live mm -hmm. and download the app. And are there any stores that people right now can go to and see this? like when they go shopping, or is it coming this year? Many are launching, I can't say right now, but within a few weeks, you'll see it in a store close to you. Okay, all right, well, thank you both very much. Uh, and it's time for a break though, but don't go anywhere. We have a full day of tech coverage. Next up is Dan Ackerman with the latest cool laptops from CES, so stay tuned.
CES 2016 with one of my favorite parts of the show. We're near the end of it. We get together with the coolest uh, laptops and computers at CES. Joining me the, for the first time this year, in all the years we've been doing this, is my new best buddy, Sean Hollister. Sean, we've seen some very exciting computers here, haven't we? Yes, yes, some excellent new laptops and computers here. Well, I'm going to start off with what I think my favorite trend is, because it's all about trends. It's not about individual products, although we like products. It's about trends. And I love seeing OLED screens on laptops. Uh, we've seen OLED in TVs for years now. Always super impressive, but super expensive. I still can't afford one. I'm hoping maybe next year. But for now, I can get OLED in a laptop. The first one I saw was this guy. This is the uh, ThinkPad X1 Yoga from Lenovo. And you know, Lenovo makes a lot of yoga systems, so this ThinkPad version uh, of the Yoga has an OLED screen, super bright, and if you put it next to a regular screen, you can really tell the difference. And of course, because it's a yoga, it folds back, and what I love about the ThinkPad is that the keyboard goes down like this and goes flat when you fold it over, as opposed to the regular yogas where uh, the keyboard stays up and inactive. But the real selling point here is, is, is this gorgeous screen. And when I saw this early this week, I was just blown away. I said, that's it. There's no laptop at CES that could possibly look better. <laughs> but I was That's wrong. what you thought at first. Because it turns out there are even more OLED laptops here at CES. You saw the next one. It's a one. big trend. Uh, tell me what this guy is right here. Right here we've got the new Alienware 13 OLED laptop. We've got a gaming machine, finally with an OLED screen. You get that quick response time we've been lacking in games. So when you've got your video game characters running across the screen, it looks like you're looking through a window at them. It doesn't, they, the characters don't smear across the screen. Finally. And this looks like the standard Alienware 13 they've been making for a while, Same they just finally up. figured out how to get an OLED screen into it and not much jack up the price screen. too, too much, hopefully. It's going to be the same price as their regular high definition screen. You get this OLED upgrade for free. That is awesome, and I love how that looks. And this is one of the few small 13-inch gaming laptops you can even get. It's a pretty small category, although, I guess Although, it's growing because, look at that, here's another one. Let's do this, I absolutely. Always, uh, I always like to see what Razer has design-wise because they really push the boundaries there. So show me what that guy is. This Razer Blade Stealth, not only does this laptop have this crazy keyboard here that lights up right, individually, a all these okay. different colors. Okay, it's super thin. It's $999 for mm -hmm. Core i7 and eight gigabytes of memory. Lots of premium components and build quality here and, and, and hold that for a moment. Because it's so thin, I can't imagine you can get a big graphics card in here. You can't get it in there, but you pull out this uh -oh. box, the Razer Core, with a giant desktop graphics card in there. Is. This is great. Okay, this so this is, is great. basically just a box, and you put a, a desktop GPU in this. Desktop and you plug GPU it into in the here. Razer. You plug it into the Razer with this single cable. I'll just okay. yank this over here. And is that single USB cable, USB-C. Okay. This is the new USB-C standard. This cable is going to charge the laptop. It's going to give it the power of this full graphics oh, card to that. play games. The lights on and everything. Lights this is a good up. demo. I like when the lights go on. It's beautiful. And data, at the same time, you got USB ports back here so you can plug in all your peripherals. Mm -hmm. You put in this single cable, you get your whole desktop gaming setup. Now, does this come up. together or you buy this and then you can buy this separately? You got to buy this and that separately. We don't even know how much this costs okay. yet for the box. And it doesn't come with a graphics card. You got to buy your own no, graphics you card. put your own graphics card in there. Another 200, it's uh, going to be some money for that. Okay. Yep, absolutely. But a nice way to get gaming and then also super portability. I like that. I'm going to put this down here before I break yes. my hand with it. Nice big aluminum box, but the laptop, inexpensive for the premium components oh, you yeah. get here. No, I always like the great. design, I always like what they do. I never really, uh, I've never really drunk the Kool-Aid on, on the flashy lights uh, <laughs> under the keyboard, but maybe that's because I'm not into sort of the dorm room aesthetic. If you want something a little more sophisticated, I have uh, what I think is the only laptop that really competes uh, feel and design-wise with what I'm using right here for taking notes. That's that 12-inch uh, mm -hmm. MacBook from Apple, yep. and that's this guy. This is the um, HP EliteBook Folio G1, oh, and yeah. it's super thin, super light, 12.5 inch screen. You can get up to a 4K screen on this, which you can't get on, on, on the 12 inch MacBook. And you can see it really feels very similar. And you've discovered the secret feature right there. That's a 180 degree uh, screen. I always complain when laptop screens don't go back far enough. So this goes totally flat like this. I guess you could lay it down on the table if you want. Let's do it. And like that MacBook, it actually runs It actually runs Intel Core M, that second generation Core M. That's the other theme we're seeing here this week. A lot of companies are going all in on that second gen Core M where maybe the first gen, only a handful of people did. It's what makes these laptops so thin. You don't have to have they a fan, fan inside fanless. them. Yep. 
with when you got Core M inside? You don't have to. We're going to have to do more testing in our CNET labs to see if that uh, Core M chip really stands up because the first generation, you know, didn't quite give us the performance and the battery life we wanted. Uh, but I think there are so many people here at CES this week uh, betting on Core M that that I, I I suspect it'll be it'll be pretty good. I love the touchpad and keyboard. Oh on this yeah. one too. For something this thin, and the little diamond it's cut impressive. detail right there around the oh, yeah. around the around the touchpad. So I like this one a lot. And you have another really cool super slim design that I like a lot. If you want to go really, really thin, the Galaxy Tab Pro S, this Samsung tablet right here. Sorry, I, I spoiled the surprise. It's a tablet, like a Microsoft Surface. This thing hooks right into this magnetic keyboard folio, mm -hmm. and you just pop it right up there. I love how the keyboard magnetically just pops into now, place. Now, it's a Windows system, Windows but it's got system. the Galaxy Tab name, which was previously Android, right? So thin, because they're designing it like those Android tablets. Mm -hmm. So thin, and you just pop it right in there. The other neat thing about this, the reason that the Galaxy makes a big difference here, okay. you take a Galaxy phone, you pop it right here onto the keyboard, okay. It pairs wirelessly, right. and you could read all of your text messages from your phone, sure. even reply to them and on the Samsung screen. And Samsung's had that on some systems for years where you get the little uh, pop-up that shows the screen for of your Android phone. Android systems, sure, but yeah. now you got it on Windows. You're doing some oh, real work right. on your okay. Windows computer. You pop your phone on there. Now you don't have to worry about pulling your phone out of your pocket to get those messages. Now, if I buy this guy, I just want to take a look at the tablet for me. Absolutely, so pull first, it right this off. This is the first time I'm really getting a chance to play with this. Does this come with, with the keyboard? It does. It does, because a lot of times you get something like a Surface Pro, uh, you buy the Surface Pro, and then you spend another, whatever it is, $130 on the keyboard, bucks. Yeah. and it starts to add up. So I yeah. like it when people package stuff. Um, that looks like a nice keyboard. It's it? not bad at all. I mean, it's thin. Oh, it's thin, magnetic. but like if you like the 12-inch MacBook, you're using a 12-inch mm -hmm. MacBook, it's pretty thin. This feels pretty good, too. I don't know about the touchpad. It's a little smaller, but that's keyboard. Okay. Bundled. Excellent. I just don't know what it costs yet. Also, Probably we're talking lot. about OLED screen treads. This is another OLED screen. Oh, okay. Twelve point five inch OLED screen, just like Samsung smartphones and tablets. Now you get it in a Windows I computer. I don't think we're going to get to the holiday season without everybody I know wanting an OLED screen laptop. I, I definitely, I have got to have one in my next laptop. Now I know you, you, you have one, you have another thing back there that's not on our list, but you said, hey, here's a cool surprise. I thought we should bring this into. This is the Samsung Notebook Nine. Okay. Thirteen inch Notebook Nine. And the claim to fame here is this thing is so, so light. Under two pounds. I think it's 1.85 pounds. And that's a sort of pounds curve pounds design they've had for years. Ago. We first saw here at CES several years ago that everybody really liked. It kind of kicked off the whole Ultrabook design. Yeah. Thing. It was really one of the first ones to fall into that category. Can I feel that, actually? Absolutely. Oh, that's nice, too. Hold that right there. Give it a heft. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so light. You can take the 15-inch one and the 13-inch one, lift them in one hand. Okay. Two laptops, one hand. That's how light. It's been a long week. I might need two hands. <laughs> that is cool. I like that right. a lot. Wow, that really is light. So we're going to move from super expensive, super fancy, and let's start talking about some less expensive stuff that Absolutely. we have. Because you know what? My favorite laptops are always the budget laptops because I like to see what you can do with the least amount of money possible. And the, the one, of, one of the coolest trends that I've seen on that front is the rise of, of what we call the $200 laptop. Yes. And HP uh, uh, had one, uh, the Stream 11, and uh, Lenovo has one, and a couple other companies do. Now Dell has one, and this is called the Inspiron 11, 11 3, 3, 000. 000. Inspiron okay. 11 3, And it's 000. 199. 199. And it's full Windows 10. And it's got a reasonably decent keyboard and touchpad. It's got obviously an 11.6 inch uh, screen. Uh, and it runs, I think, a Celeron, I'm guessing. Yep. Celeron okay. processor, a couple gigabytes of memory. And here's the thing. Unlike those netbooks of many years ago that were very inexpensive but didn't really run well, uh, this new generation of $200 laptops, you know what, for surfing the web, going online, email, shopping, social media, they're fine. And most importantly, things like streaming Netflix or streaming HD video from YouTube, they also work well. And that's, I think, 90% of what people do with their computers. It works. So if you can get away with that, it great works. for kids, great for traveling. I would say if you leave one in the back of a taxi, it's not the end of the world. It used to be you could pay $400 for a cheap laptop, and it wouldn't have a good keyboard, it wouldn't have right. a good touchpad, it, really it wouldn't do bar. basic tasks. Now you're paying $199 for something that's, you know, it, it's plasticky, it's like a little bit of a sure. kid's colors here, but it feels good enough to do well, all right, of your you daily activities. You have to cover the fact that it's there. kind of plastic by making it pop a little bit, and these cool colors are awesome. And of course, if you want to spend a little bit more, they've got all kinds of color-coded accessories that go with it. I think we have another color over here, right? Yeah, we've got the white here. we got here, the white nice with the red sleeve. Nice, white, the okay. red sleeve on it. I like it that, I like that. It comes in a nice red as well. Several different colors, so if you want to make your laptop really pop. So for like 600 bucks, bucks you can get a whole bucks. rainbow of them and hand them out uh, <laughs> as, as stocking stuffers. <laughs>
Absolutely. Now, one of, my, one of my other favorite cheap laptops, not cheap laptops, cheap desktops, is something that we saw here for the first time exactly one year ago yes. at CES 2015. That was the Intel Compute Stick, a tiny little thing that looked like a chunky USB key. Uh, you plugged into any TV, any monitor, and it turned it into you know, a low-level but functional computer. Well, guess what? We're here again, and this is the next generation, right the generation of two of the Intel Compute Stick, uh, and they've made a couple of changes uh, that actually fix some of the, the problems we have with the first mm -hmm. generation. Number one, Instead of one uh, USB port, now we've got two. One USB 3, one USB 2. So if you have a dongle for a wireless mouse and one for a wireless keyboard or something like that, you're not stuck. Although you should frankly just use Bluetooth and save the ports for something else. Uh, and of course, here's the, here is the HDMI connection right here at the top. Uh, it's got 802.11 AC Wi-Fi as opposed to N last year because people complained it wasn't very fast at downloading stuff. And the Atom processor inside, it's not great. Uh, it's Cherry Trail instead of, the, uh, instead of the older version in last year's. But you know what? Retail price is going to be about $159. And then here's the big secret. Later this year, Intel is going to have something that looks same size, same dimensions. It's going to have Core M3 and Core M5. Okay. And that's much more mainstream performance there. But that for just, sounds good to me. You know, traveling somewhere and you have your presentations on this, you plug it into, let's say, a TV in a conference room, you know, you're ready to go, and then you take it with you. All your files are on there, are on there securely. Like a USB key, but now it's the entire computer. And we've seen a few of these this year, uh, this past year, and I think we're going to see more. And I like it, and I think we have time for probably one more system. This is the first, this is the first, Sean. In all the years we have been doing this coolest computers at CES show, I do not believe we have ever brought a desktop up here, a standard really? desktop. The compute stick kind of counts, I guess. But, but I, I thought this was so funky, I said, we got to bring a desktop up here. Please pass me that, 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 that tower over there, that little, that little triangular thing. This is the Lenovo Idea Center 610S. Okay, it looks like a lot of the living room centric uh, media PCs uh, that we've seen, like the Acer Revo 1. Uh, you could basically you know, plug it into your TV if you want, uh, store all your stuff on there. Yeah. Looks almost like a security cam or like a router, and that's fine. The big secret here is, hold this up for me, Absolutely. and I'm going to get the surprise for it. It comes with this guy, which is a projector, a 720p, I think it's 220 lumens projector, and it snaps right on top there, it magnetically connects. Uh, you need a power cable for this, you do need a power cable for the projector part also, but they do not need to be connected to each other. You can actually take this and they will uh. communicate wirelessly and you can just have the projector and point it anywhere and turn any uh, you know, room into like a mini projection theater. And for something that's kind of a little uh, portable media home theater PC, I think that is super cool. And then you just stack it on there like that. To think that this is what a desktop looks I think like this in whole 2016. package here with the projector, I think it's about 850 bucks. And you can even get some you know, fairly mid-level graphics with it if you want. So, so that is uh, worthy of being, I think, the first uh, uh, tabletop desktop that we have brought in here in all the years that we have been doing, we have been doing this show. That's a lot of computers to go through, Sean. Quite a and few. I think we've seen some big trends here. OLED, uh, Super Slim, uh, gaming stuff, external gaming external cards. External graphics. Uh, I, I shudder to think what we're going to see when we come back here next year. Everybody's going to be OLED. I just don't know how I'm going to pick my next computer. I can only you buy one of them at a time, right? Just use it for 30 days, send it back, and get another one. <laughs> All right, Sean, thank you for joining me uh, uh, for your first time here co-hosting this coolest computer show. Uh, Thanks it's been for having great me. over here. And uh, we are going to wrap it up right now. So I'm Dan Ackerman, this is Sean Hollister. Thanks for joining us for our coolest computers at CES presentation. Thanks a lot.
virtual reality really is the next big, big thing. And of course, CNET is bringing you all the latest VR news, but we're also shooting VR video ourselves. This year, we're showing you the CES show floor in 360 VR. That is right. We've teamed up with VR content provider IM360 to help us out. Here to tell us more about it is Miles McGovern, CEO of IM360. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for allowing us to capture CES in virtual reality. Uh, we shot that video that's going to be up on CNET very soon and you can use it in, in, a, in a VR sort of headset. It's already on YouTube and we actually are going to play a little bit right now. Um, so can you kind of like give us an idea of like how this was able to be captured? It was using this very impressive sci-fi looking device. Absolutely, so we, we have a number of different cameras and that we use, but they're basically using multiple sensors and they take all of that imagery and pull it all together, stitch it on the fly, right. and it can automatically be streamed out either live or on demand. So in this particular instance, we walked around the floor on an on-demand environment, captured it all, put it together into some small snacks sure. that highlights of the show and really put it up for people to have the experience. And interact and, with, and if you can see right now, Bridget, is I'm, interacting I'm, I'm doing my little scrolling. With the I, video in yeah. real time. We're on YouTube right now, so anyone can do this. And so you can watch the mouse cursor sort of drag the video around. And right it, now, Brian's in front of the Intel booth and he's jumping around all over the floor. Oh, there's a drone behind him. Oh, and now he's in front of a car. It's kind of amazing. It, it obviously gives you uh, an experience that gives you the control of where to look. And I feel like that's a really powerful tool to give an audience. So, I mean, where do you sort of see that moving forward? What other applications can this technology be applied to? I mean, we believe the applications are huge. Um, our heritage, we started working in the, the military intelligence side. We were actually the guys behind Google Street View. Okay. So, you know, going Thank out, capturing streets. Great. But it's a great app. It's and, fantastic. you know, we see this as far as, you know, education, uh, you know, edutainment, you know, these types of experiences, whether you're, you know, you're able to bring millions of people to CES sure. and let them virtually experience this and walk around. And it's not only as much as Brian's doing a great job, you know, touring them through, but they can turn around and look, you know, what's going on behind them at right. the same time and really get a feel of being there. And you give, and you give an audience member that choice, which totally is a game changer. I mean, absolutely. Where you would have this sort of one way street now, it's this yep. interactive situation. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious to talk about like the bigger picture of that and where that kind of drives what's being shot and, can, and how that's being considered for an audience. We talked earlier sure. a little bit about you know, other applications, uh, uh, entertainment-wise, sports-wise, live broadcasting. It's really powerful stuff. A absolutely, I mean, we, we believe this, you know, I hate using the disruptive technology sure, yeah. phrase, but the reality is, is I could drop one of these cameras, you know, ringside or, you know, courtside at a game right. and be able to stream that. I can pull out and stream it to tens of millions of people, whether it's on your, your laptop, your mobile phone, where you can move around, look around, drop that into a cardboard, or, you know, you can actually stream what we have posted on CNET have that to your Gear VR and any other VR device. Um, at the same time, we see this evolving so that, quite frankly, if it's a big screen TV, you know, if I'm sure. going to stream the Super Bowl, I want to have 40 people, and I want to stream it to some sort of set-top box that I'm streaming in 1080 or 4K, and when something cool happens, I can reach forward, grab my remote, and go, wait, pan left, pan right, and move around that view. Simultaneously, somebody could experience this with a headset or a mobile device. What's the conversation right now in terms of storytelling with VR? Because like you said with the Super Bowl you know, example or whatever sporting event, you're not going to sit there and watch the whole game like this. No. Um, it's the kind of thing you just pick up and go. So is, is there more talk now on like different ways of thinking about storytelling? Oh, a absolutely. I think this is reshaping the way people you know, look at things. You know, the whole idea, we call it spherical storytelling. And it's that concept of, you know, putting people, rather than putting a camera in the corner and filming something and setting a stage, right. you really have to rethink about how do you create some activity around, get people to move through environments. Um, we did some great stuff in the past, the Taylor Swift video with uh, at Radical and American Express, and that, you know, it won an Emmy for them. It was a fantastic, kind of based on the Sleep No More 
So you're oh, moving right. through a building, and you know, it's that type of thing that becomes very exciting for this space. That's really cool. We talked a little bit uh, earlier about um, you know, sort of like holographic ap applications, more entertainment, motion capture. Can you go into a little bit of detail about sure. what kind of applications that's well, used for? And I mean, that's part of our vision when we, we formed the, a partnership with Digital Domain. Right. And that was really focused around taking what we do in live action video and combining their heritage expertise in CG, special effects, and digital humans. So the, the Tupac at Coachella, Right. They created Tupac. Everyone knows and about exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So imagine starting to bring Tupac into a VR experience, or you know, digital humans, yeah. and they're very real looking, and yeah. it, it becomes a neat experience. And then the other piece is, is you know, you ha we we have the luxury of having a mocap studio at DD, which is you know, bigger than a basketball court, and you know, you know, you put on the suit, but you can put on a headset and walk around. It's like a huge vibe. You're walking around and we create space. Um, you know, most recently we did a project with Mars. Uh, it's a NASA sponsored thing and it was Mars. And you're actually walking around a huge basketball court and it looks like Mars. Yeah. And you're walking up these little ramps mm -hmm. and going over bridges and you think, like after you start walking around for a few minutes, you you're start there. your yeah. brain's tricked. Yeah. It's very neat. So you should come out and have the experience. I, you don't have to ask me <laughs> twice. Um, yeah, I feel like you know, once you sort of get somebody to wrap their head around just what's possible and, and applications for VR that no one yeah. really thought of before. Uh, you know, you talked about visiting places that we will never physically be able to go to. What, what do you think like the biggest challenge for VR is to, to permeate that sort of mainstream understanding and, and for people to really you know, have to wrap their heads around it? I guess one of the big things is everybody talks about it being a massive revolution. And I, I don't think this is going to be like the Russian Revolution and it happens overnight and right, everybody's... Sure. I believe every household will have a VR headset of some sort. Right. It'll be like growing up with a Viewmaster or something. And it, are, it, are we all going to jump right into that and have it? I believe that there's, it's going to evolve more and more like the Industrial Revolution over time, sure. you know, the digital era has enabled us to do what we're doing and I see this as being part of any screen that you touch is now going to become more of an immersive, so that when you want to take over control, there will be those opportunities, and whether it's a headset, or whether it's an AR type of experience, or whether, quite frankly, I'm streaming the Super Bowl or something, and there's a moment where I go, well, I want to pause this, I want to back it up, I want to look at the coach now and see what happened when they fumbled that pass. Right. It's like being there. Definitely, and so. dictating that, that viewing experience exactly. for sure. I wanted to ask about the evolution also of the equipment, the camera equipment itself. Here at CES there's lots of talk about different types of VR cameras. People are doing it themselves now very easily. There's, yeah. there's even units that are under $1,000. So from your perspective as as a professional company who makes these, what, where are things going to the point where like anyone can just buy this and make it themselves? How is that changing the whole the whole medium? I, I think it, that's a, a very critical piece. I mean, when we first built these, we built the first ones with the three-letter agency, and you know, worked with them on developing it for 3D reconstruction. And, and tell us about the one you have here, because this is what so we this, shot yeah, first for, for yeah. CNET. So this, this is just we call this our hex, and it's it's a, a camera that takes. Six, it has six sensors on it, captures it all, stitches it. We have a platform that it ties to that stitches it all together. Mm -hmm. But where we're going with this, uh, we just recently completed a project with DARPA, okay. and it was building a camera, very small, deployable. It's about the size of a racquetball. Mm -hmm. And you know, you see the price point coming down. Those are 4K cameras, very high resolution, small, portable type systems. And there's even a camera so. on the top. Uh, so th that's where it screws in, and then on the top that's you even correct. have a camera. So th this one has what we call a nader, so it attaches to something. There are other ones that are naderless. I know, and, and, and now you hear Google, you know, like we, we just heard earlier in the year, they have the things where you put like all the grow, GoPros around. And, exactly. You know, th th there's a lot of different variations of how to do this video yourself, but I don't know where professionals see things 
compared to amateur taking 360 video. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have you know, both ends of the spectrum. So we're pushing the upper limits to push this to very high resolution, high frame rates and so forth. And you know, at the same time, getting something into more of the lower end consumer side mm -hmm. that lets people go out and if I want to shoot something and let you know, grandma and grandpa experience a, a birthday party or right. something at a you know, home level, it, it should be as easy as getting the, you know, out your camcorder, quite frankly, your phone and you know, integrating it to that and be able to go live stream this or you know, record it and post it up on YouTube or some private channel. Definitely. Are there any restrictions with the file size issues, that, like with how much is being recorded at once? They're, they're bigger, I yeah. mean, they're, totally. there's no doubt. You have six cameras so, rolling simultaneously. Yeah, but we, we just, we use the same pipeline that right. you use for existing. So if you have a 4K network here, we take this all, compress it down to a 4K and move it across that sure. network. So we're only as strong as the weakest link. All right, well, thank you so much, Miles, for yeah, showing I appreciate us it. and, thank and you. providing this technology. Again, you can check out the video up on CNET.com. Yeah, it's it's uh, on it, its way it, up, I'm it's told. It's on YouTube right now, too. Definitely. Excellent. All well, right. Uh, anyways, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, up next, IS is going to be live from the show floor. You're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. Our continuing coverage of CES 2016. Here, this is 40 pounds of an aging suit. It's an exoskeleton, and it's got essentially brakes. And right now what's happening is they're adjusting the amount of resistance on my knees to give me an idea of what it's like to feel older. So I'm walking on the beach here, which is not a walk on a beach. Okay, and there's a lot more force on my legs. So walking, I'm exhausted. I've been wearing this suit just for about 10 minutes or so and I'm getting winded. And now my legs are having serious issues because there's a lot more resistance. So if you wanted to know what it feels like to get older, that's what this suit is designed to explain. And you can hear that I'm running out of breath because not only is this heavy, it takes a lot of force, a lot of energy to exert, just to be able to walk. And hi, tired. So the idea behind this whole suit, this whole concept, is to get a conversation about aging happening. It's definitely the, one of the crazier things I've seen at CES 2016. This thing came out around last year, but thankfully they let me try it on. There's other things you can do. I can try it out later. They're gonna mess with my eyes because I'm seeing you through two cameras and I have these things over my ears so they can actually have hearing loss, vision loss, more issues with my joints if they want to mess with the faders again because they have full control of that and I'm gonna keep trying to walk here thankfully they're not messing with my vision or my hearing while we're doing this because this is no walk on the beach so I'm gonna keep trying to walk I'm gonna mess with my legs a little bit more I bet let's see how we're doing okay so a lot of resistance I feel like oh now I have a limp that is very difficult to try to get all my weight on one leg. So you know what, walking around at CES is going to be a little bit easier after this, because I'll be de-aged significantly. I'm trying to move my legs, oh, super heavy. This is like nightmare material. But it does give me an idea what it's like to be older. So if I'm looking at places to live or places to be, perhaps stairs become way more difficult. Walking around on show floors, way more difficult. When you laugh at people who have segways, maybe it's not so funny because this is really difficult. Just walking, I'm just walking. And I love to walk. Not with this thing on, but okay. A lot more force on my right leg, taking me a lot of energy to be able to move this. Like I said, these are essentially brakes at each of the joints. So they're increasing the amount of resistance, which makes it more difficult to move. And now, this looks like a cool walk, I think, you know? I could do this later. Or not, hopefully not. But yeah, so this is a, a heck of a suit. It was built by the folks at Applied Minds. We're gonna get me off this treadmill. Well guys, CNET will continue its, its CES coverage. 
Stay tuned. Oh, falling off. <laughs> oh.
Hola amigos, como cada año ya estamos aquí en Las Vegas, en el Consumer Electronic Show y Cinet en Español va a tomar posesión del canal en vivo de Cinet y nos vamos a dedicar 30 minutos a contarles todo lo que hemos visto yo, Gabriel Sama, Vanessa Hand y Juan Garzón durante los últimos tres días, porque llegamos antes de que iniciara la feria y ya hemos visto bastantes cosas, son tantas que confunden que marean y a veces uno no se acuerda bien de los nombres, así que tendrán que tener mucha paciencia porque se nos olvidan los detalles, pero por supuesto que nos acordamos de muchas novedades, tenemos mucho que contarles y quiero empezar con el hogar inteligente, que es un tema que ya venimos tratando desde hace dos años, desde que empezamos a cubrir CES y es algo que ha evolucionado, que está revolucionando también la forma en que la gente convive con sus dispositivos en el hogar y estamos viendo cosas de todos tamaños, entre ellos refrigeradores, que es algo que empezó a llamar la atención desde antes que iniciara la feria. Tanto Samsung como LG trajeron dispositivos interesantes y quiero que Vanessa nos cuente lo que ha visto en el piso. Bueno, Gabriel, cuando pensamos en la última tecnología, no siempre se nos vienen en mente los electrodomésticos, pero realmente estos son los aparatos que usamos en nuestro día a día. Y bueno, los que más me impactaron fue, como bien mencionaste, el de Samsung, que tiene una pantalla enorme eh, en la puerta del refrigerador. Esto te permite poner todos tus apuntes, se conecta directamente a todos los otros productos de Samsung. Puedes ver una película en tu refrigerador, Gabriel, o hasta revisar qué tienes dentro del, re del refrigerador aun cuando no estás en la casa. Puedes tomarle una foto remotamente y te llega al, al teléfono. Ahora, el de LG es un poco diferente. También se conecta de manera inalámbrica con tu, con tu teléfono, Gabriel, pero en este caso tiene una... bueno tocas la puerta y se enciende una luz para ver qué hay dentro sin tener que abrir la puerta y gastar energía. También tiene un sensor abajo de la puerta que si andas muchas bolsas, acabas de regresar del súper, se abre automáticamente la puerta. Son cambios sutiles a electrodomésticos que yo creo que ya se irán incorporando a, nuestra día, a nuestro día a día en un futuro. Oye, pero lo que no es sutil, Vanessa, es el precio. No. 5 mil dólares el refrigerador de Samsung. A mí me llama la atención que, bueno, al final de cuentas es un refrigerador, ¿no? Pero están las fabricantes añadiendo estos pequeños distintivos, estas novedades, porque es un punto de venta y es una forma de promocionar y es lo que le llama la atención a la gente. Pero al final sigue siendo un refrigerador de alta gama, bastante costoso. Sí, no, y lo que yo más veo es que este refrigerador de Samsung es el más avanzado de todos, ¿no? O sea, tiene hasta Alexa de Amazon, que es el asistente virtual, entonces te ofrece información. Samsung no ha dado los detalles para saber exactamente qué es la información que te puede dar, pero prometen que va a ser similar a lo que hace Echo. Y igualmente, pues tiene aplicaciones que corre directamente en la pantalla gigantesca de este pero, refrigerador. Dime, Juan, ¿quién lo quiere? ¿Quién lo va a comprar? O sea, ¿quién yo, lo quiere? Yo. Todos lo, yo creo que todos lo queremos, es la pregunta, pero el hecho es quién lo va a comprar. Yo creo que poquitas personas, 10 personas en el mundo de pronto, pero todos lo queremos, obviamente. Claro, pero sigue siendo una forma perfecta de las fabricantes llamar la atención. Por supuesto que pretenden vender muchos de estos dispositivos, pero insisto, es una forma de decir, este es el refrigerador con la pantallota, este es el refrigerador con las cámaras adentro, ¿no? Pero en el fondo es un gran refrigerador, es una marca seria. Eh, hemos visto también cosas interesantes como terminados en, en metal oscuro, normalmente los, los electrodomésticos eran de metal brillante, claro, eh, no es nuevo, pero es también una, una forma de diferenciarse en este mundo de la alta gama, donde LG lanzó toda una serie que se llama Signature. ¿Qué más incluye esta serie? Bueno, la, una de las cosas que me llamó la atención en cuanto a televisores, Gabriel, CES, no es CES sin televisores, fue, era un televisor hecho completamente, bueno, la pantalla hecha completamente de vidrio, entonces la puedes, o sea, es casi un, un pedazo de arte, porque la puedes ver de ambos lados y no se ve como, como un aparato, sino que se ve como un, un cuadro casi, y es más delgada que un lapicero, o sea, es 2.7, si me equivoco, disculpen, 2.7 milímetros de ancho, ancho este televisor y ya viene con la tecnología que llaman HDR. Este año obviamente estamos viendo más 4K, más ultra alta definición, pero eh, en este caso el HDR para la imagen lo que hace es, hace esos negros más profundos, una gama más amplia de colores y en serio yo lo vi de frente y no se puede distinguir un solo píxel. Impresionante este, este televisor, pero 
vamos con el precio otra vez, alrededor de 10 mil dólares va a costar este gran televisor del G, así que bueno, pero es algo que yo creo que podemos, con lo que podemos soñar a un futuro. Sí, yo creo que también lo más atractivo de este televisor del G es que es OLED, ¿no? Entonces reproduce esos negros que mencionabas que son muy negros, pero también logra reproducir colores muy brillantes y diferenciar lo que es oscuro de lo brillante gracias a HDR. Entonces la calidad de imagen es realmente sorprendente, todos los años nos sorprendemos de la calidad de los televisores, el problema es quién los va a comprar, lo mismo, todos los queremos, pero no sé cuánta gente los comprará, ¿no? Y ahora hablemos de cómo van a conversar todos estos dispositivos. Estábamos hablando que el año pasado veíamos muchas de estas centralitas pequeñas para coordinar todo el hogar inteligente y Samsung está proponiendo que sea el televisor el centro de la comunicación en el hogar. ¿Qué está pasando en este sentido y qué vamos a ver en los próximos años? Sí, bueno, el hogar inteligente se ha convertido en una cosa muy importante acá en CES y en el mundo de la tecnología, ¿no? Samsung lo que está haciendo es que está integrando su centro de comando o el hub directamente en sus televisores, que es de la empresa SmartThings. Esto permite que pueda el televisor eh, reaccionar a diferentes modos dependiendo de si enciendes la luz, etc. Igualmente sirve como el control para que puedas encender luces, eh, cerrar tu garaje o todo eso desde tu teléfono hasta remotamente. Entonces yo creo que es eh, muy inteligente de cierta manera que Samsung esté integrando el hub directamente en los televisores ya que yo creo que la mayoría de personas tenemos un televisor en el hogar y no necesariamente estamos interesados en el hogar inteligente o no queremos invertir porque obviamente el hub cuesta, mientras que el televisor si lo tiene integrado nos permite ya comenzar a entrar a ese hogar inteligente y de pronto en un futuro ya comenzamos a crear nuestra fantasía de la casa inteligente realmente. Una de las cosas que vi que me llamó la atención que normalmente me aburre es un sensor para sueño que cabal de Samsung eh, y en este caso como que me puso en perspectiva lo que va a ser el hogar inteligente y es un sensor de sueño, lo, lo colocas debajo de tu, de, del colchón de la cama y bueno te registra cuando estás despierto y cuando estás dormido pero se va a poder conectar con el este hub de Samsung y entonces lo podrás programar para cuando sienta, porque tiene sensores de vibración, sienta que te levantás, automáticamente te enciende la cafetera. Entonces ya es como todo se comunica y nos va a preparar el desayuno casi tu, tu propio hogar porque vas a ver qué estás haciendo dentro claro, del hogar. Creo que es importante mencionar, hablamos mucho de los electrodomésticos gigantescos, pero cuando hablamos del Internet de las cosas o el hogar inteligente estamos hablando de una variedad impresionante de productos. Las cafeteras, los refries, las lavadoras, el televisor, los candados, los termostatos. La clave de todo esto es cómo se van a hablar todos, que es algo que no hemos visto muy pulido o perfectamente resuelto todavía, o por lo menos ante el consumidor. Creo que el consumidor todavía no lo ve como algo sencillo de, de conectar, pero al mismo tiempo estamos viendo productos más pequeños como este candado Smart Lock de Master Lock, que es una forma sencillísima de entrar al hogar inteligente porque, bueno, es Bluetooth, se conecta al teléfono y con, desde el teléfono puedes coordinar cuándo se abre, cómo se abre y que le puedes meter una clave también de color aquí, que yo pensé al principio que era de huella dactilar, no, pero lo coordinas con el teléfono y es una forma muy pequeñita de entrar al hogar inteligente. Por supuesto, hay candados mucho más complejos que este, pero... Si nuestros amigos quieren entrar, pueden entrar de cierta forma con esto, ¿no? Correcto. Al mismo tiempo, también estamos viendo cámaras cada vez más sofisticadas para el hogar. Este año vimos muchísimas. El año pasado vimos algunas, este año vimos muchas. Está esta también, que es una forma muy sencilla de entrar por 150 dólares, de OCO, es la segunda versión, el OCO 2. Tiene visión nocturna, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, y si alguien quiere un sistema de seguridad muy simple que además le grabe información en una tarjeta SIM, puede usar la OCO, o esta de Netmo, que es una fabricante que ya tiene una cierta presencia en el hogar inteligente, que me gusta mucho porque lo que hace es detecta las formas. Claro, puedes ver el video, pero puedes detectar la forma que, que hay enfrente de la cámara, ya sea un humano, un animal o un vehículo, y te avisa a tu teléfono. Entonces, son distintas versiones, son formas sencillas de entrar al hogar inteligente. Y cuando hablamos del Internet de las cosas, por supuesto, hay un elemento que se nos olvida, que es el automóvil. El automóvil es parte ya de este Internet de las cosas, porque trae muchísima tecnología dentro, pantallas increíbles, plataformas para conectarse con los dispositivos móviles e incluso con los dispositivos en el hogar. Y sí es ya también es una feria de automóviles, no solamente lo que sucede dentro, sino que se están presentando ya vehículos aquí, como el Chevy Bolt, que era un vehículo que estábamos esperando desde hace mucho tiempo y que finalmente presentaron en la feria 
es importante porque es un vehículo eléctrico de GM que pretende finalmente conquistar a las masas. Claro, hemos visto vehículos de este tipo de Nissan, vehículos de este tipo de Tesla, que es una fabricante importante californiana, pero muchos han estado arriba del presupuesto de la gente y el Volt pretende ser el primer vehículo eléctrico de masas. Sí. También aquí... También la, la diferencia del Volt comparado a la versión anterior, porque ya habían presentado varios, es que el anterior era un híbrido. Entonces era eléctrico, pero también necesitaba gasolina de cierta manera. Este es totalmente eléctrico, entonces obviamente permite que el usuario no necesite gasolina y extiende obviamente ese rango que antes ofrecía de cierta manera y lo hace muy económico. Claro, me recuerda al Nissan Leaf y... Y bueno, veamos si finalmente vemos más vehículos eléctricos en la calle. También vimos un concepto y vimos varios autos concepto. Por supuesto, recuerden que la semana entrante es la feria de Detroit, pero aquí vimos un par de autos concepto, entre ellos uno de una camioneta de Volkswagen que se llama Bud E, que también es totalmente eléctrica, y también algunas novedades de BMW. Sí, bueno, ayer estuve en el kiosco, Gabriel, y... Bueno, increíble todo lo que están haciendo, tanto dentro del carro como fuera del carro. Yo, yo tuve la oportunidad de, de probar una de las nuevas funciones que vendrá en el futuro a los autos y es este control con gestos. Significa que tú le podrás dar direcciones así, con, con así gestos, para que se estacione en el lugar que tú quieras sin tener que estar dentro del auto. Entonces, si ves un estacionamiento demasiado pequeñito que no vas a poder salir, le puedes decir, váyase. Y el carro se va solo con gestos. Lo hace eh, mediante un reloj inteligente. En este caso tenía el Apple Watch puesto, pero, pero podrá utilizar otros dispositivos. Se comunica con la nube y luego se comunica con el auto. Entonces, el auto con el sensor ya registra el tamaño del estacionamiento y se estaciona solo. Y también le decís, véngase. Y se viene, se sale del estacionamiento. Realmente increíble. También tenían una, un estilo de llave, control remoto, que también te permitía hacer esto, pero, pero con un control remoto especial de la empresa. Son cosas que todavía no vemos en los carros de ellos, pero son funciones que ya son posibles y que, bueno, en los próximos cinco años definitivamente llegarán a los autos. Sí, precisamente BMW también presentó ese concepto de eh, la plataforma de la nube, ¿no? para conectar no solo el vehículo con tu teléfono o reloj, sino también con todo el hogar. Entonces mostraban que tenían un espejo inteligente que te mostraba cuán, el trayecto a tu trabajo o a tu casa, o dependiendo de donde estés. Además de eso, también eso te permite verlo directamente desde el teléfono. Si golpean tu auto por un balón de fútbol o alguien te estrelló, también te da una notificación y te muestra una clase de video en 3D para mostrarte exactamente en qué lugar fue que fue golpeado. Entonces fue muy interesante. Y otro vehículo también que muestra tecnologías nuevas de BMW fue eh, eh, una visión del futuro en el cual puedes controlarlo también con gestos, pero directamente en la parte interna, en los controles del tablero, como es el, la radio o el... el el aire acondicionado y estos aspectos internos del carro, sin tocar la pantalla, sino solo con gestos. Entonces, fabuloso. Lo único que me da un poco de miedo en cuanto a los gestos es que yo le preguntaba al señor, ¿y qué si te confundís o estornudás y, y haces el gesto sin querer y mandás a estacionar tu carro? Porque el, el gesto para el bebé, para estacionar, era, me decía, como una raqueta de tenis. Yo no juego tenis, pero Juan sí juega tenis. Y como el auto no tiene que estar cerca de ti para hacer el gesto, Imagínate tú jugando tenis, le decís que se salga sin querer. Sí, igual es un concepto. Imagino que en el futuro ya lo estarán activando directamente. Tienes que abrir la aplicación y hacer el gesto porque si no tu carro estaría parqueando y saliendo a cada rato sin querer y estaría perdiéndose a todo momento. Muy bien, pues vamos a tomar una pausa. Tenemos mucho más que contarles. Por supuesto, en esta feria hay infinidad de productos sumamente interesantes. Tomaremos una pausa de unos minutos y volveremos de inmediato.
Amigos, estamos de vuelta aquí en CES 2016. Es Cinet en Español que toma posesión del canal en vivo de Cinet. Y queremos seguir contándoles todo lo que hemos visto en esta feria, que es gigantesca, está llena de, yo diría, miles de productos, muchas novedades interesantes. Ya platicamos un poco del hogar inteligente, del auto inteligente y ahora queremos transitar algo que nos gusta mucho que es la tecnología de vestir y los dispositivos móviles. Vanessa, ¿qué hemos visto? Bueno, hemos visto varias cosas. Eh, yo creo que hay que mencionar uno de los pioneros en la tecnología de vestir en cuanto a, al fitness o a la actividad física que es Fitbit. Ya habíamos visto ver varias de las pulseras eh, que te miden tus pasos. Y bueno, ahora en esta feria han lanzado el Fitbit Blaze, es, su, es otro reloj inteligente porque ya tenían el Search, pero en este caso se han enfocado más en la moda, en hacerlo más bonito que la versión anterior y efectivamente se parece un poco a, a los relojes inteligentes que ya habíamos visto. Hace las mismas funciones que el Fitbit Search, que me decepcionó un poco porque en cuanto a funciones no trae muchas novedades, eh, pero sí es más atractivo y es una tendencia que estamos viendo que ya se están fijando más en la estética de estos, de estos dispositivos y bueno, ya no son tampoco para la muñeca, estamos hablando de wearables para todo el cuerpo, Gabriel. Juan, y hemos visto colaboraciones interesantes. Hace dos años veníamos y veíamos que las fabricantes asiáticas y estadounidenses lanzaban cosas y ahora han empezado a colaborar más un poco de la mano de lo que decía Vanessa de la moda, pero también de la salud, por ejemplo. ¿no? Exactamente, sí. El año pasado, por ejemplo, HTC anunció que iba a tener una colaboración con Under Armour y es lanzó un dispositivo que no tuvo mucho éxito, pero en esta ocasión no está lanzando un dispositivo, sino una plataforma, ¿no? Entonces tiene una báscula que se conecta a tu teléfono, igual se conecta a una banda que te pones en el pecho para obtener ritmo cardíaco y también una pulsera que también tiene ritmo cardíaco, pero no es tan exacto como el que tienes en el pecho y también tiene, pues, te cuenta los pasos, calorías, etcétera, lo que normalmente hacen todos estos dispositivos y todo lo conecta directamente entre ellos, igual a la nube. Entonces también tienes unos zapatos, tienes unos audífonos y todo está totalmente conectado para intentar hacerte o ayudarte a ser más saludable, a hacer más deporte, disfrutar más ese aspecto del deporte que muchas veces odiamos tanto, ir al gimnasio y tener que estar ahí una hora haciendo pesas sin querer, pero bueno, esperamos a ver, ver cómo realmente funciona porque hasta el momento lo han mostrado y no hemos logrado probarlo con tanta, pues, con tanta paciencia para saber qué tan efectiva es esta integración y qué tan bien funciona cada dispositivo. Y son creo 400 dólares. Sí, eh, se llama el UA Health Box. Ese trae la báscula, la banda del pecho y la pulsera. Cuesta 400 dólares. Entonces, también es una inversión bastante grande. Es más que todo para la gente que ya está involucrada totalmente eh, en este aspecto deportivo. No creo que la gente normal lo quiera hacer a menos de que esté muy enfocada en mejorar su salud o su aspecto físico. Pero bueno, veremos. De pronto en un futuro ya baja y ya es más, más fácil de comprar. Y los dos tuvieron oportunidad de ver algunas cosas de Samsung. Platíquenme. Bueno, sí. una de la, Hablando de, de mejorar tu, tu nivel de actividad y tu figura, Samsung Samsung estaba, tenía un prototipo de uno que se llama Body Compass 2.0 y ya no era un, un wearable que parece un pedazo de tecnología, sino simplemente era una ropa de ejercicio, así la, ahí la están viendo, ropa deportiva que tiene unos sensores incorporados. Esos dos sensores que ven allí son los que pueden ver, pero también tenían uno como hilos o sensores de hilo adentro de la ropa y lo que hace es que se comunica con una central para darte información eh, sobre la marcha de lo que estás, del ejercicio que estás haciendo, te registra la respiración para saber qué la intensidad del ejercicio y una cosa que me pareció curiosa o, o un poco peligrosa es que te, te dice la medida de tu cintura cada vez que te pones los pantalones. Uh, qué Esto deprimente. Para, <risa> qué deprimente. Para las mujeres buscando, eh, bueno, bajar de peso es un, un recordatorio de que estás bajando o que no estás bajando porque te, te dice la medida de la cintura cada, cada vez que te la pones. Ya es algo más integrado que algo que llevamos solo puesto en la muñeca, pero no, no creo que lo veremos todavía pronto en, en toda la ropa de ejercicio, pero es algo que, que nos da un vistazo al futuro. Y hablando de Samsung, también tienen un vestido o una chaqueta, tienen un cinturón y una maleta. Lo que se encargan de hacer estos dispositivos es que te pueden ayudar a cargar el dispositivo automáticamente de manera inalámbrica o también crear funciones directamente en los teléfonos que si sacas de repente el teléfono de tu bolsillo, puede activar tu calendario o tu email para que no tengas que ir a la aplicación y abrirlo automáticamente. Entonces, esta es una demostración también de cómo Samsung y otras empresas están intentando integrar esta tecnología de vestir realmente, de vestir porque es ropa, e intentando facilitar 
facilitar nuestras vidas. Yo sigo escuchando gente que me dice, yo usaba un reloj y me lo quité. Yo tenía esto y lo dejé de usar. ¿Qué va a pasar con la tecnología de vestir? ¿Quién la quiere? ¿Quién la quiere? Yo creo que es una de las cosas como el hogar inteligente, ¿no? Yo creo que todos la queremos, pero no sabemos exactamente qué tanta utilidad tienen, ¿no? Entonces también, por ejemplo, Samsung presentó dos nuevos relojes, pues son el Gear S2, que son eh, exactamente las mismas especificaciones de la versión anterior. Esta es la Classic, pero ahora está recubierto de oro rosa, que a mucha gente le, le atrae, como Vanessa, por ejemplo, y Gabriel, ¿no? Yo sé que claro, a Gabriel le gusta claro, lo rosa. Claro. Todo y lo que tengo es oro rosa. <risas> Exacto. Y uno plateado o de platino, que también es mucho más atractivo que la versión regular. Y bueno, tienen las más especificaciones, pero se ven realmente bien. O sea, son más elegantes para esa clase de gente que busca dispositivos de vestir, eh, que también tengan más estilo, no solo que te ofrezcan funciones inteligentes. Bueno, yo, yo creo que esa es la clave, que nosotros no queremos llevar tecnología puesta. Yo, por lo menos como mujer, no quiero que se note que ando un pedazo de dispositivo puesto en la muñeca. Entonces, yo creo que a medida que se vayan integrando con la ropa, con las prendas que nos ponemos eh, y que, que sea más sutil, yo creo que ya, ya será una transición más natural que tener que comprar algo específico de tecnología para andar sobre el cuerpo. Aquí tengo unas gafas para, para esquiar o para hacer snowboarding, lo que hagan, que tienen un estilo de pantallita similar a lo que veíamos con el Google Glass, que te dice información sobre la marcha, eh, sobre tu recorrido cuando esquías. Eh, puedes bajar, descargar mapas, por ejemplo, para no perderte en la nieve. Entonces, es una manera sutil de llevar tecnología puesta. También tienen un, una versión para andar en bicicleta. Y, Similar al Google Glass, se, se manipula aquí con el control a un lado. Y bueno, te dice la velocidad que llevas. También puedes tomar fotos sobre la marcha. Y se llaman las Recon, una es Snow 2 y la Jet. Y ya tienen esta tecnología eh, deportiva incorporada. No se ve, pues, definitivamente las gafas de nieve no se, no se ven tan diferentes. Estas sí se ven un poquito tecnológicas. Pero ya lo vamos viendo más incorporados a nuestro día a día. Sí, algo similar a eso también, precisamente BMW presentó un casco inteligente que tiene también un, lo que se llama un heads up display que pones a un lado, es básicamente un vidrio pero te muestra información en una pantalla, entonces puedes ver tu velocidad, información del clima, si estás recibiendo una llamada, mensajes de texto, de esta manera no te distrae teóricamente tanto porque lo puedes ver a una vista normal de distancia, no tienes que volver a enfocar cómo funciona con Google Glass, otros dispositivos que tienen una área muy pequeña para visualizar este contenido. Entonces, lo puedes visualizar totalmente en todo tu ojo. Bueno, pasemos a algo importante para la tecnología de vestir, que son los dispositivos móviles, porque mucha de estas sigue dependiendo de que traigamos un teléfono, una tableta con nosotros para sincronizarse. También, algunas fabricantes están lanzando modelos de colores más vibrantes, están lanzando, por supuesto, eh, tabletas más delgadas. ¿Qué, te, ¿Qué tienes ahí, Juan? Bueno, acá tengo la nueva de Samsung, que esta es la Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S. Yo sé, el nombre es un poco largo, pero a algunas empresas les gusta ponerle nombres largos. Pero, bueno, la diferencia es que esta tableta corre, pues, ejecuta Windows 10 de manera nativa. Es más delgado y liviano que el iPad Pro y que la Surface 4, lo cual es bastante bueno porque esas son bien livianas. Además, trae un teclado que cuando lo compres está totalmente incluido, no es adicional como la Surface también, que lo hace más costoso. Entonces lo hace ser bastante delgado, se, se adhiere a través del conector Pogo que se encuentra en la parte de abajo y magnéticamente se sostiene atrás, pero es bastante delgada. Entonces acá la pueden ver, es bastante delgada y el diseño es bastante elegante también. Entonces tiene un procesador Intel, lo que normalmente tiene una computadora tradicional. Además de eso también presentaron un dispositivo, una computadora que es bastante delgada también. O sea, uno la alza, si quieren alcen la y verán lo delgada que es. Es increíblemente delgada, la quedo liviana, yo, ¿eh? sí. y tiene procesador Intel también. Esa es de, está disponible de 13 o 15 pulgadas, mientras que la tableta está disponible pues, en 10 pulgadas. Entonces, son bastante, bastante buenas. ¿Y de teléfonos qué viste? De teléfonos tenemos acá, eh, tenemos el Nexus 6P, que presentaron en color dorado, lo cual también es eh, bastante, les gusta bastante a mucha gente, no soy fanático del dorado, pero sí se ve bien. También presentaron el que es el, el, el pues es de Huawei, el Honor 5X, que es la primera vez que llegan a Estados Unidos. Este teléfono eh, se ve muy elegante, tiene un lector de huellas y todo, y cuesta solo 199 dólares. O sea, es, a mí me sorprendió realmente el precio. Es increíble. Sí, realmente no he visto teléfonos eh, de, esa, de ese precio 
que se vean tan lujosos como este teléfono y realmente Huawei eh, está con una racha de lanzar dispositivos y yo creo que fue de los destacados, al menos en cuanto a dispositivos móviles para mí en esta feria. Y hay dos productos que tenemos aquí que me van a ayudar a hacer la transición a lo siguiente, que es el tema del 2016, la realidad virtual. Tenemos esa cubierta de spec, la Pocket VR Candy Shell Grip, que te ayuda a entrar a este mundo de la realidad virtual. Eh, viene el dispositivo que se usa con un teléfono y también la cubierta cuesta 69 dólares y 95 centavos, creo, y estará disponible en la primavera. Y es una forma interesante de entrarle a este mundo a la realidad virtual. Ahí lo está mostrando Vanessa, vean este, qué fácil se pone. Eh, tiene eh, las mismas especificaciones, reglas de las cardboard, por supuesto, estas no son de cartón, pero funcionan de una forma similar. Y también Juan tiene ahí enfrente un prototipo de un teléfono de la marca Yes. ¿Qué hace qué, Juan? Exactamente. Este es el Yes eh, Esfera. Básicamente tiene una cámara trasera y delantera. Entonces, esto lo que permite es capturar videos en 360 grados. Ya. Igual que esta cámara de Rico, que también este, captura imágenes en 360 grados, que es uno de los temas que hemos visto acá. Nikon también lanzó su primera cámara deportiva, un prototipo que estará a la venta muy pronto. Prototipo trajo aquí, pero estará a la venta pronto. Una, su primera cámara de acción que hace imágenes en 360 grados. Bueno, y aclaremos un poco que el, el año pasado fue importante la realidad virtual, pero no teníamos ni las herramientas ni el contenido para verlos. Y ahora lo que hace esto es nos da ya esa, esas herramientas para crear nuestro propio contenido en 360 grados. Lo que hace es captura todos los ángulos. Entonces, por ejemplo, si te quieres tomar una selfie, ni siquiera tiene que estar apuntando hacia ti el lente, porque graba, obviamente, todo el cuarto sin tener que mover la cámara para nada. Esto te da una, bueno, una experiencia más inmersiva hacia que te permite ver lo que yo estoy viendo en, eh, pues, en realidad virtual. Juan, ¿qué está haciendo que la realidad virtual sea más real? Sí, en realidad yo creo que este es el año de la realidad virtual, como estabas diciendo. El año pasado, finales, también Samsung lanzó la versión del Gear VR ya disponible para el consumidor. Las anteriores eran versiones pruebas, 99 dólares, lo cual es muy económico. Entonces, para hacerlo real, también existen nuevos dispositivos que están llegando, como es Oculus, que anunció que ya va a salir, pues salió a la preventa y va a estar disponible en los próximos meses. 599 dólares no es lo más económico del mundo, pero es un comienzo a que en los próximos meses y años ya todo esté evaluado. También dijo que habrán 100 juegos para el Oculus Rift este año, que es importantísimo el contenido. Y una de las estrellas de la feria, es algo que tú ya conocías, pero no habías visto esta versión que tienes ahí. Esta es la nueva versión de HTC y Valve, se llama el HTC eh, Vive Pre o Pre. Eh, son más compactas que la versión anterior, tiene ahora una cámara frontal que también permite detectar eh, el escenario exterior, no solo lo que estás viendo, sino también afuera para que puedas ubicarte. Entonces puede detectar si las personas están frente de ti, las sillas o otros objetos. Se puede también intercambiar las partes eh, como es la almohadilla, el soporte de la, de la nariz, para que se acomode más a cada persona. También mostrar lo que son los controles, sus controles inalámbricos. ¿sí? Entonces se ven bastante futuristas de cierta manera porque no son muy normales, pero se comunican también con el dispositivo para que puedas controlar esos mundos virtuales. Y la gran diferencia de este con Oculus y los otros dispositivos es que este te permite moverte a través de un cuarto o una habitación o donde te encuentres. Los demás tienes que estar más que todo sentado, girando, etc. Se te permite mover. Con los controles puedes interactuar fácilmente con esos mundos y... O sea, realmente fabuloso. Lo difícil de la realidad virtual es que tienes que probarlo para realmente entenderlo. Explicarlo, uno puede explicar muchas cosas, pero cuando uno lo prueba es totalmente increíble. A ver, ¿cuál es su predicción para la realidad virtual este año? ¿La veremos en más casas o es otro de esos, eh, otras de esas innovaciones que va a tardar un poco más? Bueno, yo creo que es una innovación que va a tardar. Este año yo creo que vamos a comenzar más que todo a verla en las personas que están más involucradas en videojuegos, en los gamers. Estas personas son las primeras que van a co realmente comprar esto este año y de pronto en, yo digo, dos, tres años ya la gente de, de consumo general va a comenzar un poco a explorar más este proceso. Muy bien, pues como verán hay mucho de qué hablar. Se nos acabó el tiempo, pero no se nos ha acabado la cobertura. Si van a cinet.com diagonal ES, leerán de todos estos temas y muchísimo más, porque acá seguiremos en Las Vegas trayéndoles todos los detalles de CES 2016. Gracias Juan, gracias Vanessa, 
gracias a todo el equipo de Cinet en Español que le ha echado muchísimas ganas esta semana para traerles todos los detalles de la feria y por favor sigan con nosotros. Hasta la próxima.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CNET stage at CES 2016. I'm Lindsay Turrentine, Editor-in-Chief of CNET Reviews. Joining me are Vanessa Hand Oriana from CNET and Espanol, and Eric Franklin, Managing Editor of CNET Reviews. And we're here to talk about what we think of the show so far, personally. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Let's, let's just dive right in. You guys, there was a lot of unexpected a lot. at the show. And we were just talking that a lot of it seems like a blur because we're just looking at everything. So what really stands out m must actually be unexpected because there's so many products here that you have to really stand out for us to, to kind of Absolutely, yeah, and talk what about stands it. out to you and what stands out to you are probably totally different. So Vanessa, I know that there's something you're really, 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 really excited about here that's a little bit kooky. I'll save that for last. First, I want to talk about a product that kind of was unexpected in the sense that it gives you information that I don't necessarily want to know. It's, um, it's kind of like a workout outfit. It's a prototype for Samsung. It's called the Body Compass 2.0. And it has sensors all around. It's, I like that it's incorporated in the workout outfit. But it tells you, uh, it measures your waist every time you put oh, on the no, pants. No, no. So Sounds like the worst product. <laughs> <That's me. laughs> I, it was just surprising. Like, I mean, I guess it's important when you're trying to lose weight to get that measurement. But it's like, ooh. How often does it measure your ooh. waist? Is it like before and after lunch? <laughs> I hope not. It's yeah. just every time you put them on. So I, yeah, that was interesting. I guess that's where kind of wearables are going now. They're just incorporated everywhere. and giving us uh, all kinds of information that keep us honest. <laughs> oh, oh, all right, Eric, Eric, I, what, what do you think? I mean, you're into the workout stuff, but that's not what you picked. What, what are you most excited about? Yeah, I guess I'm into the workout stuff, but um, I'm most excited about these earbuds. These earbuds uh, that kind of uh, hone in on um, specific frequencies so that you put them in and like, let's say you connect the earbuds to your phone and then you have these like presets. Let's say you're on a subway. You don't want to hear the screeching train. So you would select the train uh, preset, and then it would block out the sound of the train. So you could just sit there without even hearing the sound of the train. Or if you're on a plane, there's a baby screaming. You can actually, there's actually a preset for babies, screaming babies. You can put that on, and you don't have to hear the screaming baby. So Is that, I, think that's a, I, think that's a, I think that's a parent setting. Maybe parents right? are going to use yeah. that, right? Yeah. So is this a prototype, or is it going to be available? From what I know, it's, it's, it's going to be available. But I agree with you, it's kind of a parent's, uh, it's kind of a parent's uh, uh, device. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, it's like, who can neglect their kids the, the best, you know, I guess. And can you? you customize it for any setting that you use? You know, I'm not sure if you can, come up, uh, if you can actually customize it. They have these presets, but, uh, you know, that'd be great if you can customize it. That'd you know? be super cool. Yeah. I, am, I am pretty excited about this. Uh, this demo we saw, it's not a final technology, but the, the demo is the Carl Zeiss lenses that are supposed to basically de-dorkify uh, the Google Glass experience, yeah. right? This is it, to take augmented order. reality, <laughs> put it on glasses that look, you know, normal. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> these, I'm excited about them just because they look cool, essentially. Yeah. They're not real yet. 
They don't work yet, but Carl Zeiss, the, the, lens, the lens manufacturer, demo this and they've spent a lot of time thinking about how this might actually work. That little black thing you see there is going to project the image actually onto the lens and so it would work with sort of normal glasses and you can imagine uh, all kinds of information being thrown up on the screen while you walk around town. So I think that that's, uh, that's really cool. I'm really excited about augmented reality in general. Uh, as also, opposed to virtual reality, yeah. and, and I think it's really cool. If you watch this video, it has the moment of the show at the very, oh, we just skipped it. Oh. <laughs> it has a moment of the show in the video. If you watch the, that complete video, there's this moment where Scott Stein turns towards the camera and the camera just kind of stays on him. It's awesome. It's brilliant. <laughs> That's so. really cool. Really cool. And Vanessa, you got one more thing. Well, yeah, um, I guess what was most unexpected for me was all the pet tech that I've seen at the show. And I might be biased because I just got a new puppy. Um, but it's a game console for dogs. And it sounds more intricate than it really is. It's really just a half sphere that gives treats. But it has a series of lights. And it starts out at level one. And all the dog has to do is you know, press the surface. And then it has to press the right light. It's supposed to keep your pet entertained for when you're not at home, but this is the first time I'm seeing like technology geared to the pet. We also saw a Fitbit for your dog, um, which tells you kind of how much he's eating and based on that, or how much he's exercising, and based on that calculates how much you should be feeding him. I've never seen so many pets at CES, Lindsay. It's, it, it's, that's pretty funny. I wonder if we're going to start to worry about pets and screen time soon, yes. right? Like, are, you, are, are your pets having too much screen time? Yeah. Are they intellectually developing the way that they should? That looks I, almost I think like it's a pretty cool. For a dog <laughs> instead of a dog feeder. I don't know. It's kind of it's weird. Pr it's pretty clever. OK, we're going to move on to, to slightly more serious topics. Oh. What, yeah, let's get serious Ooh, here. Stand up straight. Stand up what, straight. <laughs> what are the products that you personally want to own that you've seen Ooh. at the show? Like the thing that, you know, you're going to go out and buy it. Yeah. Or maybe you will. Eric? Uh, I think Oculus Rift, probably. You know, I've, I've been kind of on the fence uh, on VR in general uh, since, you know, we started having this new VR resurgence in the last couple of years. But since they announced the price, which is like $600, which a lot of the internet does not agree with, but um, I think it sounds reasonable price to me for what you're getting. Uh, you gonna start saving your pennies? <laughs> yes, I'm gonna start saving my pennies now. Um, but it just it, it's it's now real because there's a price, there's an actual release date. We like we know what we're getting, so I'm now I I can kind of I can kind of believe that it's actual real thing and get excited about it. So, so that's, remind everybody, Eric, what yeah. it, what do you have to have to have the Oculus Rift experience in a gaming setting? What what else do you have to own? You with have that to own a dollar headset. You have to own a very powerful PC that includes an NVIDIA GeForce uh, card. I'm not sure which one, but a pretty high end one. Uh, obviously, you'll need something to connect that PC to, uh, probably you know a TV or a monitor. Um, and then you buy the Oculus Rift. I think it comes with an Xbox One controller, uh, so that's included in the price, and uh, then you can uh, never see your family again, because <laughs> you're lost in some virtual world somewhere. All right, okay, we know what, what Eric thinks. Um, I, I just want to say that I am super excited, and, and I don't know what kind of person this makes me, but about this LG refrigerator. There are a bunch of really cool Stereo refrigerators. <laughs> sure there are a bunch of really cool refrigerators at CES this year, and I can't believe that this is like the year of refrigerators <laughs> at CES. It's the funniest thing. But um, there, there's the Samsung fridge that you've all heard so much about that takes pictures of the inside so that when you're at the grocery store, you can see whether or not you actually have butter. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. But the LG fridge, a little bit less connected, but it has this, this <laughs> there's Vanessa, it has this door that I believe is OLED that actually changes opacity when you want it to, so that you can see what's going on in your refrigerator without opening the door. It saves you some, some power, ideally, right? This yeah. is an yeah. e energy saving. And, and also just, you know, it like keeps your kids from standing there with the door <laughs> open, staring at the refrigerator right. for a really long time. It'll also keep your kids from asking how the light turns off and <laughs> turns back on when you open and close the refrigerator. Because now they can see what happens in there. Right. <laughs> now they know exactly what's going on. The other amazing thing about this refrigerator, though, it took some notes from Ford and their tailgate technology. When you put your foot at the bottom, oh, it can cool. open yeah. the door automatically. So if your hands are full, 
it actually just opens. And I think this is an example of the kind of sort of real world, like, oh, you know, that would actually improve my life. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You know, I mean, this yeah. is, that's, ex that's exciting refrigerator tech, yes. you guys. I mean, my, f my biggest concern about that one was like, what if the dog steps on it by accident and opens the fridge or your kids, you know, <laughs> like they're small enough, they may not be small enough to really open the door, but they can put their foot down. And, and apparently they have, uh, the sensor knows when it's an adult versus a kid or a pet. So smart. that's pretty cool. Smart, smart. My oh, yeah. favorite that I, um, I, it's on my wish list, if you guys want to want to give it for, to me as soon as it launches is the BMW that it will sure. have parking with gestures. It's not out yet. Uh, it's the feature they demoed for their new cars or, well, they didn't give an exact date, but this is what we can expect out of cars. And what it does, and there it is, we, you can uh, gesture it to go find its own parking. So it, it sees the parking space, and then you get out of the car, and then you send it off on its way. And you don't have to worry about, especially in San Francisco, parallel parking. You guys, you guys know it's what I'm nightmare. talking yeah, about. Yeah, I do. So I, I really want that. <laughs> OK, all right. OK, now we have a quick lightning round. We oh. can just have a couple more minutes here. But I want to talk about what you think is going to be the most commercially successful. Every year at CES, we see tons of products that are kind of pie in the sky that may or may not actually make it out into commercial release. Some of them will, some of them do. Eric, we touched on Oculus Rift, yeah. and I know this is your choice. <laughs> it's $600, you think people are gonna pay for it? I think they will. I think once you uh, actually have the experience, if they can actually you know, get a demo of the experience and see how different it is versus a traditional video game, I think people are just gonna make a compelling case for spending $600 to, like I said, never see your friends and family again, <laughs> which a lot of people might be into. Or see so. them via VR, right? Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> only see them in VR, so. Exactly. Well, I'm gonna be really quick with mine, but I think that the Parrot Disco, which is a fixed wing drone, it's basically a toy, it's from Parrot, it goes 50 miles an hour, you throw it up into the air and it takes off like an airplane. You can actually put a headset on so that you're is you're essentially flying along with it, That's which cool. sounds a combination of thrilling and nauseating, <laughs> frankly. Sure. Uh, but I think it's—I think people are going to love it. I think that people are going to pay for this because it's a totally different drone experience, and it's a lot of fun. Vanessa. I'm going to go with the more conservative route. I, I think that's awesome, and I probably, as a consumer, would buy it. Because I'm coming from the Espanol perspective and the international perspective, I was really impressed by Huawei's new phones. Um, they launched a new Honor phone and the new Mate 8, and those are all really luxurious looking phones. They're made of metal. They all have fingerprint scanners. The Mate 8 is uh, under $400, and the uh, 5X is Actually, the Honor phone is actually $200 with a fingerprint scanner made of all metal, which for a $200 phone, impressive. like, I just think that it, they're hitting, they're going to hit that market and they might dominate, maybe not in the U.S., but definitely abroad. And that's, that's my yeah. practical pick, no, I guess. That, that <laughs> is, that's a great one. Uh, and I, I agree with you. I mean, as these prices come down it, with with phones that just feel really nice, I think people will become a lot less loyal to the brands that they've just gone with every single year. And we'll say, well, what the heck, yeah. right? I mean, if I'm paying the full price of my phone up front, I'm gonna do some smarter shopping here and really kind of think about the price of the phone I'm buying rather than just going forward and replacing with the next model, maybe of the iPhone. Yeah. So we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Ta thank you, both of you, for taking the time no to problem. make this work. Uh, now. Get back to work. <laughs> and coming up next is Tomorrow Daily, one of my favorite CNET shows with special guest Nick Cannon. So stay tuned.
startup that already has a Wi-Fi enabled video doorbell on the market for 199 bucks that we reviewed last year. But today they've introduced the Ring Stick Up Cam. This is an outdoor security cam designed to work in concert with the Ring video doorbell. So you can buy those two models separately, but the real benefit is to provide a security perimeter around your home. So you can have the doorbell protecting your front door and these outdoor cams protecting the rest of the outside of your house. This camera has 720p, it has motion detection, it has optional cloud storage for a monthly fee, and it works with IFT. It also works in the same app that the Ring Video Doorbell does, so you can check in on your doorbell and your camera simultaneously. So the Ring Stick Up Cam is available for $199 now on Ring's website, and you can also get its existing Ring Video Doorbell for the same price on their website as well. Thanks for watching, I'm Megan Mullerton for CNET. Start by making your iPhone lock sooner. You can set your passcode to be required immediately after you lock it or in as little as 30 seconds. On your phone, head to settings, then touch ID and passcode and enter your passcode. Here, head to require passcode and choose from the options. Another security hole is in the control center that can be accessed from the lock screen. If you lose your phone, someone can prevent you from finding it by putting your device in airplane mode. To prevent control center from being accessible, head to settings, then control center and toggle the slider off for access on lock screen. And finally, if you haven't already, enable Find My iPhone. With it enabled, you can track your lost device from another iOS device or your computer and see where your iPhone is on a map. In San Francisco, I'm Sharon Profis, CNET.com for CBS News. After a successful start making computer mice, keyboards, and headphones, Razer branched into laptops and fitness trackers. Now they've got a watch, but they want you to know it's not a smart watch. It's a watch with a few smart features built in. It's got notifications, will pull in your text messages and things like that from your phone, but otherwise it does world time, stopwatch, alarms, and things like that. Instead of being a second little smartphone-like device you interact with on your wrist like most smartwatches, this one's designed to pull in more ambient information. It'll be your fitness tracker, it'll pull in those smartwatch notifications into this tiny little scrolling interface, and it has a couple different batteries. So even if you run out of juice on the primary one for the notifications, you'll still have a secondary watch battery that lasts for up to 18 months. So you'll always be able to have the time and alarms and things like that. You'll never be without the time of day on your wrist. It's a problem we've had with some of the other smart watches out there. The Nabu watch is going to be shipping this month, January, for $149 for this plastic one. And there's a upscale forged edition for $199. It's the Nabu watch. If you're sick of rushing to the train station or walking around the city on your feet, you now have another option with the X-Scooter Urban Rider. A nifty little scooter, it goes up to 17 miles on one charge and it can go as fast as 50 miles an hour. It's really easy to fold up and there's a headlight, a little speedo for you and even a tail light when you brake. And best of all, it comes with an alarm so no one's going to run off with it. The charge is really small so it's super easy to set up and best of all, with just a twist of the handle, it speeds off very quickly. Here on the CES show floor, I've almost run into a number of people. <laughs> this is the RBE, and its designers say that it is the smallest electric scooter that you can buy today. Now, the RBE is what you call a last mile form of transport. The idea is that this small 35 pound electric scooter and just toss it in your trunk or take it on the train, even take it into a store with you. And then when you get where you're going, you just fold it out, hop on it, and take it for a ride. It's powered by an electric motor on the front wheel and has a range of about 20 miles with a four hour charge. Top speed's about 15 miles per hour, which would be dangerous in here, but will get you from the train station to your office pretty quickly. The Irby was pinned by a former Porsche designer, so there are a lot of aspects of its construction that keep weight down. The chassis is made out of aluminum with holes in it so that you use as little material as possible while still being stiff. The forks in the bar are made out of real carbon fiber. This thing is to the gram as light as it can possibly be. Now it looks a little bit funny and you might look funny on it, but it will get you that last mile from the train to your office without being a sweaty mess. 
I'm Antoine Goodwin. We've been taking a look at the Irv E electric scooter. Take it on back over. <laughs>a lot of interesting smart refrigerators here at CES this year. This one is the Whirlpool Smart French Door Refrigerator, a $3,800, 32 cubic foot model. Now that's a lot of storage space and interestingly it's that storage space and how this fridge takes advantage of it that Whirlpool's putting front and center. If you look, it's got this sort of pantry inspired layout with these gliding infinity shelves that move around and make room for tall items. It's a very interesting and sort of unique design. Whirlpool's pretty proud of that and putting that front and center as a way to help sell this fridge. On the smarts front, you've got Wi-Fi connectivity that'll sync it up with your phone via Whirlpool's app. You'll be able to get alerts if the power goes out or if the filter needs replacing. It also works with the Nest Learning Thermostat to help save you money by enrolling you in Nest Rush Hour Rewards. It'll run your refrigerator's defrost cycles during off-peak hours when it's most advantageous to do so. Here at CES with the Whirlpool Smart French Door Refrigerator, I'm CNET's Ry Chris. Sometimes all you need is a simple, solid tracker with an always-on screen. The Withings Go is coming early this year, and it's a $69 affordable fitness tracker, and it's got an e-ink display. It's a big deal because it's always on. It shows you simple stuff, your daily progress, and if you click in on the screen, it'll show you the time. That's it. But a lot of people don't want anything more than a watch plus fitness. And what's nice about the Go is it lasts eight months on a battery that's replaceable. It also can be worn while swimming, so you basically wear this all the time. Oh, and you can also clip it on. So it's a little versatile tracker that fits into Withings ecosystem. Withings has other fitness trackers, ones that look like watches, the Activite and the Activite Pop that launched last year. The Go is the most affordable fitness tracker that Withings has, and I really like it. I think it's cute, and I think I want to wear it for the rest of the show. I'm Scott Stein, and I'm looking at the Withings Go. Another fitness tracker, but a nice one. Fancy yourself as the next Beethoven, but have no musical talent whatsoever, the Phototonic might be the device for you. It is a motion activated sensor that you can use on its own or it sits inside this 21 sided shape. You can do things like toss it around and it responds to your movement, height, and the intensity of how you're throwing it around. Now, everything is controlled via Bluetooth through an app. You can choose all sorts of musical genres you want to play around with, from instrumental to electro. The app and the phone plugs into an external speaker that you have to have separately, or you can play it through the app itself. Now, you can do lots of different cool things with it, like control the tracks with just one. You get rhythm and melody control in the one, or if you have two, melody on one side, rhythm on the other. It even responds to how high you throw the device, like that, create a breakdown, or you can put the sensor inside your shoe and go for a bit of a dance off. The Phonotonic costs $99 and it's available now. With an update to the app coming on later in the year, you'll also be able to play along with other users around the world, listen into their broadcasts and upload music of your own. For more cool tech, check out CNET.com. Next big step in future mobility is the Volkswagen Buddy. This is a true long distance electric car. It offers an EPA manufacturer estimated range of 233 miles and it can be charged to 80% capacity in just 30 minutes. This is made possible by a new vehicle architecture developed especially for electric cars. This architecture allows us to adopt an entirely new path. We are doing more than just putting electric powertrains into our conventional models. We are developing entirely new and unique vehicle concepts, especially for long distance electric mobility. One difference, for example, is the location of the battery, which is now flat on the vehicle floor, which offers a number of benefits. There's room for a completely new design and new proportions. The flexibility in design allows new package solutions and the body offers a high degree 
of occupant safety. The low center of gravity means great road handling. And the all-wheel drive allows great performance. Emotional, with a long range and developed specifically for this purpose, this is what Volkswagen electric cars will look like in the future. <laughs> we are especially proud of the cockpit. It's a cockpit of the future, but not the distance future. Just, just take a look at this beautiful dashboard. It's arguably the most attractive human-machine interface ever installed in a Volkswagen. It's an extremely clean design and intuitive. Two full HD displays blend into one large surface. The entire infotainment system makes a giant leap forward. There's not much left from conventional cockpits of the past. There is only one large panel area creating one shared world of information. Playlists and apps can be moved wherever it feels best for you. But at Volkswagen, it's not enough just to look good. Everything needs to have a function. Let me give you a very practical example. You're on your, your way home from work and ask your friends to come over to watch the playoffs. But there is one important question. Are there enough drinks in the fridge? No problem for Buddy. Just have a look. As you see, you have to stock up. <laughs> Buddy is part of the smart home. It is connected even to the kitchen. From my Buddy, I can keep an eye on my fridge. And if you don't want to let the postman into your house, you can get your order delivered directly to the Buddy, no matter where the car is. Thanks to a special Dropbox, it works like a mobile 24-7 mailbox. <laughs> yeah. Here at CES, we're looking at the Backtrack Mobile. This device has been around for a few years now, uh, but there's been some significant updates since we last took a look on CNET. One of the biggest new features that they've just announced here at the show is Backtrack View. This is a way to actually remotely request somebody else to actually perform a breath test on your behalf. So you'll get the results sent to you and you can keep an eye on a friend or a loved one or a child or somebody that you want to keep track of. That can be sent as a, uh, an immediate manual request or it can be sent as an actual scheduled request or even a random test between set hours, say nine to five during a work day or maybe some party one evening. Uh, but you can set up a variety of schedules. Now we're gonna run the test. I have, in the name of science, I have had a couple of drinks just to kind of work out how this device works when you have actually had a drink and then someone sent you the test to see it work. I'm here at Pepcom with Black & Decker's brand new stick vacuum. That's right, it's a vacuum. And it's pretty cool because it can actually tell what type of floor you're vacuuming on. So if you're on carpet, it's gonna use a little bit more power than if you're on hardwood. Saving the battery and stopping you from using that guessing game of how much power do I need for this particular job. So the other two features aren't quite as exciting. The filter sense could be really useful. It tells you when to clean your filter. I often ignore my filter on my own vacuum, so that's gonna come in handy. The other one, battery sense, is LEDs telling you how much charge you have. That's pretty standard on stick vacuums. But AutoSense isn't, and if it can figure out how to use the vacuum's power better than I can, it'll be a pretty cool feature indeed. This Black & Decker stick vac is gonna be out in stores this spring. The price range is gonna be between 159 and 179, depending on how big a battery you want. And I'm excited to test it out in our CNET appliances lab. I'm here at Pepcom with the Brinks Array. 
This is a smart deadbolt that connects to your Wi-Fi and manages the power with this solar panel. It has a built-in lithium battery which recharges in direct sunlight and also in any ambient light or porch light. And according to a representative, the one-year lithium battery can theoretically last a lifetime in enough light. And again, the idea is that it supplies the power to Wi-Fi so that you can lock and unlock your door remotely. It has an iOS and Android app to allow you to do that from anywhere. It also has a keypad under the solar panel, so if you have a four-digit key, you can just punch that right in. The Brinks Array is going to cost under $300 when it hits the market later this year, and they're aiming for a whole bunch of interoperability here. They're going to try to integrate it with Nest, with HomeKit, with SmartThings. This is an ambitious product, and I'm looking forward to seeing if they hit all the marks that they're going for. These glasses look like my glasses, but they're not regular glasses. They're prototypes of potential smart glasses. Carl Zeiss Optics, which is a startup fully funded by Carl Zeiss, is working on manufacturing processes to create standard glasses that house secret smart glass tech inside. These don't have smart glass technology or projectors in them yet. The idea here is to carve the polycarbonate lens, like I would have in my glasses, but actually magnify and project what would be housed in here out to here so you can feel a screen hovering in front of you. Pretty neat stuff. These don't look like smart glasses, and that's the whole point. If you want to get beyond these weird bulky things, you got to make them look cool. Now, right now, smart glasses aren't really a thing you can buy in stores very much, but Carl Zeiss Optics is one of those companies that looks like it's building it and hoping it will come, and it probably will come pretty soon. I'm Scott Stein here at CES 2016 with a look at maybe my future glasses. If you've ever wished that your pet can play along with you on your PS4 or Xbox One, you're in luck. They kind of can. This is a game console for dogs and cats. It's called the Clever Pet. Now how it works is you fill it full of two and a half cups of your pet's favorite dry feed. There are three capacitive touch pads on the base here that your dog or cat needs to press in order to dispense food. But you can actually teach it to play games, logic games, patient games, things like that. So to get started, the light will flash up, your pet needs to press on the touchpad and will dispense a treat. That's so it knows what the lights are doing. After time builds up and the pet gets more and more aware of what the lights are doing, you can actually play sequence games. So pressing the lights in a certain order to dispense a treat. It's also internet connected, so when you're away from home you can see how much food your pet has eaten and also things like reaction times as well. So the Clever Pet is available for pre-order. The full price is $299, but if you're watching this before January 10, you can get it at $269. And keep your pet company while you're away from work. For more on the Clever Pet, cnet.com. At CES 2016, Dell has a new professional version of one of its most popular consumer laptops. Last year, everybody saw and loved the XPS 13 with its super thin bezel. Uh, now, this is the Latitude 7370, a very similar system, uh, but tuned for business users, professional users. The big differences here are uh, now you've got Intel's new sixth generation Core M processors. Uh, it's got support for vPro. It's got an optional smart card reader. You also get a, a more traditional looking touchpad here instead of the regular click pad you'd find on the, on the consumer version. Screen wise, you can get full HD or UHD, that's uh, 4K. And of course, it's the same touch screen uh, as you can get on the consumer versions. Uh, this guy is not gonna be out until March and it's gonna run about $1,200 or $1,300. So you can look for it then. <laughs> This is the Dell Inspiron 113000, a brand new laptop here at the 2016 Consumer Electronics Show, and it costs just $199. This cheap plastic laptop is some great value for the money. It's got a decent keyboard and touchpad, a screen that looks passable if not great, and solid build quality. 
You shouldn't expect too much from this laptop in terms of performance. It's only got an Intel Celeron processor, two gigabytes of memory, and 32 gigabytes of solid state storage, but it does have 10 hours of battery life with that configuration. We're hoping it'll be a great competitor for the HP Stream 11, which brought budget laptops to a new high last year. We don't have availability on the Inspiron 11 3000 yet, but we'll update you on CNET.com when we do. Next year, you might want to get your kid an adorable, cute, glowing caterpillar that also teaches your kid to code. The Fisher-Price Think and Learn Codapillar is coming in June. It's a $50 toy that blinks, flashes, and makes adorable sounds while it crawls around like a little robot. But what's cool is that each of these segments has its own function. It's a coding learning toy meant for kids ages three to eight. Each segment, depending on how you plug it in, will make different things happen in different orders. There are also expansion packs that are sold, $15 for a three pack that add different functions. You could play with this thing as a regular toy, maybe not even know that it's giving some sort of coding learning element inside. It's really cute though, and I kind of want one for my kid. I'm Scott Stein here at CS 2016 with a peek at toys to come. CBS Thursdays. Can I get a what, what, what? Close enough. Who doesn't like laughter? Oh. You shot your spit in my mouth. Who doesn't like astrophysics? I know that I may appear deranged, but a ask me the difference between a boson and a fermion. You go ahead, ask. Add them together, and you got the show that turns comedy. Hey, boyfriend. Can't talk. Spitball. Probably gonna die. <laughs> Into a science. Even I don't really understand it. Don't miss the Big Bang Theory. Thursdays, only CBS. These match the prints found at an Arby's break in in 07. You want to keep track of your kids' every move, you may not need to buy them a smartphone anymore. This $119 smart watch from Alcatel will do it for you. You don't need to pair it with a smartphone or anything like that. All you do is you buy the device, you put it on your data plan, and it acts as a GPS tracker and cell phone for them to dial your number in an emergency. You can store a whole bunch of contacts on there, and they press one button to reach out in case of an emergency. The companion app has a map where you can set a radius for your child to stay within and let you know if they exceed that confine. You'll be able to find it in the United States by the end of the year for $119. The Alcatel Pixie 4 isn't just one phone, it's actually a series of phones that ranges from really tiny to really big. This is a 6 inch version, this is a 3.5 inch version, you've got a couple in between. Now the specs also range along with the sizes, so the smallest phone is also the lowest end and the largest phone also has the highest end specs. Generally though, this is known as a very affordable range, so you're gonna get up to mid-range on the hardware here. This isn't a super phone. All we know for sure is that the phones are coming out in 2016 in certain markets, so the prices will vary and so will the phones that you're able to get. If you're eager to get your hands on a Windows 10 tablet with 4G capabilities, Alcatel is offering a rare, affordable option. Though carriers have yet to be announced, it's expected to hit Alcatel's web store within the next few weeks. It's not exactly a powerhouse, but for its price range, it's pretty standard, and at its affordable price, you can't expect too much. At CS 2016, uh, one of HP's other laptop tablet hybrids is getting a screen upgrade as well. This is the Pavilion X2. We previously saw it in a 10-inch screen version. Now there is a 12-inch version, and it retains uh, one of the main things we liked about the original, which is a pull-apart screen with a magnetic connection, so you don't have to press a button or flip a switch or undo a latch in order to separate the screen and the keyboard base. You just kind of yank it off and it comes off, and you put it back together, and the magnet guides you uh, so that it's 
snaps very cleanly into place. On this bigger 12-inch screen, uh, you get a higher res screen option, uh, full 1920 by uh, 1280, so a little bit uh, better than, than full HD. You can also get a much bigger SSD up to a 256 gig SSD, and in the 10-inch version, it topped out about 64 gigs, and, and that was it. And of course, you also get USB Type-C. We're seeing this pop up more and more, and here you use it for data connections and also to charge, which I find very handy. Uh, you're going to be able to get this guy starting in February for about $500. That is the HP Pavilion X2 12-inch version. LG just announced two smartphones this year at CES, one of which is the K10. It's a 5.3-inch Android lollipop handset that features a different design aesthetic from what we've seen in previous LG phones from years past. For example, it has subtly curved corners instead of the usual sharp corners, a display that softly curves down to the bezel, and in general, a much more organic design philosophy. The device has a 2.3 ampere hour battery and on the back is a 13 megapixel camera. But depending on where you live and your availability, the K10 will have different hardware. It will either have 3G or LTE capabilities, an eight or five megapixel front facing camera, a quad core or octa core processor with a clock speed ranging from 1.14 to 1.3 gigahertz, and either 16 or 8 gigs of internal memory. LG just unveiled these handsets in Las Vegas, so pricing and availability information have not been released yet. Be sure to check back with CNET.com for more info, as well as our full coverage of CES 2016. Sometimes some of the coolest stuff at CES are products intended for business and professional users, uh, not the more obvious snazzy consumer products. A great example of that is the HP EliteBook Folio G1. Uh, that's part of HP's professional line of laptops, but it's actually one of the cooler looking new laptops I've seen at CES. The easiest way to describe it is to say it looks and feels a lot like Apple's 12-inch MacBook, which is a super thin, super light laptop. Great engineering there. So HP worked with uh, Intel and Microsoft to come up with something that, that looks and feels very similar. Uh, here in the 12.5 inch display, you can go full HD or you can go UHD, which is uh, 4K. You also get uh, two USB Type-C ports, which I always like to see. And because it's for business users, you get things like a TPM chip and all that security uh, software and hardware built in uh, that corporate ID departments really need. Uh, but if you just want it to use it as a cool consumer laptop, you can just ignore all that stuff. Uh, this super slim light laptop is going to be uh, available in March, starting at a little over $1,000. That is the HP EliteBook Folio G1. So I'm here checking out Immerse It. It's an immersive experience for your living room. You put these pads underneath your couch or your chair, and they will move with whatever video or video game you're seeing on the screen. So you plug it into your TV, and anytime there's kind of action on screen or even some kind of suspenseful thing going on, the chair or the couch will move to keep you a lot more connected to the experience. This is already technology that's available in select movie theaters, but now you can bring it home with you. We don't know quite yet the pricing, but it will be available in late 2016, and the company is hoping to sell it for about the price of a laptop. You'll never need to wait in line at the nail salon again if you buy one of these. It's called the iNail Intelligent Printer, and yes, it prints directly onto your fingernails. It takes about eight seconds. You choose a design of your liking from the machine, or you can input an image of your own. It goes straight on your nail, and it is a gel polish, and then you put a top coat on and seal it with UV light. Or you can also print directly on these nail tips. They come separately, and you can stick them on your nails with double-sided tape and glue. The machine is expensive, though. It is $2,890. $99, but it is available now. If you want to find out more cool tech like this, head to CNET.com. Lenovo not only makes ThinkPads, they make X1 ThinkPads. That's the super high-end version, high design, high style, a little slimmer, a little lighter. Now they've got an X1 version of the Yoga. So this is the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Yoga. And of course, like other Yogas, uh, you could pick it up, tilt the screen all the way like this, bend it all the way backwards, have kind of a kiosk mode like this. 
then you can fold the screen all the way back and you have a tablet uh, with the keyboard. Uh, the keyboard tray sort of rises up so you have a flat surface here and of course the keys are and touchpad are deactivated. And then you could fold it back like this. Now we've seen all this before. What's so different about this guy? It is the first hybrid with an OLED screen, OLED. That is the super high-end television technology that you're going to want in your next TV. It's still too expensive right now. We've only seen it in a handful of other computer products. Uh, but when you see it in person, uh, the blacks are deeper, the colors are richer, uh, the display can be very, very thin. It's really extraordinary looking. And even seeing it on something relatively small like this 14-inch hybrid, uh, it really, it really makes a difference. It pops right out right next to it. This is a X1 Carbon, which is a very nice high-end uh, clamshell laptop with a regular non-OLED screen. Looks fine too, but you can definitely see the difference between these two. And of course, because this is a, a tablet-like hybrid, uh, you get a stylus with the X1 Yoga. It actually hides right over here and it recharges just by plugging into this slot. Uh, you can get this guy with the current generation Intel Core i7 processors. It's going to start at $1449 for a regular screen and if you want the OLED, that's $200 more. At CES 2016, that's the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Yoga. In addition to a 5.3 inch K10 counterpart, LG unveiled another handset at CES 2016 known as the K7. The K7 is one of two new phones that feature LG's new design approach and features soft corners, a display that curves down to its edges, and a more natural aesthetic. Depending on your region, the K7 will have either an 8 or 5 megapixel rear shooter. Its 5 megapixel front facing camera has a few selfie features like a digital front flash and the ability to take four consecutive selfies one after another with a simple hand gesture. The 5-inch phone will have two variants, an LTE version and a 3G version. Both models have a quad-core processor, but the LT1 will have a 1.1 GHz clock speed, and the latter will have a 1.3 GHz clock speed. You'll also get either 16 or 8 gigs of storage, depending on regional availability. Both versions, however, will have a 2.125 ampere hour battery. LG has not released all of its pricing or availability information yet, but for US customers, we know so far that it'll come to Boost Mobile sometime in Q1. You may already wear a watch on your wrist, and that's where the Misfit Ray comes in. There are a lot of fitness bands and trackers out there, and Misfit has made a number of interchangeable module trackers. The Shine can be popped into a variety of necklaces and pendants, and the Ray continues that idea, but makes it in a tubular look that feels more like a band that can fit on your wrist or also be worn around your neck as a pendant. There are 8mm spring pins on the two sides that allow you to pop in any chain that you might have or wear just on one side like a pendant. The Ray also works with smart home connectivity with a couple of functions that Misfit's already built into their app. It vibrates, it has lights, it tracks steps and sleep. It costs $100 for the sport band version or $120 if you want to get the leather band or again, just add in your own. Does it replace the Shine? It's not supposed to, but it's another design and one that's meant to feel a lot more low key. Maybe if you've got a watch, you might prefer this look. I'm Scott Stein here in Las Vegas with the Misfit Ray. Clip them on, pop them in your ears, and press a button. The Misfit Spectre are dual driver Bluetooth headphones, but they can also track activity. They're Misfit's new entry into audio. They get notifications put in your ears, and they're meant to replace your high-end fitness headphones that you may already have. However, are you gonna use this in addition to a fitness tracker that's on your wrist? We don't know. We don't know price of Spectre yet, but it's coming out soon. We'll find out more when we get to put these in our ears. I've often said that Lenovo's Y series is one of the best kept secrets in PC gaming. They've made a lot of great systems over the years. This is the latest. It's the Lenovo IdeaPad Y900, and it's got a couple of changes uh, that take it from being a good mid-level mainstream gaming system to being a high-end gaming system. Most importantly, it's got an overclockable CPU now. You can use uh, software overclocking, something you used to only see in very specialized boutique systems. And even more important than that, you can now get the NVIDIA 980M graphics card in there. Before, you could only get the uh, uh, the 960, and that really takes it up to pretty much the top tier 
of laptop gaming. Uh, the system's also got a couple of cosmetic tweaks as well. It's a little sleeker looking. It's got this kind of soft rubberized finish right here in the wrist rest, kind of a nice texture there. Otherwise, it's a big 1920 by 1080, 17 inch screen. Really the only place you're gonna find those these days is in these big gaming systems. This guy is gonna start at $19.99. That is the Lenovo IdeaPad Y900. Hi guys, I'm here at CES Unveiled. I'm taking a look at the Netatmo Presence. This is an outdoor security camera hidden inside a floodlight. And the deal is, it can tell the difference between people, cars, and animals, so you only get notifications on things that actually matter. There's no face recognition here, but that's gonna hopefully make this camera that much faster. Replace your existing floodlight with this guy, and then you can use the app to establish zones within its 100 degree field of view. Within those zones, you can tell it what to look for. So if there's a public sidewalk outside your place, you might not need to know that there are people walking there, but you might wanna know if there's a car driving along that sidewalk. You also can know if there's a person that wanders closer than that zone you've established. Netatmo is bringing its learning algorithm to the outdoors, and I'm excited to see if this really can beef up your home's security. He was our favorite little hero of Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and now BB-8 comes with his very own wearable. Previously, the Sphero BB-8 droid needed to be controlled with a smartphone, but now you can use the Force. Or the next best thing, Bluetooth. There's a range of sensors inside Sphero's Force Band that allow you to control BB-8 and the way he moves. You can do a Force Push, a Force Pull, or even change direction, all with a flick of a wrist. This is just a prototype version for now, but come fall 2016, you'll be able to buy the Force Band, as well as a battle-worn version of BB-8 that is a bit truer to the movie. For plenty more, head to CNET for all your CES 2016 news. If you love to fly paper aeroplanes when you were a kid, you're in luck. There is now kind of a grown-up version. It is by Parrot. It is called the Disco, and it is what the company claims to be the first fixed-wing consumer drone on the market. It travels 50 miles an hour. It has a range of 2 kilometers and 45 minutes of battery life. However, unlike a traditional drone, you actually throw this automatically, and it will stabilize in the flight. There is an application you can use to control the flight path via Wi-Fi. It is the same app that you use with other Parrot drones. Now, speaking of the camera, it is the same as what's found in the Bebop drone too, which is a 14 megapixel camera, 1080p full HD, and 180 degree wide angle lens. It's also compatible with an RC remote or the Sky Controller, which lets you use a first person view headset. This is a prototype, but Parrot expects it to be released on the market at the end of 2016. For more cool tech, check out CNET.com. Polar is taking the complexity out of losing weight with its new $99 smart scale, the Polar Balance. Here's how it works. In the Polar Flow app, you set how much weight you want to lose. I'm going to weigh myself on the scale, and that weight will be transferred to my Polar Activity Tracker. The real magic is in the Polar Flow mobile app. There's a weight loss speedometer, and it will show you whether you're gaining weight or losing weight. It will also give you feedback on how to lose that weight. The Polar Balance is available now for $99 in black and white. I'm Dan Grazier for CNET. Thanks for watching. Have you ever walked into a room and wanted to change the music that's been playing? Well, with the Prism, a music brain, you can now do that. So this is a device that detects the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices in the room 
when they've all installed a particular app. So if you walk into a room with a party and you've got the app installed, it will then scour your Spotify, Deezer and SoundCloud playlists and find out your particular music taste and then adapt what's playing through the system to your particular music likes. If you like a song, all you need to do is hit the heart button on the side. Likewise, if you dislike the song, hit the cross and it will remove it from your playlist and stop the song from playing as well. It connects to your existing speaker system using a 3.5 millimeter jack. There's also an optical input and it connects over Bluetooth as well. The microphone inside the device measures the ambient sound in the room different from the music that's playing, so it can detect if it's a party or if just friends sitting around chatting and adjust the music tempo accordingly. It is $149. This is the Prism. For more first looks at all cool tech products, CNET.com is the place to go. Windows 10 tablets are everywhere. A lot of people are using them for productivity. So Lenovo has a new version. This is part of their very high-end X1 line. This is the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 tablet. 12-inch Windows 10 tablet. Got a kickstand uh, that comes out from the bottom, kind of like this. And unlike a lot of other tablets, yes, you can put a keyboard on it. Uh, this guy has some very unique accessories, these clip-on modules. Uh, you take the tablet and uh, you buy one of these sold separately modules and you slap it onto the bottom right here. So one of them uh, has an Intel RealSense camera in it and you can actually uh, do some 3D scanning with it. You can run around somebody and make a little 3D portrait of them or do anything you do with an Intel RealSense camera. And then if you uh, have different productivity needs, you can get what they call the productivity module. And that's got an extra battery in it as well as some extra ports including a full size USB and an HDMI out and a connection to Lenovo's other docks. Uh, possibly the coolest accessory is one uh, we don't have here right now, but it's one of these and has a Pico projector built in. So you can plug that in and then send your video or your slideshow up to the nearest wall. Uh, this guy is gonna start at $899 and these modules run about $150 to $269. At CES 2016, that is the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 tablet. The ideal home theater desktop is probably a small form factor machine coming like this and you can load up all your movies and all your media on it and connect it uh, to your big screen TV or put it into your entertainment console. And that's what we have here with the Lenovo Idea Center 610S. It's got kind of a, a pyramid shape on the back. It's got all the ports and connections you need to hook it into your you know, TV or your other entertainment devices. And we've seen things like this before. Uh, you can go up to a current gen Intel Core i7. You can actually get uh, NVIDIA graphics in there up to a, a G for 750, uh, but what really makes this guy stand out is its accessory it comes with, and that is this guy right here, a projector, and it just clips right on top there. It's a 220 lumen, 720p projector. Uh, it requires, you know, a separate power cable, just like the desktop does, but they don't need to be connected to each other. They actually communicate wirelessly, so you can take the projector and just point it wherever you want and play your videos, play your slideshows, even maybe project some games. Uh, the whole package together uh, seems pretty reasonable. It's going to start at 849 and that is the Lenovo Idea Center 610S. Hey there folks, we are here at CES 
us unveiled with Marathon. That is a brand new startup with a new product of the same name. It's called Marathon. It is actually a washer and dryer in one that has a vent just like a traditional dryer. It also is expected to retail for just $11.99, meaning that you're getting a washer and a dryer for the price of two models, basically. It's scheduled to be available in regular stores in mid-2016, and it also has smart functionality. It has a touch screen that connects to Wi-Fi so you can do software updates, and it's also smart grid compatible so you can set it for off-peak hours and actually save yourself money in the long run. The general philosophy behind this marathon unit is to do away with the dryer altogether. So we expect to see a lot more interesting appliance updates from Marathon in the future. Thanks for watching. Gaming all-in-ones always seem like a good idea, but we haven't seen a lot of them over the years. And the ones that we have seen have usually been uh, an exercise in compromise. What we've got right here is the Origin PC Omni, uh, the most powerful, most customizable all-in-one gaming PC to date. Uh, it does not use mobile parts like a lot of other gaming all-in-ones that we've seen. You can actually get a desktop CPU, a desktop GPU, and it just has a standard motherboard in the back. So you can actually swap those parts out later if you want to and it is built into a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 display and it's a curved display. Curved doesn't work as well in gigantic living room size TVs. There it's more of a gimmick here uh, in kind of a personal one-to-one -one setting. It's actually really impressive. Uh, so this entire system right here is going to come out sometime first quarter of this year. Not sure how much it'll cost. I'm guessing around $2,000 and up depending on how you customize it. Uh, but even if you opt for lower end parts to start with, you can always swap in better ones later on and it can grow with you. At CES 2016, that is the Origin PC Omni. The Alcatel XS wants you to be a better cook. The Android-based 17.3-inch tablet features a custom overlay with one big window for finding recipes, one smaller window for keeping tabs on the news, and another smaller window for streaming video or listening to music. Since it's so big, it's primarily meant for at-home use. It has a built-in handle to carry from room to room, and it doubles as a stand. It also includes a stylus, two full USB ports, and a micro SD card slot. Pricing and availability have yet to be announced, but it's expected to sell for around $500 in the US. Check this thing out. It's called the Y-Things Thermo. It has 16 points of contact. You hold it up to your temple, and within a second, it measures your body temperature. It sends it over Wi-Fi to the app, and then it keeps a log of all the times you've measured your temperature. So it's called the Y-Things Thermo. It's $100, and it can track up to eight different users. So eight people in your family all can monitor the temperature and all can track it. The app has a calendar, so you can take it to the doctor. You can go over the different temperatures that you or your kid has had. And in the app, you can enter if you've taken pain meds, if you have any additional symptoms. It's kind of a cool, well-integrated device. It's simple functionality, but it uses the app to help you manage your health in a really neat way.
<clears throat> On today's show, we have entrepreneur, technology investor, all around good guy, and Radio Shack's newest chief creative officer, Nick Cannon, joining us on the show. We also have the 2016 CES Entertainment Matters Ambassadors, I, Justine, and Joey Grassifa. It is day two of CES. We're still alive. It's a miracle. <laughs> Barely. But this is Tomorrow Daily. Citizens of the internet and uh, and attendees of CES 2016, welcome to Tomorrow Daily, the best geek talk show in the known universe. I'm Ashley Esqueda, and I'm Jeff Kanata, and we are in day two of CES. We're we in got the thick. We're we in got the thick of it. awesome guests coming. We have uh, tons of tech to talk about. We've seen some really cool stuff already today, this morning. Indeed, uh, I actually saw a drone right over here in South Hall that seats a person. It I is a huge drone. I think that's just called an airplane. No, it's got four, it's got four copters, it's a quadcopter. And okay. it seats a person in a pod and they can take off and fly. I want it. Is it a person that is, is a willing participant or do you just capture people and take them with you? It would be pretty amazing. It, you know, <laughs> we're not quite there on tractor beam technology, but <laughs> I really like the idea of, uh, of getting that all together and, and, and just, just taking people from the sky and picking them up. But uh, our guest is here. Let's yeah. not waste any more time. Right. I'm very excited. Uh, everybody, please welcome technology. He's, he is the chief creative officer at Radio Shack. You might know him from America's Got Talent. You might know him from his music career. He's acting, he's in Chirac. He's also a tech investor and a geek. Please welcome Nick Cannon to the stage, everybody. Good Thank cheer. you so Good much. Cheer. Greetings, greetings. Hey, man. How you guys doing? Hi. Good, how are you Good doing? To see you. Good, Good to see, see you. you. You're, so, you're such a tech enthusiast, you come with your own microphone. I do, I just right. come in handheld, this is how we do it. I feel like I'm hosting America's Got Talent right now. Well. Do you have any talent? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has talent. Everybody does. Maybe yeah. somebody out there. Absolutely, tech talent. That's what we're all about here at CES 2016. Yeah, man, have That's you right. seen anything great so far at the show? Man, you know what, I have. I saw some really cool stuff. I mean, I love coming here every single year, but it feels like this year, it, it feels like Everybody's all about, uh, I, I think they're calling them, because uh, they don't want to call them televisions, but they're more like, like they've, they've went beyond the television we've, technology. We've beyond television. Yeah, so they're calling them like hubs, or they're calling wow. them portals, or they're calling them all these things because Portal. they do so much more than just being a television, because it's your, it's your device, it's your computer, it runs your refrigerator, it washes your clothes. So it's like yeah. these device, these giant screen devices that really control your whole office or your whole home. Now you, the one thing I really love about you is this is your, I think, seventh year? Seventh year here at CES. You are, you are a bona fide geek. I am a nerd. You, you all got the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what? I've always been a, a guy who's been into technology. I mean, even hence the, the, the job at Radio Shack and everything. It's, it's really just something that's in me because I've loved gadgets. I've loved music. And I started off in electronic music, not in the sense of like EDM, but in that sense of like synthesizers, keyboards. Uh, drum machines, that was the, actually where I first learned to play the drums was on actual electric drum set. So all of that stuff was always interesting to me as a kid. And then obviously video games and stuff. And now that I've become an entrepreneur, I've had the opportunity to invest in a lot of things, software, hardware, all of those different uh, things. So it, it's working out. So do you come to CES as a potential investor or do you come as a fan or? A little bit of both. I mean, usually I'm always coming because I have a product or something that I'm launching uh, myself, but I get the opportunity. I mean, I've made so many great business deals here over the years. Uh, so I, I look forward to it each and every year because I get that opportunity to actually find new products, find new things to invest in, and uh, find just different partnerships, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. So one of the, for me, uh, the, one of the things that I always really enjoy reading about when you talk about STEM and getting Ooh, yeah. kids really excited about STEM. and yeah. so. My, I'm, I'm really curious as to how you might bring that into your uh, your new role at Radio Shack. Well, that's the thing. I mean, when you think about what Radio Shack is and, and STEM technology, I mean, really it's education, uh, but it's fun education. It's electronic education. And uh, I personally, you know, because I was one of those kids that was diagnosed with ADHD, and, and it was always really difficult for me to focus. But then when you think about the STEM stuff that actually is stuff that kids actually already innately are doing when it comes to video games and drones and uh, coding, like this is stuff yeah. that, like I have a four year old that works, you know, all the gadgets better than I do. So, <laughs> so it's just, it's something that's innately in them and then it actually 
helps with mathematics and science and stuff like that. So here, uh, what we're trying to do at Radio Shack is just encourage people. Yeah, this has always been the cool place where you could come and get your uh, uh, remote control cards and stuff. But it's also a way to learn everything from coding to how to put conductors together and all that stuff. So it, it, it's really fun because it brings that idea of what toys were all about to education. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that on the show floor. Robotics yeah. that are geared toward very, very young children. And it's the yeah. stuff that we always wanted to have when we were kids. Like when you yeah. think about a drone and robots. Build your own robot? Come on, yeah. make I that happen. I still want a robot. <laughs> like I need one. Like the future is here. It's not yeah. the little Robbie robot anymore. No. Like it's the robots that actually do things. Yeah. yeah. Are you ready for the Internet of Things? Are you ready to connect your refrigerator to your TV, to your car? I'm trying to figure it out. That's why I said, like, these uh, <laughs> these sub portals or whatever they're calling them. It's like I'm a little taken back from, like, I don't know if I want to be, you know, watching my refrigerator. Like, yeah, there's I'm, a refrigerator <laughs> that takes a picture of all your food every day. <laughs> and, yeah. and then they were showing. I, I don't know if I'm ready, but I, I'm up for it. Yeah? I'm up for it. You're Let's ready. go. So on, uh, on, on a personal front with your social media, you're really digitally savvy. Yes, I try to be. That is such a world that, I mean, I love it. I mean, I, I'm actually casting a lot of my television shows now. I'm casting uh, Wild and Out uh, uh, through, I've been casting it through the internet and through social media for the last few years. And where actually I'm even, I have my app that I'm You're casting. Yeah, right? my incredible app. And it's really a social media uh, platform that allows people who are artists, entertainers, filmmakers, creatives, to kind of load up their content and create this community where it's not, you know, or even those days of MySpace where like, ooh, I want my stuff to be heard. This is actually a place where you can actually really be heard and I'm actually casting shows through that. And, and I've created some great relationships with some incredible YouTubers, Viners, uh, even digging into Snapchat right now, figuring out some really talented people to put them on a television platform. Is there an app or a service that you think is kind of really up and coming in terms of content creation and sharing? Oh, man, there, there's so many. Like I said, if anything, I would say my, my incredible app. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. the one we want everybody to uh, start to there. focus on. But, you know, like I said, it, it's I've, I've actually been amazed on how Snapchat is actually turned into a place where people are being discovered and actually can communicate and uh, people are making some great content. I mean. Uh, it, it, it feels like that same wave that Vine was a couple of years ago that, you know, people are actually really doing some really cool things in that space. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And the cars, you know, the cars that are, they're showing this year at CES, I think, are pretty exciting too, right? Yeah. I'm, and I think in a, car, in a couple for? of hours, I'm taking the test drive in the self-driving car. So I'm a little nervous because... <laughs> I don't well, if this, if this is the last time we talk to you, yeah. <laughs> we wish you well. Exactly. So I hope it doesn't drive me off too far, but I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Because last year I took the, I guess it, it was probably just the, the virtual tour. Right. right. And it was nice, you know, because I didn't move. I was actually... <laughs> Planted, but safe. but now I'm actually going in the car. So uh, let's let's see how that well, works. Out. It's it's going to be actually I think safer than human beings driving you around. Yeah. So there, there, yeah, there, there's no margin of error unless yeah. we get into like some weird eye robot stuff and he just takes you <laughs> off. Oh, no. Well, just don't <laughs> just don't take the, the robot just off. Just like Skynet doesn't it. turn on yeah. while you're in the car. You'll there it fine. is. You'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and talking to no us. No problem. Uh, is there? I mean, obviously, incredible. You want to definitely check that out. Yes, definitely check out the incredible app. Spell with the capital letter N, incredible after that for my initials. And uh, yeah, more than anything, we're just pushing forward and continuing to make content and continuing to make some great consumer products. I love it. I think it's great that what you're doing to get kids involved, too. That's really cool, man. That's what yeah. it's all about. Right on. Thank you. And all good right. luck with everything. Thank and you. have a great good CES. Thanks Likewise. for stopping by the stage. No Appreciate problem. it. Thank you, everybody. Nick Cannon, everybody. All we right. are going to take a very quick break. We will be right back with entertainment matter our, our ambassadors they, they yes. picked up the torch from you this year <laughs> yeah, hi I justine and joey graspa will be with us but uh until then stick around it's tomorrow daily
have returned and we have uh, two new guests on the oh. stage, the CNET stage. It's uh, the uh, ambassadors. Yes. yes. Can you of believe entertainment it? matters? Yes. <laughs> okay, I Justine, Joey, why does entertainment matter? Okay, well, do you not like to be entertained? First of all, so Are you I not think entertained. It, yeah. <laughs> so of course it matters, but I mean, this is the place where you know entertainment, pop culture, tech, everything sort of is combined in one, and it's it's incredible. Yeah. So do you, as ambassadors, have to physically greet everybody who comes in? Is that the <laughs> yes, hello? Welcome to CES 2016. You have yeah. to entertain everyone right. individually. Yeah. We do. We give high fives. It's great. It's amazing. So you guys, uh, the reason you were chosen is obviously you both have huge subscriber bases on YouTube. You are pretty much. I mean, you guys are everywhere, kind of a little bit. You guys have really blown up and and are examples of this sort of self content creation becoming a, a brand, which right. is really inspiring to a lot of people out there who love to watch who you are, what you do, and what you're into. Um, so here at CES, what are some of the trends that you feel you're really excited about? Virtual reality. Oh, 5,000%, yeah. yes. Did you pre-order your Oculus yesterday? No, I just found out that that's out and you can pre-order it. I actually had a developer kit like a couple years ago, so it's cool to go to their booth and see how far it's come and it's not like a huge brick on your face now. Right. It's like, yeah. it's nice and sleek and looks cute. They're all getting lighter, they're all getting more comfortable. Yeah. I just was all the way across town at the HTC booth and uh, looking at the Vive and it's checking awesome. it. Isn't it great it's with the so front-facing cool. camera? Yeah, well, and it's really cool too because a lot of the things is, is you kind of lose your sense of space. So with these other newer devices, you know, you actually have controllers. You can have tactile feedback and yeah. interacting with things in this fake world. And you can feel free to walk around because you're, you're blocked off in the real space and virtual space. So, you know, having that sense of perception, it definitely helps. Yeah, and the new controller has a uh, dedicated camera button, so you push it, and it's like your hand has a, f a photograph on it that's a moving picture of what you're seeing, what and you can seeing. just hold it up. It's yeah. so cool, so, so, so cool. Um, okay, so virtual reality, you're really excited about. Yeah. I, I agree, I think it's pretty amazing, and I'm excited. It's also odd how it's such a crowded space and nothing is actually available in retail yet, none of the headsets. Uh, what about you? What are you excited about? What have you seen that's oh, really wow. been like, oh gosh, besides you mentioned meeting BB-8. I did meet BB-8. I don't know if it's the BB-8, but it was a BB-8. I and think it's it was, the BB-8. I think it's, we have to admit. It is. There's look. only one BB-8, just like Santa Claus. Well, I think there's yeah. actually four or five that they used on the film, you know, spoiler wow. alert. But uh, <laughs> I mean, there's so many things at CES. And you know, I, I know you have dogs as well, so the pet tech is incredible. There's so many things that they're, they're coming out to make your pet's life easier and you know, the pet parents' yes. life easier. I think we're demoing a, potentially a dog video game console yes, tomorrow. Yes, I, I, I think I know exactly what you're yeah. talking about. They're, they have a really cool time-lapse video yeah. of it, and they show like the dog going out throughout their whole day of like playing with the game. Aww. It's so awesome. Tech it's companies so have great. realized that not only are like actual human baby moms excited about tech, but dog parents are like, yeah. oh my god, my baby needs this technology. Wait, it's wait, really you guys cool. have to explain my this to me, baby. a dog video game console. Yeah, so I don't remember what it's called, I'm blanking on it, but it's like sort of this little device and there's different lights that, that light up and the dog will hit them and I and believe, treat. Like, yeah. Oh you're a good dog. You're a good dog. No, like a You're a good dog. Says. Yeah. Like Who's my little boy? It's so great. There's also another thing that I saw. It wasn't here, but I think it's already out. It's like this little pet monitor where you can talk to your pet and be like, hey, sit, and you can give it a treat. Yeah. But I, I think mean, it's Pet Cube. Pet yes. Cube. And, then, and then so I think Pet Cube also has a little laser that you can like play with them, virtually, like away from. Oh, yeah, and they even have, cool. I think uh, last year they were doing a promo where you were able to play with a whole group of rescued cats in San Francisco. There was like a, a cat rescue and you were able to like use the wow. laser pointer and the control and stuff That's and it was so adorable. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, drone tech. I mean, there's drones are so huge and I think the problem that we're gonna be facing obviously is now you're gonna have to register your drones and yes. where do you fly your drones and drone regulations and don't be a, a mean person with your drone and go do crazy things. Right. Uh, but there's yeah. so many things and, and people, if you're not good at, at uh, piloting a drone, that's potentially dangerous to a lot of people. So right. using Intel's real sense technology, they're able to sort of sense that depth perception. So basically you really can't crash it. Yeah, yeah. and also, uh, so we've talked about on Tomorrow Daily a lot of anti-drone technology, and it always amazes me that, uh, I was really surprised we didn't see a lot of this at uh, CES this year, but I think next year we might see some. So law enforcement agencies, so for example in Japan, a drone landed on the roof of the prime minister's house with radioactive material last year. And so the, to the Japanese police were like, we have to figure out how to get these drones out of the sky without being dangerous. So they actually put together a huge drone with a net underneath it, and it chases oh, wow. after drones that are in illegal airspace, and That's it captures so them. Cool. Like Ironically, uh, the dog video game controls it. 
Yeah, so yeah. they have dogs control. No, it's controlling it's drones. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, and then there's uh, there's another one here that was developed here in the states called Drone Defender, and it looks like a giant anti-aircraft gun. But instead of actually shooting a projectile at a gun, it shoots a radio signal that interferes with the drone's flight, confuses it, makes it think, oh, I'm out of range. I should return to my master. And then it either lands safely or returns, so you can get it out of spaces that you know law enforcement might need to like fight fires. For in sure. California, we had problems with drones and fires. And yeah, stuff. and I know like with a DJI. They they have sort of like the no-fly zone, so right. they make it easy to know, I can't actually fly here, so I think it's just the awareness and knowledge of what you can do and what you can't do with the drones yeah. is super important. Have you seen the drone that is able to carry a person? Yes. Have you seen this? No. This is the picture of it. Oh, oh wait, I didn't gosh. see this one. We can't no. go inside. Okay, here, we try to take this picture here on this camera. <laughs> this is crazy. It's like the size. It's, it's a, a huge it's a pod. It's basically a tiny one-person drone copter. It's That's got amazing. four. It, it's you can't call it a drone amazing. if it has a pilot it's, inside it, right? That's not it a maybe, drone. But maybe you're, I mean, it's, it's, it's RC, I guess. It's like an unmanned air, it's a so manned it's like, aerial hey, vehicle now. Hey, Ashley, I'm going to hop in the drone, take me for a ride, and yeah. you control me on the ground, and I'm like, oh, this that is terrifying. That would be awesome. Oh, I would not terrifying. be terrified. I would be <laughs> like, this is exciting because I don't know how to fly. But me, have a friend fly you that knows how to fly drones. Yeah, but I think it yeah. actually just might be a helicopter that's shaped like a drone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's what I was like saying. the new Uber. Be like, no, just it's... show up at your house and be like, just hop in. I had too drone. much to drink tonight. I'm just gonna hop in the thing. Yeah. Fly me home. Listen, there's You're sober. Really Have you home. seen here in Vegas? They have Uber Chopper. Oh, no. I have seen those. If you open up Uber in Las Vegas, they have you know UberX, Black Car, all that stuff. And at the end, there's a Wi-Fi car. So some of the car services have Wi-Fi in them. Oh, wow. Ooh. And then the last one is Uber Chopper, where a helicopter can come pick you up and fly you over the strip for a little while. Well, here at CES, the traffic is terrible. So basically, I'm like, can I get the quickest car in the quickest location? But it is. Use the drone. There you go. Use the drone. But I mean, I'm so glad that Uber's in Vegas now. I mean, it, it really is life changing. So as entertainment ambassadors, what do you guys think as, as entertainers, as people who are consuming and creating entertainment, what is the stuff that's happening here at CES that's most interesting to you from that perspective? Mm, uh, we came across this like handheld, it's very small, like almost, what's It was what called was the, the Osmo, which is actually made by DJI. I, I keep, I always blur those <laughs> letters together. They just do not fit and flow off the tongue very well. But yeah, it's made by and them yeah, and it's, it's like the a same cam, company. Like almost for like, for vloggers it would be great because right. it's great it's smooth good. footage. It's, really use. it's got that little weight in yeah. it. Yeah, it's really, it's really great for creators such as yourselves who are out and about doing things all the time. Right. Um, in the sense of uh, what you guys are doing outside of CES, I know that uh, previously you guys worked together on a on a kind of a web series that you made, Fight, Fight of the Living Dead, right? Yeah. And uh, but you're right now working on a series for YouTube Red. Yeah. And can you tell? Is are you allowed to tell us a little yeah, bit about yeah. it? Okay. Uh, so essentially, it's like a murder mystery. So it's going to be like kind of like Clue meet Survivor with a bunch of YouTubers thrown into a murder mystery scenario, uh, similar to Fight of the Living Dead, actually, where. They're not, the contestants aren't going to know anything about what they're going into, and they have to essentially live to the end. Is this what I agreed to do? Yes. Okay. Oh, you're <laughs> Well, you know, you, there was some talk about it. I was like, wait a minute, is this the same thing? So I'm yeah, not yeah. going to know what the, Oh, you're going to know about it. As long as you're not the victim, that's Can the only that's the most important part. No, I think that'll be really fun. I mean, and doing the Fight of the Living Dead was sort of this really surreal experience yeah, because it was like a living video game. I mean, you were in this... Everyone thought it was sort of scripted. I was like, that was not scripted. We were actually genuinely terrified. Yeah. Well, I would like to suggest it was I just seen in the conservatory with, with an unmanned drone. <laughs> with an Osmos. Or an yeah, drone. I think that works really good. Um, that, we're, we're, that's all the time we have. We're going to let you go enjoy more of the show okay, and, cool. and see everybody else who wants to talk to you guys. Obviously, super popular. Uh, where can we find you on the internet? Because obviously, we want everybody to subscribe if they haven't already. Yeah, I'm just, I just seen everywhere online. Yeah, I'm just Joey Graceffa. Perfect. Well, thanks, guys. Jesse yeah. and Joey, Appreciate thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, actually, that is it for today's show. We are all done. Always it was just all guests. guests all the time. Uh, lots more coming up there on CNET, though. Yeah, we have a lot of great stuff. Stay tuned for all of our coverage. We're right in the thick of CES Day 2, and we'll have more content right here on the CNET stage live from Las Vegas. Thank you so much, guys. Be, Be good, good humans. humans.
You're looking at a 98-inch 8K TV. LG says this is going to be the first production-ready 8K television. They say it's going to ship sometime in 2016. No pricing yet. It's going to be a little bit more than $8,000, though. 8K resolution gives you four times the resolution of 4K and 16 times the number of pixels as 1080p. The number is astronomical, 7680 by 4320 pixels. That's more than 33 million pixels or almost 100 million subpixels. Lots of pixels. I look really closely at the screen of this. You can see the tiny little pixels. Again, there's no 8K content available right now. This TV actually accepts 8K via an MHL, super MHL connection. So there's really no HDMI spec that can handle it either. But of course, they, you will be able to play 4K and 1080p content, upscale it to the resolution of the television itself. Of course, it has HDR compatibility. LG says that it can increase the peaks and use un, unused electricity to improve the contrast of this television. Of course, this TV is 98 inches, so it's going to be ridiculously expensive when it comes out later this year. LG does say it's shipping. Again, the first production ready 98 inch 8K television, LG's 98 UH9800. I'm David Katzmeyer, CES 2016 for CNET. The BMW i3 already has self-parking technology, but you have to be in the car to do it. Now, at CES, BMW is showing gesture-controlled parking with an Apple Watch when you're outside the car. To activate it, I shake my wrist, and then I just sweep it away. But let's take a look at some other gesture control technology that BMW has here at CES. Now I'm sitting in the BMW iVision Future Interaction concept car, which uses the air gesture technology that BMW announced here at CES. So with air gesture, I have sensors along the dashboard here that can read where my hand is, and I've got a big screen up here for my infotainment interface. So if I wave my hand across, I can choose from navigation, media, communication, smart home, and I can choose submenus in each. So if I go to communication and look for my contacts, I can press a button on the steering wheel and open up a submenu of contacts and I can wave my hand around to choose the person I want to talk to. And once I find one, I can push a button here on the steering wheel again to initiate that phone call. 
BMW already has some simplified gesture control in the new 7 Series, but this air gesture concept takes it a step further. This is something we could see in the future that could actually eliminate a lot of buttons and dials that we see in cars today. One of the most important steps in building the self-driving car of the future is getting the sensors right, letting the car know what's in the world around it. Right now, I'm in a car by Renesas, a chip company that supplies chips to automotive manufacturers around the world. Uh, they're just testing out their new R-Car H2 chip that can actually enable uh, self-driving. But at this point, we're just looking at the sensor fusion, what, how these chips process the sensors around the car. So we've got a view right now, a surround view from cameras around this car we're in. And this is showing us what's all the way around the car. And this is being processed by the computers. The computers can use this to help determine what not to hit and where to go, where it's safe to go in a self-driving car. But now let's look to another step in this, how the car finds the lanes it can go into. With this view, we're looking at the forward cameras. The car is looking at the lanes and the cameras are identifying lane lines and it's using this green band here to show us that it's recognized where the lanes are. It's looking at the markings on the road. That's obviously crucially important for a self-driving car so it can determine where it can actually go and how to stay in its own lane. This is what engineers call a scatter pattern. This is sensor fusion. It's taking all the input from those cameras and LiDAR sensors around the car, showing what's around. And you can actually see on here, it identifies specific things, like there's a car coming up here, and it can, you can see it up here, that it's telling us that's a car. The libraries, the computers in the back of this car will recognize these things and apply a label to them. Now this is just a sensor demonstration at this point, but what Renaissance engineers are doing are taking this data and figuring out how they can make the car understand what to do in these circumstances when they find these things on the road. So this is one of the first steps in developing the self-driving car that we're looking forward to in the near future. Finn is in, at least for televisions at this year's CES conference in Las Vegas. Samsung, Sony, and other manufacturers are slimming down the width of the screens, like this latest offering from LG. I think it's about a tenth of an inch thick, about this, the depth of four credit cards. But these skinny sets don't skimp on picture quality. Technology has moved from 4K to HDR, or high dynamic range. The idea there is that you have improved color and you have improved range in the range from black to white. So the picture can look a lot better. The catchphrase is not just more pixels with 4K, but better pixels with HDR. But before you upgrade, be warned. This technology is in its infancy and therefore expensive. And there's not much content to watch on these screens. There's only a few guys putting it out. There's only a handful of movies that handle it. So we're going to see a lot of it uh, coming next year. But again, how good it's going to be, how it translates into the home uh, is going to be really fun to watch. Another screen soon vying for your attention will be smaller and only inches from your face. Virtual reality headsets like the HTC Vive and Oculus Rift are set to hit the market later this year. People are very interested in trying to figure out how to make this look more interesting, be easier to use, be more affordable, and have ways to interact and be places that aren't just about putting it on your face. To make virtual reality feel more real, there are armchairs that move and shake you in sync with the movie. And, oh, it's a bumpy ride. Woo, round the corner. Woo, going right. And you can even try your hand at making VR content. You're going to see a ton of do-it-yourself, 360-degree VR cameras, a lot of them will be called. They'll let you shoot video that will be then seen using virtual reality headsets. For the latest news and reviews from CES, go to CNET.com. In Las Vegas, I'm Kara Suboy, CNET.com for CBS News. A gaming laptop that now has a new brilliant OLED screen. This is the same kind of screen technology you'll find in the latest smartphones and big OLED TVs from LG and Samsung, now here in a PC where this extremely fast response rate of this screen, gorgeous colors, means that you can enjoy games in a way that you probably haven't before on a laptop. Typically, laptop screens have a refresh rate of maybe 16 milliseconds. This one goes down to one or two milliseconds, so you don't see that ghosting around the edges of your characters when you're playing games. That's the new quad high definition OLED screen for the Alienware 13, and you should expect to see it for the same price as the old quad high definition screen when it arrives later this year. 
Tomorrow's fitness trackers will come in new forms. I'm Bridget Carey. This is your CNET update. It's another day at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and the tech news train keeps on rolling. The convention center show floor has been swarming with people checking out the future gadgets of 2016. And one of the trends we're seeing is a focus around health and new ways to track fitness. Fitbit is a popular fitness tracking brand that showcased a new watch called the Blaze. Now, it still tracks the same activity, but now it has a color screen that you can strap into different bands and cases to fit your style. It also links to your your phone for some notifications like text messages and appointment reminders and it includes some pre-installed workout coaching programs it comes out in March for $200 but while Fitbit was showing off this new gadget it also was hit with a class action lawsuit from users that claim its heart rate monitors are inaccurate and that the devices don't count every beat. Some claim it only counts half of your beats per minute. With questions around accuracy and fitness trackers, maybe you don't want to spend $200. And so we're seeing many cheaper options on the show floor. The Huawei <laughs> Honor Band Z1 only costs $80. It comes out this month. It has a round smartwatch design. And along with fitness tracking, it gives you some missed message notifications from your phone. It's it's not really heavy on apps. The Withings Go is a $70 fitness tracker. It has an e-ink screen, so it's always on. The battery lasts eight months. Now, it just shows you your daily fitness progress, but when you click on the screen, you also get the time. It can be worn on a band or put in a clip, and you can also take it swimming. There's also some new fashion designs. The Misfit Ray <laughs> does the same tracking stuff as Misfit's other models, like the Shine, but the Ray looks like a simple jewelry rod that you pop on a necklace or your wrist, and that's neat if you already wear a normal watch you don't want to wear two circle watch things on one wrist it starts at hundred dollars and if you'd rather not wear anything on your wrist we're seeing more tech for the feet under armor has these smart sneakers that do all the tracking for you during a run and they look at your stride these cost hundred and fifty dollars they come out next month or you can put all the smarts in your pants with the lumo run shorts it's a sensor that tucks into the shorts to measure not just how fast and far you go but also how you're moving with analysis on things like pelvic rotation that's also $150 coming out in the spring. And we're still running right along, covering every corner of CES 2016. So keep checking in with us on CNET.com slash CES. Coming to you from the CNET stage at the Las Vegas Convention Center, I'm Bridget Carey. We're checking out Modiface, a new technology that lets you try on different makeup looks just by looking in the mirror. The technology uses gestures in order to change the look, so if you raise your eyebrows or purse your lips, you can try on different makeup looks. These are pretty intense colors, but you can use them for much more understated makeup looks and even change your eye color or your eyebrow design. The goal is to have this in an actual mirror that you'll see in a beauty store like Sephora or Ulta, and you can change your looks just by looking in the mirror, try on new makeup styles, and they can cater the actual colors to whatever brands are available for sale. Right now you can download the Modiface Live app, it's free on iOS, and eventually you're gonna see these Modiface HD mirrors in stores. I'm Sarah Mitroff for CNET here at CES 2016. It may not be the biggest product here at CES, but this is really one of the hottest. This is Griffin's BreakSafe Magnetic USB-C Power Cable. Try saying that five times fast. Now what makes this special, right? If you have something like one of the new MacBooks that's only USB-C, you have a Chromebook Pixel, you want that MagSafe experience, this cable gives it to you. You plug in one into the USB, and then if you have any pressure, you might trip over your cable. It pops right off and reconnects with magnets and prongs. This is going to be available sometime in April for the price of $39.99. And when you think of all the USB-C compatible products that we're expecting to see moving forward, this is going to be a big thing, and it's here at CES 2016. Hi, I'm at the Hisense booth with the 65H10C. This is Hisense's ULED third generation, the flagship TV for 2016. It's going to be coming out later in the year for $27.99. Again, one of the best spec TVs on the market, competing with the Samsungs and LGs of the world, but at a lower price point. This TV uses LED LCD technology with Hisense's ULED twist. That means it does have 1,000 nits peak brightness. It can also have 
local dimming up to 300 zones on this set. So that really right there puts it in the upper echelon of LCD performance. The set is also compatible with the latest HDR standards, HDR10. It does not support Dolby Vision at this time, but you will be able to stream Amazon HDR content on this thing, get you that improved HDR picture quality, and of course we'll work with forthcoming Blu-ray players that stream out HDR and 4K Blu-ray content. This TV also hits 99.98% of the DCI color space. That's as much as we've heard from any manufacturer. So you get those wide colors again with this next generation HDR content. It has a curved screen available in 65 inches. The current generation is out on the market now at 65 inches and 55, slightly lower specs. But again, Hisense is really making a play in the US market with these high-end television. That's the Hisense 65 H10C. I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET at CES 2016. Hi, you're looking at Hisense's 100-inch TV system. They're calling it LaserCast. It's going to run for about $7,000 when it launches in the U.S. in the first half of this year. They're also saying there's going to be a 4K version of this set. It comes out in the second half for around twelve grand. So for that screen size, 100 inches, those prices are pretty darn good. It's able to achieve that with a short-throw laser projector down here on the bottom. You can see it goes right up against the wall and shoots up onto this screen. The system comes with the screen, the projector, as well as a sound bar and the speaker system. So it's a complete television in a small package, and again, a lot less expensive than you pay for a screen size this large for an LCD TV. Hisense also says the TV has a little safety feature on it, so in case your kids go walk up to it, it'll turn off automatically to avoid eye damage. It uses Texas Instruments DLP projection system, again with a laser light engine that can last up to 25,000 hours, so you're not going to be replacing bulbs on this thing very often. That's a quick look at Hisense's LaserCast system coming to the United States a little bit later this year. I'm David Katzmeyer at CES 2016 for CNET. There are a lot of smartwatches at this year's CES, and Huawei's got one that runs its own software, the Huawei Honor Band Z1. It's not Android Wear, it runs its own software and operating system, but basically it tracks fitness, and it only costs $80. It's coming out in January. Uh, it works with iOS and Android, so it'll pair with both. The Honor Band Z1 comes in two different sizes with two different battery lives. Three days for the small, four for the large. It's really nicely designed, and that's the thing we've been noticing at this show, is that a lot of watchers are stepping up their design game. This one has a 128 by 128 pixel resolution screen, and if you're looking for a basic type of watch and don't want to pay too much, want to get notifications, track fitness, and don't want to necessarily buy into a lot of apps in an operating system, this type of watch may be up your alley. If you're looking for watches, there are a heck of a lot of them at this show. From CES 2016 in Las Vegas, I'm Scott Stein. One of the surprise hits from last year's CES was the Intel Compute Stick, a tiny device about the size of a chunky USB key that you could plug into any monitor or television and turn it into a fairly basic desktop computer. So of course this year we're back with the second generation of the Intel Compute Stick and I've got it right here. Still very slim, very tiny. It's basically got an HDMI output on one end right here and you plug it into the HDMI port on your television, on your monitor. Uh, the big improvements this time are that it has two USB ports instead of just one, so if you want to connect a dongle for, let's say, a keyboard and a mouse and they're separate, or a keyboard-mouse combo and something else, you have an extra port there, very handy. Faster Wi-Fi because it's got 802.11ac instead of the older N, and of course it's got an updated version of Intel's Atom processor, so it should be a little bit faster, still not going to be your all-day, everyday computer. Now, if you think this looks very slim and slick and just plug it in and go, you do need a couple of accessories with it. If you need some extra clearance to get the uh, HDMI cable in, it comes with an HDMI extender, that's pretty handy, and of course it needs power, so you do have to have a little power bricking cable also, so you got to chain all this stuff kind of together, but still hide it behind your TV, uh, still a fairly easy way to get uh, streaming video or any other online stuff you want on your TV or on your monitor. This guy is going to be available now, suggested retail price $159 at CES 2016, that is the second generation Intel Compute Stick. Hi, you're looking at one of LG's new 2016 OLED TVs. This is the E6 series. This TV is the second most expensive OLED TV that LG has announced at 2016 CES. This set has the same picture quality as the other 2016 OLED TVs, which means we expect it to be the best picture quality on the market today. 
The new TVs include HDR compatibility with Dolby Vision, so you can watch Dolby Vision discs and stream Dolby Vision content with these TVs. That's separate from the Samsung HDR TVs, which do not support Dolby Vision. These sets also include all the benefits of OLED, which means perfect black levels, really nice, bright picture. Uh, LG says they've increased the brightness a little bit this year. They've also increased the color gamut coverage, so these TVs should be able to approach more of the DCI spectrum as, than last year. Another differentiation from the less expensive OLEDs this year is this little speed speaker along the bottom here improves the audio quality. The difference between this and the G6, which is a little more expensive, is that all the connections are on the back of this TV, like a standard television. The G6 has a more modular design with this speaker on the bottom and all the connections there. You can fold it behind it for slicker wall mounting. That's a quick look at the E6 series. Again, no pricing. We're expecting first half availability a little bit earlier than LG's other OLEDs, but that's the information we have so far. At CES 2016, I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET.
What's up, CNET Nation? I am Brian Tong, and we are here, yes, live at CES 2016. I am here for a special tech demo. I saw a woman with two children in the crowd earlier. I'm glad they left. And right now, we're going to show you how the world of adult entertainment using virtual reality to create new experiences inside of adult video. And here to show us how is Naughty America's CIO, Ian Paul. Hey, thanks for coming hey, out to the stage. Thanks so much, Brian. I really um, appreciate it. I just want to let you know that I've done a lot of interviews and I will make sure I ask you the hard questions, okay? okay? Let's, let's hear it. All right, so you know we're here and VR is one of those themes that has exploded, has evolved, has accelerated, and Naughty America is getting involved in that. Tell us what led you to this point. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Brian, um, we've been waiting for this moment, I think, since uh, the dawn of technology, right? Full immersion for the adult experience. And, and now we're here with, uh, with the Oculus and the Samsung Gear VR and the cardboards. We actually have been producing this product since uh, the July time frame, and, and, and users love it. How much do they love it? They love it quite a bit. I mean, we're getting feedback every day, performer requests, uh, requests for content and, and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, we expect that at the end of 2016, 10 to 20 uh, million users will be accessing adult VR content at least once a month. Wow, okay, now also though, I've got to imagine, I'm not familiar with the Naughty America website. Yeah. But uh, making this type of content from 2D to virtual reality experience. What are some of those challenges? Certainly, yeah, there's, there's definitely some challenges, uh, you know, particularly in getting the, the camera angles just right for the medium, um, uh, coaching the performers to take advantage of the unique nature of the medium. We like to emphasize uh, the performers to, to kind of uh, move back and approach the camera to, to get that 3D effect. Lean back um, a little bit, huh? Yeah, so uh, of course then the, uh, the production workflow is totally different, stitching together the files and, and all that's required with that. Okay, so a lot of people here you know, I've never, I've really never experienced this before. We have an Oculus set up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to try on VR porn for the first time. Before we do this, I do want to apologize to my mother, who I love very much, as well as my fiance. But this is all for like reporting and tech. That's this it. Like, this is research. Got to get hands on. I got to dive in on this <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. So, let's uh, do it. Okay. So this is, uh, I guess, help me out here, guys. Okay, Pop yeah. this bad boy on. Yep. Let's put it on here. Okay. Good lord. Got it. We'll get the earphones on. Oh, I'm feeling that vibe now, okay? Yeah, we got the binaural sound. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, hit it. Okay, well, I'm gonna start watching this. You guys at home can see what I'm seeing, okay? Okay. Experience your first threesome. Those are not my pants or legs. <laughs> I do not have tattoos. Are, are you seeing this? What is she doing with her finger in her mouth? I don't know, I don't understand. And I know we I'm not looking around, my producer says to look around, I'm looking in one specific place. <laughs> okay. Uh, do, uh, do the objects appear closer in real life? Like. <laughs> Dude! Dude! I told you I'd dive in on this. Oh my. Okay, okay. She, uh, don't go, don't go. Wait, wait, don't go. Come, don't go, don't. No, no! Okay, what is on? What am I doing down there? That is not me. Happy birthday, birthday boy. <laughs> my birthday's April 2nd, it's today. This is Jacqueline, your birthday cake. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> Hi, Jacqueline. I brought her just for you. Oh, this is now good. No, we've always wanted a threesome for each other because you would like you to. We're going to finally get it on all three of um, us. Right? Yeah. Let's oh, okay. give him a little preview. I'm is that it? No, keep going, keep going. We're okay, experience 360 on, uh, I changed okay. pants. <laughs> I'm looking for you. Okay. Uh, maybe, you know, I scared you off. <laughs> you did not scare me off. After I told you what was in my clutch, and that was almost a bad What do you, can you tell me what's in her clutch? <laughs> do I have to watch this? Oh, you're going to see it, you're going to see it. Okay, so, uh, she's touching in that general area again. Yeah. 
Just a little bit. Though. What what is down there? Is that like gold or something? And uh, let's not forget this. No, I do not They're use ready. that. I don't even know what that is. Is that like a beaker from a science lab? So I guess you could say okay. I kind of planned this. You know what? I'm gonna make eye contact with you because I respect I you, you as like a woman stress. and an individual. And I have something even cuter. On Just the me. eyes. Okay. She said she has something see? cute on. I'm like warm and I just, oh wait, oh goodness. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> wait, it's over? Yep, one more. Two oh, more. there's one more? Yeah, one more. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. Uh oh. Um, hey, do you like how I'm taking notes here? <laughs> what am I writing about? This new exercise ball for us. Okay. She told me that it's good for my core. I'm just gonna pay attention. What is she doing? No! Oh my goodness! Like I'm a booty guy too. This this is but oh there we go. I had to push it in to get it more in focus, which I appreciate. I, I have an exercise ball like that at home. Come on, tell me you don't want to work out with me right now. <laughs> Do that again. Somebody's distracted. My like my my face is like twitching under this this thing. You can't there see. There you it. go. You're all set. Am I am I good? You're good. I think we we, we can leave you alone. Oh my god. Like. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 is immersive. What do you guys think about that? Watching the audience, everyone, all the guys are like putting their crossing their legs and putting their hands over their laps. <laughs> it's very mm -hmm. awkward, guys. So um, as this content is coming out, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, now, can you go back to watching it just in a little tiny box anymore? Um, no. I, that I. I I really like. I can't talk right now. Like this is. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So um, I also wanted to know, though, you were talking about how you have also measured the kind of devices because yeah. I'm not going to hold like uh -huh. a cardboard, yeah. you know, Google cardboard phone. Exactly. I want a hands-free experience. If you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Now, certainly, the Oculus has uh, you know taken the lead in the beginning. Uh, cardboard's doing well. The Samsung Gear, Gear VR is is in the lead, but it's all very neck and neck. We're really uh, waiting for Sony. Uh, and to take a look at the, uh, um, the, the PlayStation VR, uh, there's such a parallel between gaming and the adult industry, the demographics the same. Look, people are not gonna buy one of these devices just for adults. They're gonna buy it for gaming and adults just gonna be the icing on the cake. I'm like honestly trying to listen to you, but like <laughs> my, my, if they had biometric sensors on my body, I don't know what they would be telling well, we you right now. We have those too. All right, um, you know what? I just wanna say thank you so much, no problem. Ian. Thanks, um, Brian. Also though, I, I love my uh, free samples at Costco. I love a good deal. And yeah. what is Vegas without well, a deal? You guys of, wanted to kind of offer something to no, our fans Of course, no. We have a special deal for uh, <laughs> CES attendees. If you go to NaughtyAmericaCES.com, you can uh, access this content for $5. <laughs> What's the regular price? Regular price is $24.95. That's a deal. That is a deal. All right. All right. Ian, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Really you know, we're having it. fun with this. The experience is really unlike anything else. So. After we take this break, Jeff Bacalar will be here to see the latest brew maker from Pico. And then later, we're going to take a look at a 360 camera that you literally throw. None of that's going to top what I just saw. So stay tuned, see that nation. Peace out. <laughs> wow.
¿Cómo están? Los saluda Vanessa Jandoreana de Cine en Español y hoy me encuentro en el kiosco de cine desde CES 2016 con uno, un producto que probablemente ya han visto. Son estas gafas de realidad virtual, las Oculus. Y bueno, mucha gente los va a utilizar para videojuegos. Van a salir ya a la venta este año, pero seamos honestos, la mayoría de las personas lo va a utilizar para ver el contenido que yo estoy a punto de ver ahorita pornografía. Me voy a disculpar con mis padres y con Diosito por lo que voy a hacer ahorita, pero es mi deber como reportera explicarles a ustedes lo que estoy a punto de ver. Van a disculpar mi reacción porque jamás he hecho esto. Y ahí vamos. Este es el contenido de Naughty America. Y no veo, tengo que ponerme... Ahí están. <ríe> Ay Dios, ahí vamos. Y este es un servicio de pornografía que pagas una mensualidad para ver este contenido. ¡Ay, Dios! ¡Ahí vamos! ¡Ah! O sea, soy un hombre. Yo esto no, esto no lo quiero estar viendo. Eh, me siento como que estoy en un cuarto. Sí se ve como que es una pantalla, pero... ¡Ay! ¡No, no, no! ¡No se acerque! ¡No se acerque! ¡Ay! Nunca he tenido un abdomen tan plano, les cuento, pero tampoco... Eh, bueno... No, <risa> me estoy sonrojando demasiado. Yo creo que ya se pueden imaginar el resto. Eh, se ve bastante real, no sé ni qué decir. Me despeiné, hasta me despeiné. Creo que a muchos hombres les va a gustar. Yo creo que como mujer todavía necesitamos otro tipo de contenido. Y como les dije, este contenido era de Naughty America. Eh, están, tienen una promoción ahorita en CES. Que si vas a la página web de ellos, eh, la mensualidad por el primer mes es de 5 dólares. No les estoy diciendo que vayan, pero pues dándoles la información nada más. Yo si no, la mensualidad de 25 dólares al mes. Para más información de realidad virtual y no de pornografía, vayan a Cine en Español, cine.com diagonal S. Hasta la próxima.
Hey, we're back. You're watching CNET's live coverage of CES 2016. I'm Jeff Bacalar. With me is Dr. Bill Mitchell, the CEO of Pico Brew. He's here to show us the new Pico, just the Pico, home brewing solution, smaller, faster, easier. Thanks for coming back. All this, of those. This is how you follow up virtual porn. Oh, yeah. You follow it up <laughs> with, D, with DIY uh, beer making. So tell us about the Pico. Yeah, so this is finally getting to the big dream of get, putting uh, the ability to make your own great craft beer in everyone's hands. Last year we talked about and we tasted some of the beer produced by our Zymatic machine. That machine is used by high-end home brewers and craft brewers around the world now. But this Pico is all about making this process really simple. So we've worked with over 100 craft breweries and they're producing their best recipes in the form of these Pico packs, these containers right here that are actually food grade pulp. They contain uh, all the grains, all the hops that they use in their commercial production. Uh, this machine will use their recipe profiles, their exact process, 
and produce uh, five liters, uh, which goes in one of these little mini kegs. Fill up a mini keg, yep. right on. Fill a mini keg. You can have it on your refrigerator shelf. All you have to do is uh, load up this compartment with your Pico Pack, load this with water, uh, and hit go. It takes about two hours to brew. And the best thing of all is you can brew these great beers that you can only get at a craft brewery, right. but you can also customize it. Which is amazing. You were saying you could sort of like adjust a little uh, some of the variables about the actual brew. So tell us what kind of control you can have over over a batch. Yeah, that's one of the cool things. I mean, we we believe everyone you know has that beer that you've tasted when you you made a trip to San Francisco. You went right. to Twenty First Amendment, had some of their great beer. Then you go back to Seattle. You can't get that beer anymore. Right. Um, but one step beyond is I can get that beer. I can share it with people. I can say, look at this great beer I just tasted. And then if you wanted to drink their IPA all day long, it might be a 7% 7, 7 alcohol IPA. You Get can a little actually, bit of trouble. Yeah, you can, you can turn it into a 4% session beer. <laughs> right. Or you can jack it up to a 9% no, double. Uh, nine's going to, yeah. that'll knock you over a little bit. But you bit. can make your beer. Right. And you can stand on the shoulders of giants, the guys <laughs> that actually build the best beers in the world. And uh, you can do it in, in your own home. So uh, you kind of went through the, the process a little bit. So it's two hours. A to B, you're all set. I mean, this is a pretty significant uh, improvement over what we saw with last year's machine. What kind of uh, research and development has gone into that? What, this sounds like almost kind of like a miracle year over year. What's that about? Oh yeah, it's it's been a it's been about an 18 month engineering process to build something that's half the size. Right. Right now we have a show special. This is 5.99. Our flagship original product was two thousand um, dollars. So you know, substantial price reduction, cost reduction and using these Pico Packs, so developing this food grade, pulp container, 100% food uh, biodegradable, so you can actually, you finish, you dump this in your food waste, you're done. Um, major, major strides in heating solutions, so this uses a steam injection heat. Oh, wow. uh, we've worked with Flextronics on a custom fluid path and fluid distribution manifold, so we've just got a bunch of advances that we were able to get done in 18 months. We're gonna ship it starting in April, um, we just had a super successful Kickstarter, uh, raised 1.4 million in pre-orders. Right on. Um, and you can taste the beer right here. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to. All okay. right, so what do we got, we have, are these three different kinds right here? What well, I, I, got, I got two for you and one for me. How oh, about that? what are you trying I to know. do to me right I'm now? I'm that kind of sharing guy. All right, so let's try the one we both have. What, what is this? This is a Mosaic IPA. Okay. It's made by a little brewery right down the street from us called Lucky Envelope. All um, right. They've only been open for less than a year. Uh, it's a very clear IPA. It uses one of my favorite hops, Mosaic. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Let's see what happens here. See if you can follow up porn with this. Yeah, right. <laughs> I th or I think this is, I think porn, yeah. You, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So if you like Mosaic, this is, uh, this is a great beer. So the thing that's Delicious. really gratifying, too, is not only can we bring, you know, fresh craft beer the way it was designed by the brewery to be tasted, you know, exactly their flavor profiles. It's not stale, it's not in bottles or cans, but also the craft brewery gets a commission on every sale. So okay. a new brewery like Lucky Envelope gets distribution worldwide from this. So um, that's great, I mean, because normally, you know, you really have a, a, a very closed sort of regional distribution situation. You're, you know, this is almost in a way kind of turning beer into uh, being able to like travel over the internet in a weird way, because you have that access where you'd have to ship uh, shipping costs kind of over the moon when you talk about weight and stuff like that, but when it's in this sort of situation, you're dealing with a lot more practical. That's exactly yeah. right. It turns out, amazingly enough, it's much easier to ship non-alcoholic beverages. Yeah. <laughs> Less of a holdup. Yeah. yeah, so you ship pulp packages of grain and hops. We can ship them worldwide. And it uh, gives you the opportunity, if you're in Taipei and you've always wanted to have that beer that's from Seattle, Lucky Envelope maybe, right. you can order it, you there can you brew go. it, and it tastes just like it's supposed to taste from the brewery. And the brewery, you know, you're helping out the little guy. We're right. turning this into a beer meritocracy. Right, absolutely. So, you know, you don't have to have the best Super Bowl commercial to have the most drinkers. Just you know? word of mouth. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, what's, and what is the subtle This one, one is a Pilsner. This is a okay. Pico Pils. It's one of our recipes. So we also have in-house brewers. We have uh, Annie Johnson is our head brewer. She was the home brewer of the year in 2013, okay. AHA home brewer of the year. So she's actually done a number of recipes. And this uh, is hers. This is hers. All right, let's see. And uh, she likes lighter beers. She likes, the, she calls them lawnmower well, that, beers. This goes down way too yeah. easily. 
Yeah, we figured, we figured you might need something light. You got some hours ahead of you. Yeah, here. I got to pace myself. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we also Delicious. do gluten-free beers. We can do beers with all sorts of interesting additions. Um, the sky's the limit, and you get to do it without knowing anything about brewing. That's Which the is the best part. Two hours, A to B, you're all set. So that's the brewing process. And then you do ferment, but right. we've made advances on the fermentation as well. So you ferment in one of these kegs. Um, Typical fermentation for even a commercial brewery is going to take you about seven days, depends okay. on the beer. Sure. Uh, with our fast fermentation, we can ferment in as little as two days. How's that accelerated? How, how does that work? So again, we kind of think of this as modern as beer, so okay. we're really focused on taking the best of classic beer production and beer technology and trying to sort of limit the stuff that's really kind of ancillary and focus on the key chemical reactions. So what you're really after here is is fast action with the yeast, a very fast fermentation, so you can raise the temperature, right. but then you tend to get off flavors and phenols and things like that. So we actually do it under pressure. We have a pressure device here, allows you to raise the temperature of the fermentation. Fermentation completes much more quickly, it's a very active fermentation, and you don't have any off flavors. Very cool, you're using your powers for good, doctor. Appreciate that. <laughs> Technology <laughs> beer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, this is going, this is gonna start at what price? So $5.99 show special. Okay. It'll be $6.99 after the show. It includes the Pico, uh, these two kegs, so a brewing keg and a drinking keg, and also your first Pico pack. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Doctor. My pleasure, Appreciate Doc. it. Thank you. That will be uh, all for now with the Pico, although I think you and I might have to test a few more brews in the back. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Ashley Esqueda will be here with a VR camera rig designed for you, so you can really make cool 360-degree photos. We'll see you soon. Stay here. CNET.com's live coverage of CS 2016.
Hi, everybody. We are back with CNET's live coverage here at CES 2016. VR and 360 are going to be huge this year. And joining us on the CNET stage is Jonas File. He is with Pinono, and he has a really cool consumer-based 360 camera. Uh, Jonas, welcome to the CNET stage. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so tell us a little bit, this is such an interesting looking product. I mean, you, you really, you see it and it's an, uh, it's it's kind of a crowd pleaser. People really yeah. want to know what it is and what it does. Yeah, yeah. if you walk through the, through the halls here, people stop you and ask you, yeah. <laughs> now this was originally a, a crowdfunding effort. This was on yes. Indiegogo. Yes. And how long ago was the Indiegogo campaign? Uh, two years now. Two years ago, okay, wow. And and in the, I remember seeing in the video, it was actually much larger. The prototype was pretty large. It looked yeah. like, almost like the size of a volleyball. Mm -hmm. It was about size. So now you've gotten it down and packed all that technology into a much more compact yeah. uh, kind of travel friendly yeah, shape. Much more portable. <laughs> and I think that's that actually lends itself very well to the photos that it takes. So Pinono is a 360 camera uh, and you actually use it by you can use it in a few different ways. We have it on a tripod right now. Yeah. Uh, you can use it on sort of a selfie stick. Yeah, uh, so down here you just uh, stick that in here. Yep. It has its very own selfie stick. Yep. So you <laughs> stick it and turn it and it has a button on the stick. Great. You press it and you have a picture of it. Fantastic. And then also you can actually, and this is everybody's favorite, toss it into the air and get a 360 yeah. degree picture, yeah, which is exactly. pretty great. So if you're outside, uh, you can do that. It's bright. Um, yeah. So uh, let's take a look at a couple of the photos sure. that you've taken with us. So we have this picture from Venice. Yeah. And it is pretty stunning. The quality of the picture, the resolution of the picture is it's really something. I mean, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. So you can you can zoom in. So let's go one way around, right? Um, so it's 360 degree in both directions. So one way around like this, and also like this. So you can see the sky here, and you can look down into the water. All the way to your feet. Yeah. See, so you took the picture. So it's on a stick. As you see, the stick is basically not visible. Um, mm -hmm. It's automatically removed, and the resolution is so high you can actually zoom in. People over here even though they're like a few feet away, right? Um, and you can, you can even see this seagull right here. Yeah, <laughs> seagull here, houses on the other side, and they're very far away. So that's what, what's really the unique feature about the Panono. We are a photography company, right? We focus on very high resolution panoramic photos. And because we focus on photo and not video, we have five times more resolution than the next camera there is, right? Which explains why the, the image quality is so high and, and really, I mean, this is stunning. It looks Thanks. gorgeous. Yeah. So uh, we have 108 megapixels. So we have 36 lenses here. Each has three megapixels. So it adds up to 108. And you really need all these pixels because when you look around, um, you're really only going to see a few camera modules or pixels of a few camera modules at a time, maybe two, maybe three, right? So we are five to seven megapixels on the screen, and that's like a normal viewing angle. Um, but we need every direction, right? You want to look in every direction, so we need that many pixels. You need that high definition yeah. at every single, in every single lens exactly, to be able to stitch exactly. together such a high resolution so image. So 108 sounds insane, but it's just what you need. Right, right. right. So can I, can I, I want to sure. see how heavy it is. is. This is actually surprisingly lightweight. I'm surprised at how uh, how light it is. Now, how long did it take to develop Pinono? I mean, oh, before, let's see, how long did it take you to get to the Indiegogo? And then, <laughs> obviously, it's been two years since then. So that was originally my master thesis project, right? Um, so that took like one and a half years, um, just me. And then we had I had this big prototype, big green thing. Um, and then we looked for funding and got a team together. And uh, that's a couple of years ago now, maybe three to four in total. Um, now we're a team of 20, so I don't really do much developing anymore. I'm just writing emails now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we are a big team now. Amazing, amazing members in the team who like work on all the software on various levels, on the ball, in the cloud. So we have really amazing stitching. So when you look around, you don't really see any seams, right? Yeah, it's pretty seamless. Yeah. Well, uh, we actually just FYI for everybody watching at home. We actually took a picture right before we started the segment. Uh, and it's already stitched together, which is really cool. So can we check that picture out? Let's take a look at uh, yeah. what we took on the stage here at CES right before we did. We started our interview, so I'm pretty excited to, to yeah. show you this. So what's, walk us through the process as you're opening this picture. What You take a picture with yeah. Pinono, and yeah, then it goes exactly. to your phone. Yeah, you take it with, with the Pinono, transfers to this app here. 
Um, I can show it right now. Let's look at the output first. Like this is, um, we took right before. It takes about eight minutes to switch. That's why we did it before. Mm -hmm. um, that's me. <laughs> 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 yeah, and you can really zoom in on all the details here. Go all around. Look and up. That is, that is definitely what exactly what our stage so looks like as I'm sitting looks, right, right here. Up there. That's what it looks like. Um, desk and everything, yeah. Um, yeah, so I can connect um, to the camera as well. Uh, let me check if I'm in the camera. There we go. So the, what, the camera creates Wi Fi. So okay. you just connect to that Wi Fi. Um, now I'm going back to the app. And down there, there's a little icon. Click, you go in the camera. So you see all the, all the images that are already in the camera. I see. And um, so you either um, you hit the button on the stick or you throw, or you can, of course, remotely trigger. So now we have it on the tripod. Could be in the hotel room, uh, in a flat you want to rent out or sell, right? You put it inside, you close the door, and then you are connected with the app. And you just hit the button like this. Camera beeps, right? And now I update here, and you have an instant preview. Like it's sub one second, you go in. Um, and yeah. So this you is have sort the of the pre stitching yeah, version yeah, yeah. of the picture so that we're seeing inside notice, the. Yeah, do you iPad. see the single images, right? 36 of them. That's it looks us. like a fever dream. There's <laughs> some, some, some cutoffs here. It looks, it looks <laughs> yeah, like yeah, a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of magic, right? That's what goes into our stitching algorithms in the cloud because it goes from the camera to the app and then into the cloud. Um, there, the magic happens, and this gets stitched together into the seamless images we saw before, right? Right. Um, and it's zero effort on our side. We really only have to select a cool picture, give it a title, and then you go and you share it on Twitter. So in a matter of 10 minutes, outside, right, you hit the button, and then on your phone, it's off to Twitter, off to Facebook, and Facebook is like a little, little embedded viewer. Right, you where you can actually around. move yeah, around yeah. with your mouse and everything. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit. Uh, we're going to wrap things up, but I want people to know, can you buy this right now? Yes. You, you can, can buy go it to now. Panono.com. Um, yeah, and, and buy it. And you will uh, have it in a few three weeks. Uh, so we are currently have a small backlog, but you will get it very soon. Excellent. Well, if you're, uh, if you're looking at taking a vacation, maybe it's something to consider taking with you, maybe uh, this summer. Okay, everybody out there might want one for, the, for their trip. Uh, well, so thank you so much for being here. I really yeah, appreciate it. Thank you for showing us Pinono. That's Pinono, everybody. We're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We are going to catch up on some of the really cool products we've seen on the show floor. Hi, you're looking at one of LG's new 2016 OLED TVs. This is the E6 series. This TV is the second most expensive OLED TV that LG has announced at 2016 CES. This set has the same picture quality as the other 2016 OLED TVs, which means we expect it to be the best picture quality on the market today. The new TVs include HDR compatibility with Dolby Vision, so you can watch Dolby Vision discs and stream Dolby Vision content with these TVs. That's separate from the Samsung HDR TVs, which do not support Dolby Vision. 
These sets also include all the benefits of OLED, which means perfect black levels, really nice bright picture. Uh, LG says they've increased the brightness a little bit this year. They've also increased the color gamut coverage, so these TVs should be able to approach more of the DCI spectrum as, than last year. Another differentiation from the less expensive OLEDs this year is this little speaker along the bottom here improves the audio quality. The difference between this and the G6, which is a little more expensive, is that all the connections are on the back of this TV, like a standard television. The G6 has a more modular design with this speaker on the bottom and all the connections there. You can fold it behind it for slicker wall mounting. That's a quick look at the E6 series. Again, no pricing. We're expecting first half availability a little bit earlier than LG's other OLEDs, but that's the information we have so far. At CES 2016, I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET. I'm on the floor at CES taking a look at the very first standalone smart home device from LG. We've seen them use ThinQ technology on their large appliances, but this guy stands on its own. It has a built-in Wi-Fi connected camera, it has environmental sensors, and it can act as a smart home hub. Better yet, you can have ADT monitor what's coming in here on a month-to-month -month fee without any contracts. So the camera's a five megapixel camera, it has digital zoom, 1080p, and supposedly it's gonna know the normal activity of you and your family, and it's gonna send you an alert if something's unusual. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna work, and I'm curious to find out, but it has a number of other security features as well. Like I said, environmental sensors, it knows your preferred temperature and humidity range, it's gonna send you a push alert if it falls outside of that. And then again, smart home hub, that might not sound glamorous, but because this thing talks Bluetooth and Zigbee and Z-Wave, all of those smart home peripherals that you might want communicating with the cloud can use this as a bridge to do that. That's pretty cool. LG developed this in partnership with ADT and it works with ADT's new Canopy smart home system. That's a month to month contract free system. You can add your own smart home devices to it and ADT will monitor them for you. So I'm glad to see LG getting into the DIY security game and better yet, bringing ADT with them so you can have that pro monitoring with your own DIY system. And if this thing can do smart detection as well and actually know your family's movement patterns and tell you if something's out of the ordinary, that could be really cool. With the LG Smart Security System at CES, I'm Andrew Gebhardt for CNN. I'm standing in front of the brewery. It's a $2,000 automatic beer brewing machine. All you do is load water into this side and or hook it up to a hose. You put your malts in here, you put your hops in here. Then the beer machine will automatically follow a recipe. It's connected to Wi-Fi so you can pick from a database, you can make your own, you can even select recipes from professional brewers. Then the machine will take that recipe, it'll take your malts and your hops, and it'll cycle the water through the different compartments all on its own based on the type of beer you want to make. So the brewery takes your beer all the way from water and malt and hops, takes it through the mash tun, through the boil, and then it'll cool your wort off for you before you add it to the separate keg with the yeast for the fermentation. But Brewery does give you all the parts you need and thorough instructions, so hopefully the whole thing will be nice and easy. I'm certainly looking forward to testing it. It's good. If you are someone like me who does not have a green thumb and needs a lot of help with gardening, we might have found the solution for you. I'm Megan Mullerton and we are here at CES 2016 looking at Opcom Link's Opcom Farm Cubes. These are stacked smart gardening solutions for the inside of your house, basically an indoor garden for you to grow vegetables and fruits and herbs and basically any sort of organic plant that you desire. So it actually is really, really cool. You have LEDs built in that adjust according to the stage of growth of the plant that you're growing. So if it's a young seedling, it might have more red LEDs, which are designed to be better for those types of plants. 
As it transitions into the harvest phase, it might move into white LEDs, which are better as it's maturing and then ready to eat. You can also track all of these stages on the related Android and iOS app, basically looking at humidity, indoor temperature, and it does automatically adjust the settings based on the specific type of plant you have. So if you have Boston lettuce, it'll optimize the settings automatically for you. But also if you want a more hands-on experience, you can actually manually adjust all that stuff too within the app. This is the premium unit. It's gonna sell for 4,000 bucks in the United States when it starts shipping in February. So hopefully we'll get hands-on of this at the CNET Smart Home. Hello, you're looking at one of the first Ultra HD Blu-ray players that's going to be available in the United States. This is Panasonic's DMP UB900 Ultra HD 4K Blu-ray is a new format that's just coming out this year that allows 4K TVs to watch the next generation of Blu-ray discs. So you can get 4K resolution, extra sharpness, you can get improved color with wide color gamut, and improved HDR compatibility, which improves the contrast and pop of the image. Of course, you're going to need compatible Blu-ray Ultra HD HDR discs to take advantage of all this, and of course, a television that can play it all back. But once you get all that, you should get the best picture quality available from 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. This also allows high-resolution audio playback, high quality audio parts, and of course 4K JPEG and video playback. So all told, one of the more capable uh, disc players that's going to be on the market. No pricing yet. Of course, with the prevalence of streaming from Netflix and Amazon, especially for 4K and HDR, the future of 4K Blu-ray is a little bit in question, but once it actually does launch this year, this will be one of the few units that will be able to play the first 4K Blu-ray discs. I'm David Katzmeyer from CNET at CES 2016. We've all heard of 3D printing and regular printing, but how about coffee printing? If you can't get by without your regular cup of joe in the morning, the Ripple Maker will print whatever you want onto your foam-based coffee. So all the barista needs to do is take a cappuccino or a latte, for instance, with foam on top, put it in the machine, select a design. There are lots of custom-based designs that you can make and upload through the app, or there is a giant library of images that you can dynamically pull down from the cloud. Select that image, the coffee cup will go up on the platform into the printing technology. It's actually real coffee that's being printed as the image. And then within 10 seconds, you get a printed coffee for your drinking pleasure. It is $999 and there is a monthly access plan. So it is very much more based towards baristas and cafes rather than consumers. Tastes like CNET. <laughs> I've been coming to CES for a long time, and behind me is the largest TV I've ever seen, 170 inches. The trick, this TV isn't one panel, but it's a bunch of different modular panels that Samsung has put together in a seamless way. So they won't tell me how many of those panels they are, what resolution it is. The only thing they'll say is it's an SUHD TV. This is a concept piece, of course. But as you can see, when you put together a whole bunch of little display panels, you can achieve a truly monumental picture. If you look really closely, I walked right up to the screen, I could see little divisions between it. But once you step back to any distance that you can appreciate this size, you're not going to notice the seams between the TVs. This demonstration includes these, these modular little panels moving around, acting cool, showing a screen size pretty much as large as you want to get. So again, Samsung says is the future of television modular TV, getting it as big as you can from these tiny little blocks, not tiny, but you know, small blocks compared to the TV behind me. That's a quick look at Samsung's 170 inch SUHD modular television, transformative television, they say. I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET at CES 2016. Hi, you're looking at Sharp's Best TV at CES 2016. This is a 65-inch curved quantum dot display. Really an excellent selection of picture quality enhancements. It also has full array local dimming backlight. This TV is the 9000U. It's going to be coming out in the second half of this year for $3,000. There's also going to be a 70-inch version of this, flat, again with the full array local dimming and all the fixings, for $3,200, same time frame. So Sharp has really pulled out the stops here. The quantum dot display allows really wide color gamut, so it's going to be competing with the highest-end TVs out there from LG and Samsung. But again, it's the Sharp brand. They're calling their quantum dot display Spectros. The TV is curved, so it's not my favorite industrial design, but you can actually get the flat version at 70 inches a little bit later in the year. 
some of the nitty gritty, this TV hits 1,000 nits of brightness, which is equal to all the brightness of any of the other TVs shipping this year. It's also UHD Alliance certified, so it's going to hit the highest quality standards of HDR playback. The set will also be compatible with HDR sources from 4K Blu-ray. The TV is also compatible with Amazon streaming HDR service available now. Unlike past Sharp TVs, this one doesn't have Android TV, but it has Sharp's proprietary homebrew system for smart TV, which includes all the apps that you'd expect. That's a quick look at Sharp's N9000U flagship television at CES 2016. I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET. Hey everyone, it's Emmy Hall with CNET here at CES in 2016, and check it out. I have got the Cycleboard Street Surfer. Now, this is really kind of a genre-defining scooter. It's not really a scooter, it's not really a skateboard, it's something in between. I've got two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back, and it's rear-wheel drive electric. Speeds of up to 20 miles an hour, five different modes. I can have a customizable deck, and I've got a bike lock that integrates into the rear fender, so I don't have to worry about where I'm going to carry my bike lock. All right, so I'm going to try to ride this puppy. So I'm going to turn it on. We've got five speeds. Here I'm in uh, speed one, so that's probably a good thing. Uh, my brake is here, and then this right here is a cell phone mount that, so I can have my cell phone and have GPS and stuff like that. All right, so uh, I was going to try to drive this thing. Let's see what happens. Oh my gosh. So all I need to do is kind of lean. Oh my gosh, this is so much fun. I can totally carve up. Woo! Whoa, this is rad. Oh my gosh. This is amazingly, amazingly fun. I can totally see myself commuting on this. Now, if you want a little bit more information, you can go to cycleboard.com where you can enter to win one of these babies. And there is a Kickstarter that is going to start in February. So be sure to check it out. That's it for today. I'm Emmy Hall with CNET here at CES in 2016. I'm here with the X1. This is TCL's highest end television shipped in the United States in 2016. Price is as yet undisclosed, but this TV hits all the high-end TV check boxes. First and foremost, it's compatible with the Dolby Vision HDR spec. That means it can play back Dolby Vision movies and TV shows coming later in the year. One of the few televisions that allows that to do that. Of course, since it's Dolby Vision compatible, that means it's also an HDR TV. It can hit 1,000 nits of peak brightness, among the brightest we've seen at CES. TCL is also using quantum dot technology to expand the color gamut. It says it can hit 100% of the DCI color space. The set is also pretty slick for design. Around back, it's got these magnetic panels. They can detach, so you can hide the cables really nicely. TCL is also using these slick, visible speakers along the bottom here to differentiate it from the other curved TVs on the market. So far, it's only available in a 65-inch size, and again, we don't have any pricing. We think it's going to be relatively high, given the Dolby Vision certification. That's a quick look at TCL's X1 series. I'm David Katzmeyer for CNET at CES 2016. I'm here at CES taking a look at a baby monitor with non-contact video respiration detection. If you're still there, I'll tell you what that means. This baby monitor is going to watch your child and let you know if your child stops breathing. They won't tell me how exactly it works, but you set this monitor up in the room with your child, and then via the app, it's gonna track breathing patterns. Not only are you gonna get an alert if your child stops breathing, but you'll get to see over time when your child's breathing heavily, when your child is taking shallower breaths, so you can learn a little bit more about those sleep patterns. It's got night vision, motion detection, even without the breath monitoring, it would stand as a pretty good connected camera. With that feature, this thing could really add to your peace of mind. So we don't have any pricing information yet. It's due out later this year, and First Alert's actually seeking HomeKit compatibility for this, so it'll be able to interact with your larger Apple smart home. So yeah, we're looking forward to seeing if the non-contact video respiration on the One Link by First Alert baby monitor actually works.
Welcome back to the CNET Live stage here at CES 2016. I'm Jeff Aguilar. And joining me now is Mustafa Sheikh from Boombotics and a collaboration between Globe Skateboards and combining a deck with a wireless Bluetooth speaker. Thanks for yeah, being here, man. man. Thanks tell, for having us here. Tell us what you guys did. You guys are a, a speaker manufacturer. You yep. teamed up with Globe Skateboards to bring us this amazing contraption. Yeah, so Boombotics, we make Bluetooth speakers. That's our bread and butter. We are based out in San Francisco. Been doing it for a while. That's our base station. And basically, Chet Thomas, who's a legendary skateboard, he's an early investor in Boombotics and is the head of marketing at Globe. Okay. So him and Leaf, our founder, kind of came with the idea of like, let's do a collaborative project. No one has put a speaker into a skateboard. And um, you know, the idea worked out. It actually took like a year to go through just because like, if it's going to be on a skateboard, it has to be durable, Absolutely. has to be water resistant. And so the product really had to hit a high standard. And it's kind of amazing, you know, this isn't like, We've seen stuff where it's sort of baked in, but this is a really elegant sort of implementation of the technology. I mean, this is like specifically carved for this product to fit, fit in there elegantly. Yeah. So how, like, how does it work? So this is something you just sort of bind to your phone? Yeah, so I mean, it connects to your phone just like a normal Bluetooth speaker. Um, and you can see the, the speakers are flush with the board right here. And what's really cool about it when you're riding it and the signs of bass, the reason why like you'll be at home in your room by yourself and you're crank up your bass is because like it. the vibration of the bass is what gives us like that pleasure that like I'm having a good time right now. Right, right. And when you're riding it, which I think uh, Chris, who's our head of product, yeah, is gonna he's gonna ride it real soon. Okay. Just that vibration on your feet just gives that awesome feeling to you. All right, Chris, show us a little demo here. Let's uh, let's play that. He's gonna use his Apple Watch to start the music. And Chris, if you fall, it's gonna like help our ratings here. Yeah. Like totally. it'll go viral. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Oh, right on. So that's significantly less. So, so the bass is sort of like popping up through the, the deck of the board. And, and you're saying like you kind of like feel, because uh, I wonder like how that feels, you know, as opposed to riding down the street. Like is it something that is just sort of like a complement to the whole experience? Like mm -hmm. how would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, it depends on like how loud the environment is. Yeah. So if you're riding down San Francisco, like on Hay Street where I am, um, one, you're going to hear the music. So that's going to be sure. an accompaniment to your ride. But then, like, yeah, your feet do vibrate. Right and on. so really, like, you know, to me personally, the vibration of my feet is actually, like, the better part of it than just the music. Right, right. Just because having that just come through just makes your ride that much more fun. Excellent. And, yeah, this is the first collaboration we've done outside of just a traditional speaker. And, you know, I think probably by next year, we're working with a few other companies on integrating our speaker products into what they already have going on. Right. Because this is, like, already a skateboard that you can buy on Globe's website without the speaker, and so we just put the speaker in and made that experience that much better. So you, so you said you had an initial production run of these that sold out. Yep. Uh, how, are we expecting more models? I know you guys have the yeah. Blazer and the Pinner right now. Mm -hmm. Can we expect more? Yeah, so I actually just learned about this today. Oh, all right. So we got the, <laughs> the, we have a third model coming out that's actually in the middle of the Blazer. This is the Blazer, and the Pinner is a traditional longboard. And then there's a model in between that size that will be out around March. Okay. So we should have three models, and March is going to be a full production run. Um, but yeah, it was a great holiday gift. It sold out super fast, and um, we're really excited about doing the full launch in March. So we talked about this a little before we, we came on stage. You know, the first thing I'm thinking of is like, oh, all right, there's a Bluetooth speaker on the bottom of this deck. Yeah. I'm not grinding anything. <laughs> but apparently, it's, it's been able to survive some wear and tear of, of like skate parts and whatnot, right? Yeah, so the first prototype actually didn't come to the Boombox office. It okay. went to Globe's office down in LA. And then they sent it up, and basically, like, this plate right here, we're just all cut up. Sure. And yeah. we're like, damn, they were doing some grind testing right. on that, and they put it through a beating. And they wax it up or anything, or it was just like, no, oh, this is what we're just... No, they just beat it up. I it. mean, it's like, what is a traditional, or not traditional, what is the average consumer going to do, right? Right. They're going to take it out, and sure. they're just going to thrash it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we don't encourage people to grind on it, because eventually you'll probably break through. Sure. But we test it enough so that it is durable enough that it will take some nicks and scratches and still just keep pumping music out. Right on. Well, this is awesome. How much uh, are these going are these going for? So the Blazer is two forty nine ninety five, and the Pinner is two ninety nine ninety five. Okay, and how how about battery? What are we looking at? So battery full charge, um, it will give you about six hours of play. Excellent. So I mean, you're probably not riding for six hours. Like no. you're going to be exhausted. Yeah. Like especially in San Francisco. For sure. I mean, I got to walk. I had to walk most of those hills. <laughs> I'm not going down them. Right. Um, but yeah, it will take you for the entire day. 
Right on. Well, thanks so much for showing us yeah, the boards there. We really appreciate it. Uh, next up, a very cool 3D printer that, get this, it prints circuit boards. Stay with us. Our coverage continues.
Would you buy a pair of wireless Bluetooth earbuds if they were $300? What if they came with a case that stores and charges them and they sound great? Well, at CES 2016, I got a chance to check out the tiny but pricey Canela and Erin Bluetooth earbuds to see what they're all about. I know what you're thinking, they must be easy to lose. Well, in order to prevent that, each comes with a small case that doubles as a portable charger. So when you're not using them and pop them into the case, they automatically charge. The Erin earbuds last about two and a half hours on a full battery, whereas the Canela, which are slightly bigger, last four to six. Both come with foam buds that comfortably conform to your ear and feel secure when you're wearing them. They feel similar to a normal set of earplugs you'd wear at a concert, and I found them comfortable to wear. The ear and dons a simple aesthetic that I gravitate more towards. However, spec-wise, the Kanoa seems like a more powerful performer. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to try those out, but I was able to listen to the ear ends, and I was very impressed. For such little things, they had an impressive amount of bass. The earrings suggested price is $250, but right now it's currently only available at bestbuy.com for $300. The Kanoa is expected to ship in April and will hit stores sometime in quarter three or quarter four. This is the HydroView, the latest in a long line of water-resistant smartphones from Kyocera. It's got all of the expected budget smartphone fixings. It runs Android Lollipop, and has 8 gigs of storage, but can support up to 64 gigs if you pop in a micro SD card. There's a 5 inch screen, but it has a really low resolution, 960 by 540 pixels. But you're getting that for just 80 bucks when the phone launches on January 8th on Cricut Wireless. We're here for the ruggedness. The HydroView is certified for IP57. That means it can sit in up to a meter of water, about 3 feet, for up to 30 minutes. And you can even use the screen when it's wet. We've seen this wet touchscreen operation on a few Kyocera phones, and it works fairly well. So you aren't exactly going to be able to take this phone swimming. But if you ski or fish or just hang out in the rain a lot for some reason, the HydroView will keep up with you for cheap. Head to CNET to find out more info on the HydroView and be sure to check back for all of our CES coverage. If you think your pet might need a little bit of a makeover, you might want to check out Wonder Wolf. This is a smart, Bluetooth-enabled bow tie for your dog, and it also has a lot of smart functionality. It can actually track your pet's steps, and the more it moves based on the accelerometer's motion, the more activity it will show on the related Android and iOS app. So if your pet is resting, you can see on the app that it's resting. If it's moving more rapidly, you'll see that it's maybe running and playing, and over time, you can actually see if it's getting the amount of steps it needs in a day. So not only would you have a happy pet because it's getting a lot of exercise, you'll have a fashionable pet because it has one of these adorable little bow ties. Fitness trackers are not entirely new in the pet space, but this type of little bow tie device is definitely the cutest one I've ever seen. And this company is also unveiling something else new here at CES, and it's called Wonder Meow. It's a similar device available for cats that's coming out in the fall. It also has Bluetooth. You'll also be able to track your cat's activity level. But in addition, you'll be able to see what sort of adventures they get up to throughout the day. This has been the Wonder Wolf bow tie and the Wonder Meow bow tie. Thanks for watching. I'm Megan Mullerton for CNET. Have you ever wanted your own personal robot? Well, if you've got about $1,300 and can wait until the March time frame, then you might be able to buy the Alpha 2 from UV Tech. The Alpha 2 originally launched as an Indiegogo campaign in November. These robots, which are currently in red and blue colors, but will be coming in more colors soon, are about a foot and a half tall, so they're pretty small, but they can do a lot of things. There are two different ways you can interact with the Alpha 2. You can speak to it, or you can also manually control it with an app for Android or iOS. They can also control smart home appliances like your lighting system and even set alarms for you. The Alpha 2 can recognize your face and take photos and with 20 moving joints, it can even practice yoga with you. Right now, battery life is on the short side. It should run an hour on each plug, but you can use it while it is plugged into the wall. UbiTech's second robot is called the Jimu, which means building blocks in Chinese. It's an educational toy that is especially developed for kids to teach them spatial perception. So there are two different kits you can get, one for ages eight and up and one for ages 14 and up. You build it yourself and there are color-coded parts to help you put it together. 
just like the other robot, this one, you can operate with iOS or Android on an app. The basic kit will cost $100 and the more advanced kit will cost about $200. It'll show up sometime in late January or February. This is the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S, a new Windows 10 2-in-1 we found at CES this year. It's an exceptionally thin tablet, about as thin as an iPad Air, except it runs full Windows and docks with this keyboard, kind of like a Microsoft Surface. I really like the way it just snaps into this magnetic hinge, and there's a couple different positions there you can dock it at if you want to do some productivity on the go. I also really like the AMOLED screen on this laptop, a super gorgeous AMOLED screen like the one you'd find on a Samsung Galaxy smartphone, now here on a portable PC. There's also a really neat feature called Galaxy Continuum. If you've got a Galaxy smartphone, you can just tap it right here against the keyboard dock. The NFC will activate, and it'll unlock the screen for you, let you hop right into Windows without typing your password, and show you text messages from your phone that can pop up right in the corner of your computer. This is the Samsung Galaxy Tab Pro S, and we're expecting to see it in the first quarter of the year. Hello, this is Samsung's KS9500. It's 2016 SUHD TV. Not the very best of the SUHD TVs in Samsung's lineup, but the second best. The 9500 has plenty of high-end features still. It has an edge-lit local dimming display, not quite as good as the full array local dimming display found on one step-up model, but otherwise this thing has all the bells and whistles. It's got a new quantum dot, a display that will produce improved color according to Samsung. It also has a new screen that's designed for anti-reflective environments, so if you have a bright room, it should really improve uh, the reflections on the screen, make them a lot less visible, a lot less distracting. Uh, another improvement Samsung has made to this TV is its smart hub technology. The TV is now a little bit easier to get connected, a little bit more integrated in terms of all the uh, apps and other TV uh, sources you can get on here. The TVs, all Samsung TVs this year, also are integrated with the Internet of Things, so you can actually go on here and control your smart things devices to turn on lights, set up environments, and things like that. Of course, the real story here for this particular television, the KS9500, is the picture quality. It does, Samsung says, improves the picture quality quite a bit. It's certified as one of the very best HDR televisions out there. It does not support Dolby Vision, however. It does support the open HDR10 uh, HDR spec. So all things considered, we expect this to be one of the higher performing televisions in 2016. That's a quick look at Samsung's KS9500. I'm David Katzmeyer from CES 2016.
back, everybody, to the CNET stage at CES. I'm Ashley Escapa. I am really, really excited about this next segment. Joining me now is Simon Freed with Nano Dimension, who is here to talk about the Dragonfly 2020 3D printer. This is a little bit different than your standard 3D printer. This prints working circuit boards. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a completely new type of uh, 3D printing where we're printing plastics and metals at the same time to create uh, what you can see here. And it's a, a fully functional circuit board. Yeah, we weren't, we actually, so here's the, here's the device right here. You can see it's pretty amazing that we're able to 3D print this, metal and plastic together. Mm -hmm. And also, the device itself is over at your booth at TechWest. It's, yeah. it's a little too big. We tried to get it in the truck, but it's, it's just not happy to move. You know, yeah, it's a, little a, it's too a good delicate. meter. Uh, but we do have a video, so tell us a little bit about the process as we, uh, as sure. we check out this, this great bit of B-roll. Okay, so what you can see on, on the screen is the, the printer screen, the kinds of definition that we can get, very high resolution printing. And it's an inkjet printer, which means that we're printing with tiny, tiny drops of the two materials which at the end of the process give you a fully functional circuit board. And as far as we know, this really is a revolutionary uh, step in 3D printing, which allows you to rapidly prototype the kinds of circuits that you'll find in IoT uh, products, wearable products, but even you know, bigger multi-layer, 20-layer, 24-layer PCBs, rigid, flexible, pretty much allows you to turbocharge product development. Product development. So uh, one of the things that maybe not a lot of people know at home is when you work with circuit boards, you either have to work with a stock circuit board and modify it yep. if you'd like to make a prototype, or you have to actually send away your prototype to be made and created, and then you get it back, and it takes quite a bit of time. Absolutely. So a product like the Dragonfly 2020 is really, as you said, it's really revolutionary for companies that are looking to as you again said, turbocharge that R&D process mm -hmm. and really get those prototypes out and working to see, okay, how does this work? What do we need to fix? Let's make another one tomorrow. Exactly. And I mean, so a lot of this stuff has been happening in China. So you'll design it in California or Detroit and you it ship out. it over to somebody in Taiwan who's going to be making this thing for you. And it could take weeks. You could take, you know, sit at home twiddling your thumbs for weeks. Right, and, and in that time, nothing's getting done. So not the right stuff. with this, you're able to not set it and forget it. Uh, take a, take yeah. a phrase from good old uh, as seen on TV uh, content. But my question is, how long does it take to actually print something of that size? What, what Some, something of this size, I guess, what is it? It's, uh, I'll take a second to print it. It's three, you know, three by two inches, maybe a bit smaller. This is something that'll take a, a few hours uh, to print. And to order this from some outside supplier, even in the States, if you're doing it in you know, a high-speed delivery, this is going to take you a couple of days, three days. But if you want something bigger, if you want something more complex, you really will be looking at 10 days, two weeks, which we could print overnight. Right, so in terms of, let's say personal computing, mm -hmm. um, I know obviously this is designed more for corporations, for companies, yeah. uh, but there are companies that make motherboards, for example, uh, that would be able to rapid prototype their new products coming out. How do you think that'll affect the consumer end of things? Do you think products will be less expensive? Do you think we'll see more updates quicker, uh, updated technology right. quicker? Are those the types of things you're really hoping to see come out of companies using Dragonfly? Well, what you see, I think, is in 3D printing as a whole, you see more innovation, you see more cycles of innovation, you see more products coming to market, better products, because they've been tested more often. They've dared maybe to try something that you, know, you wouldn't otherwise try. If you have to wait two weeks to find out if this is good, you're not going to take any risks. But if you can find out That's tomorrow, you might push the envelope a bit. Try that thing that you're not totally sure about, but might actually work up delivering uh, an even better product than you imagined. Cool, and so uh, as you're walking around the show here at CES, I'm curious, uh, what other types of 3D printers have you seen that maybe have been uh, really interesting to you? I know there's even food 3D printers. Sure. I mean, things that are a little different than what you do, but are there any types of 3D printers that you've seen going, and you said, wow, that's, that's something, that's really interesting? Well, I'm, I'm a bit spoiled because I, you know, I live in the heart of this technology. So I, I go around looking at you know, how are they doing this deposition, what kind of technology, what kind of materials, and we look at it as, you know, it's a way of getting materials into a certain location. And so we need very special materials for our electronics application. Everybody needs different materials to achieve what they're doing. So sometimes it's about color. 
Sometimes it's about strength. Sometimes it's about flexibility. So right. you know, the, the opportunities are, are many, and there's so many companies here. I was walking around the 3D show uh, area, and you know, everybody's doing something amazing. You've got companies like Emcore doing huge, huge amounts of color. You've got others doing uh, printing carbon fiber for, for really strong items. Right, you mobile know, the, 3D printing, yeah. mobile pens for art and different types of things like that. I mean, it's really, it's interesting in Tech West. Uh, if if you guys haven't seen Tech West, you really have to stop by there. I mean, it's really incredible. There's so many yeah. interesting companies doing interesting things that you know are going to ripple through the industry, Absolutely. no matter whether you interact with them directly or not. And one of the things I love about 3D printing is, as you mentioned, it's there are so many different companies serving a very particular need mm. in that industry, or people who need 3D printing for either rapid prototyping, mm. creating art. There are so many different uses for 3D printing that's really incredible that somebody could put this together, uh, and I'll, I'll end this with sort of a question about right. me getting one maybe someday, mm -hmm. a, a consumer version of this. Uh, putting together a, a rapid prototyped circuit board, printing it out in a few hours, something small, being able to put it into something they've been working on that they want to add to the Internet of Things, sure. and then uh, having it all set up and together and testing it out later that day. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thing that not only will benefit corporations, but I think also will benefit tinkerers, people who really love coding, people love Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. uh, what are if any, what are your plans for a consumer version of the Dragonfly product, if you can tell us? Sure, no, I mean, at present, we, we don't have plans for a consumer product. We'd love to have one slightly down the road, but the technology now requires such expensive components to make the system, and even to make the materials, that it's probably out of reach for, for the home user. But I think you know, startups could have access to this, or if you're a home tinkerer, you could get maybe a local service center, get Kinko's, to install one of these, and you could pop over, and instead of doing the Xerox thing, they could just make just a PCB for upload you. Upload your design online and pick it up the next day yeah. or a few hours later. Wow, exactly. that's really interesting. I hadn't even thought of that. It's a really good application of that, sort of making it accessible to consumers mm -hmm. as opposed to just corporations in a really kind of retail way. Yeah. Um, so beyond 3D printing, what have you seen at the show that has really caught your eye? I'm going to have to be honest and say I've seen I've seen our booth and I haven't had the chance to see anything. I'm actually so happy for the invitation. Just been living in your booth because this this gets me actually out of where I've been so far and into the uh, you know the main center. It's been so really popular though. Everybody back. wants to come see this 3D printer. It's pretty amazing yeah, the absolutely. response you've gotten. I haven't I mean, been able to leave. Even our producer Bonnie is so excited about this, and this is this is something everybody can get excited about because this is technology that I mean this could really change so much of what we see in. For example, I, the things that I think of are small crowdfund uh, right. stuff where they want to rapid prototype something as they're you know, creating yeah. and then all of a sudden they have that product, they're ready to take it to crowdfunding, they're ready to get you know, their money from the public, but it's a polished product and they're able to put it together so much quicker Absolutely. and with less money and less investment than they would normally R&Ding something for mm -hmm. you know, a year, two years, three years. I mean, this is really something that could could change the industry, yeah, everybody. I mean, absolutely. I mean, one, one other thing which, just to butt in and add, but there's more, oh, is, is really that when you start thinking, this is the PCB, but when you start thinking about, you know, maybe a, a few months down the road, a, a year or two down the road, if this is a printed object, actually PCBs are pretty low tech. Why do you need a PCB? You could just print it within, within. the object, the finished product. The structure of yeah, the object itself. if you itself. want bits of it to be flexible, bits of it to be rigid. You know, why is the Fitbit the shape that it is? It's because it's got the PCB in there. So right. get rid of it. Print it, and then we you know, can make print it the whole thing, any shape you like. That is really interesting. Thank you so much sure. for coming and talking Thank to you. us about Dragonfly 2020. Uh, you guys can check that out online. It is, Please. it's really impressive. Please, like, go watch the videos on YouTube. It's really cool. Uh, we are going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we are going to show you some amazing products that are on the show floor here at CES 2016. And then later after that, it is CES in depth with Brian Cooley and Scott Stein. They are going to wrap up the day's events and tell you what all of it means. They got to decipher it for you, uh, but we will be back. So stick around. It's CNET live at CES.
Do you need a professional level tablet, but you don't want to pay professional level prices? Uh, if you want to spend less than you would on something like, I don't know, a Lenovo uh, ThinkPad X1 tablet or a Microsoft Surface Pro 4, well then you've got Dell's new Latitude 11 5000 series nestled right in there, uh, more powerful and more capable than a lot of the least expensive atom powered tablets. That's because this guy has uh, an Intel Core M processor, the second generation of those Core Ms, uh, that give you decent performance, really good battery life, designed for really slim, really light systems that don't need a lot of fan cooling. Uh, now this version right here has got a 10.8 inch screen. It's actually got uh, some nice features you don't usually see in mid-price tablets, and that it's got a 1920 by 1080 full HD display. It's got a magnesium alloy chassis, and of course, if you wanted to turn it into a clamshell laptop, you just snap on one of the couple of uh, keyboard docks they have. Uh, this is the most traditional looking one right here, and you have something that looks and feels like a regular laptop. Uh, you put the entire thing together, and it's going to cost you about $750 to start when it's available later this year. Uh, at CES 2016, that is the Dell Latitude 11 5000 series. This is the future. I'm excited to be here tonight to show off the new Daiquiri Smart Helmet. And we've been working with Intel to redesign the helmet from the ground up. The result is an extremely powerful piece of technology. It has a sixth generation Intel Core M7 processor and RealSense camera technology built right into the helmet. That's amazing. That's an amazing amount of technology in this. This is truly different. That's right. We think we're changing the way that people think about safety and it's going to have a dramatic impact on workers. And it's something that you really have to see. So Sam here, our industrial worker, he's going to show us how powerful the helmet can be. Now, normally the smart helmet is wireless, but we've attached a cable so the audience can see exactly what Sam is seeing. Here, the smart helmet is recognizing the equipment Sam is working with. And it's going to use computer-enhanced vision to actually read the gauges of the equipment. If you look, it's identified a potentially dangerous pressure problem. So it's going to use augmented reality to give Sam step-by-step -step work instructions to fix the problem. Knowing what steps to take and in what order can reduce the time and increase the safety of these activities. It's amazing. I mean, it's truly an amazing system. Thanks. And, and when it's done, it's actually going to ha help Sam order a replacement part. But that's not all. Let's show you another aspect of the Daiquiri Smart Helmet. If you look on the adjacent wall, there's another set of equipment. And from outward appearances, everything looks fine. But let's switch on the thermal vision. With this, it's like giving the worker x-ray vision. He can actually see through objects and identify potential problems before they occur in electrical, mechanical, and even plumbing systems. But what truly distinguishes this drone from all the other drones that are out there is the Intel RealSense module. Using an Intel RealSense camera and an Intel CPU, with the collision avoidance technology we've developed with Ascending Technologies, this drone goes everywhere. It goes in the woods. It grows around trees. It can navigate any obstacle. This is the world's most advanced collision avoidance system in a consumer drone. It's designed for real outdoor experiences. It's light, it's portable, it goes in the backpack, and it truly understands its environment. But it's one thing to see a drone up on a pedestal. That's easy. It's another to see it in action. What we've done again is built the equivalent of an outdoor GPS inside. Then we mocked up a short mountain bike trail. I challenged our demo team to prove that the unique drone can follow a rider even when confronted obstacles like fake trees. So what you see is the drone not being piloted by anybody, but simply optically following the biker. And now it's in the lead mode. You'll see the drone's actually in front of the biker, avoiding the trees. Now as the biker gets around to the end of his course, you'll see the drone automatically just waits and flips and goes into follow me mode. Now a drone without real sense would have no way to avoid these obstacles and to capture the image real time. 
But this drone is different, and it can react to obstacles real time. So let's see what happens if we put out a real time obstacle. You see the drone was able to stop and wait and go around that obstacle as well, following the rider all the time. Any other commercial drone out there would have crashed into a tree. In the mobile world, LETV may not be a big name, but Qualcomm definitely is. Here at CES 2016, China-based video streaming company and burgeoning mobile company LETV demoed its La Max Pro smartphone, the first handset we've seen running the Snapdragon 820 processor from Qualcomm. Now, Qualcomm already demoed its upcoming Snapdragon 820 chip back in November, and it's a processor that will be rolling out in many of your favorite flagship phones throughout the year. But we haven't seen it powering a working smartphone, until now, that is. Qualcomm claims that the chipset is 40% more power efficient and has a 40% increase in performance compared to its predecessor. As for the phone, it has a 6.33 inch display with a 1440 pixel resolution. It features a 21 megapixel camera and a 3.4 ampere hour battery. The device also starts at 32 gigs of internal memory, but it can go up to 128 gigs, and it has four gigs of RAM. As of now, LETV has not released any pricing or availability information yet. For CNET, I'm Lin La, and be sure to check out all our CES 2016 coverage at CNET.com. This particular self-balancing transportation vehicle actually has a real unique trick up its sleeve, is that this one transform into your own personal robot. Hello world, it's been one hours and 12 minutes since I last seen the world. Good to be back. We missed you too. So, okay, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> what else can this device do? Well, because it's an open platform, Brian, we can pretty much program it with a little know-how to do anything that we want. So, okay, you can hear that alarm. Let me give you a specific example. So that alarm is actually our automatic connected home door a sensor alerting us that someone is actually in our front foyer there. So, you know, if we were away from home, we would go ahead and get an alert, or maybe we're on the couch watching the game and we don't want to get up. If I had my own personal assistive robot, wouldn't I just let that guy go directly to the door and see who was there for me? That would be me. I would, uh, I would love to not get up off the couch and just have something go tell me who's there. That would, that would be my perfect world. Yep, and the Segway robot has a ton of really cool features like voice recognition, and also you can see it's streaming video all the way as it comes up to the door, and oh, well, who do we have there? It looks like we have Puli, who's the inventor of, uh, from Ninebot of the Segway robot. And, well, our robot's just going to go ahead and uh, escort him back over into the living room here and uh, say hi. So since we knew who Lee was, we are okay with him entering our house and uh, watching a game with us. Tonight. Yeah, otherwise the robot would just kick him out. But that's the beauty of having an incredibly intelligent as well as connected platform is that with an Intel Atom processor as well as the RealSense camera that we have built in, all of it's able to take all of the vision, have all of the smarts and all of the balance to really do an autonomous run without knocking all over the lamps in your house. Right, and I think that's important, right? That was a live demo using real sense navigating this uh, furniture real time. What's up guys, Brian Song here at CES 2016 and in an effort to be more efficient with space, Sony has come up with probably the smartest bulb that I know. This is their LED speaker bulb. Speaker? meets light bulb together. Like, I can get really close, and I'm hearing music right now. Now it's controlled with an app, it talks to it through Bluetooth or NFC, and they also have a physical adapter that you can use to turn the light on or off, so they're giving you the option of both worlds. It comes with a range of 192 colors, so you can control that as well. But this is really the most unique smart bulb that you'll find here at CES. It'll be coming out sometime in the summer of 2016. No price yet, but there you have it, a first look at Sony's LED speaker bulb at CES 2016. Hi, you're looking at Sony's newest HDR TV for 2016. This is the XBR X930D. This television is 65 inch behind me. It's also available in a 55 inch. The real deal in this television is it's extremely thin. If you look at it from the side, uh, really a very thin design. Sony has not actually published the final spec on how thin, however, but um, you know it's about as thick as a phone, maybe a little bit thicker. Uh, of course, the top is a little bit thinner than the bottom, but you get the idea. It's a really nice, slim design, especially when you hang it on the wall. 
Another feature of this TV is the HDR compatibility. Like a lot of TVs at CES 2016 this year, it'll handle new HDR content, which gives you better, brighter colors and also better black levels so you can play that content, make it look spectacular. Of course, it doesn't have the full array local dimming backlight found on some other TVs, including the step-up 75-inch Sony, so it's not going to be quite as good looking as some of those other HDR TVs, but it should be pretty good picture quality. We'll see how much that thinness affects that picture. That's a quick look at Sony's XBR X930D. I'm David Katzmeyer at CES 2016. Tracking what you eat is no easy task, but a small startup known as Diet Sensor is hoping to change that. Diet Sensor claims that with a small molecular scanner, it can instantly collect accurate and user-friendly nutritional data of a variety of food. How does it do this? It uses a SIO device. This is a small scanner developed by a company out of Israel known as Consumer Physics, and it can measure the chemical makeup of materials. Here's how it works. The handheld scanner sends an infrared beam down into the food or beverage. That data that records is then transferred to the Diet Sensor app, where it's analyzed and makes up a food profile. But it's not perfect. The scanner can only read foods with a single layer. That means crackers, bread, cheese, and cereal. For example, it was unable to read the Snickers bar I had with me. The diet sensor is a step in the right direction and definitely makes for an interesting future, but it's very pricey. The sensor will cost you 250 bucks and diet sensor's app will cost you 10 to $20 a month and that gets you access to its food database and the analytical data. But it's not gonna be released until around July, maybe as late as September. So we'll have to wait to see if this is the future of food logging. I'm Dan Graziano at CES. Thanks for watching. I'm checking out Lumo Run, a running system that not only measures how fast and how far you go, but makes you a better runner. This little tiny sensor can measure all sorts of metrics about how you're actually moving and giving you real-time coaching to run better. And it fits inside these shorts that are available for both men and for women. The sensor feeds all of its data to the Lumo Run app available for iOS and Android. The shorts go on sale in spring 2016 and they'll retail for about $150 depending on the style you get. The men's shorts are loose fitting and the women's have a tighter capri. The Lumo Run app offers real time detailed feedback on your running form while also showing you where you went, how fast you went, and the full distance that you travel. At the end of every workout, you get a full report of exactly how your running form was and how to improve it the next time you go out for a workout. Lumo Run uses similar technology that you'd find in a full running lab, but you can use it on your workouts anywhere you go. This is Acer's Aspire Switch 12S. It's a two-in-one hybrid that's a laptop and a tablet when you need it to be. You've probably seen a few hybrid laptops, but Acer's Switch line does things a little differently. There are no buttons to press or latches to lock. Instead, you'll just pull. Powerful magnets keep things in place. That makes it really easy to detach and say you want to pop it around and try it in a different mode. This is Acer's big Aspire switch yet. There's a 12.5 inch IPS display and you can get it with a full HD 1080p screen. Or in some markets, you can go all the way up to 4K. The Switch 12 also includes Thunderbolt 3 on USB-C. That's one port that'll support Thunderbolt and USB-C and mini display port. So it does a whole bunch of jobs at once. Now the older models in the Aspire Switch line were made of plastic, but this is made of adenized aluminum and it feels really good. It's light, it feels nice and sturdy, and uh, it looks really sleek, but you're gonna pay for that upgrade. When it arrives in February, it's gonna start at $9.99. Head over to CNET for more and be sure to check out our full CES coverage. What's up guys, Brian Tong here at Sony's booth and in my hand, right, a little small thing. This is Sony's portable ultra short throw projector. Now, what makes this special, right? This is a portable projector. You can really place it anywhere in your house. It can project on a ceiling, on a wall, on a floor, really the surface that you want. That's what it can do for you. I'm gonna put it down here just to show you. It takes a few seconds, but once it orients itself, it will then project the image, a video, a movie, onto that surface. It comes with an app that you can talk to it to send the content to it. Also, it has an HDMI adapter, so if you wanted to play video games, you had a Blu-ray player, that could shoot that image onto any surface. Now, when you also talk about 
how big an image you can get. It ranges anywhere from 20 inches to 80 inches. So you can get a big, nice wall and watch any movie any way you want. But there you have it. This is Sony's portable ultra short throw projector coming out sometime in summer. No price yet, but can't wait to see these when they're out. Ever wanted to play Pac-Man by swinging your arms wildly in the air? Soon you can, thanks to a little gadget called the Moth Band. It's connected via Bluetooth to this tablet over here, which is running an actual copy of Pac-Man that I'm going to control with my arms. There's an accelerometer and gyroscope in this band, which communicates over Bluetooth to the tablet, which then asks servers in the cloud what kind of motion I performed. We're going to see Pac-Man chomp down some pellets just when I swing my arms wildly, thanks to this technology. Oh boy. The Moth Band's already available. The Namco Bandai Pac-Man experience will be coming in spring 2016. All right. That tablet has awesome speakers, said no one ever, until today. Huawei announced the MediaPad M2 at CES 2016 and the 10 inch tablet stands out due to its four speakers, two on the bottom and two on top. I wasn't able to try out the speakers firsthand because it was as loud as a Las Vegas nightclub in the demo area. However, Huawei, who partnered with Harman Kardon, claims that they're heavy on the bass. Considering most tablet speakers suck, I'll have to hear it to believe it. I did get a chance to use the stylus that comes with the tablet. It's as comfortable as using a pen and the preloaded notes app worked smoothly when recognizing my handwriting. The Huawei tablet is expected to go on sale sometime later this year with pricing starting at $350. Hey guys, I'm checking out the Recon Jet glasses. They have a tiny heads up display that shows you stats about your workout, whether you're running or biking or even skiing. They can show you how fast you're going, what distance you travel. You can even download trail maps to see where you are. And you can import all the information that you get into your computer to get a full report on your workout. The glasses use GPS trackers to see where you're going and how fast you're getting there. You can also use these glasses to take photos of wherever you are. They're also available in the Recon Snow 2 model, which is for skiing. You can get the Recon Jet now for $500, and they come in black, white, and clear. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce MyTV. This is a new personalized and intelligent user interface. As I mentioned before, our list of channels and on-demand programming continues to grow dramatically. In turn, we know our user experience must evolve. That's why we'll start rolling out our next generation UI in a phased approach beginning later this quarter. We want to make sure that we create a simple yet intelligent user interface. What this means is we're now able to shape the user interface using various data inputs. As part of our phase launches this year, our new interface will continue to get more and more personal. It will be able to tailor in real time the types of programming with which you're presented. It'll do this by using information like previous viewing habits, including time of day, day of week, location, popularity, to create a more personalized experience. And it all starts with my TV. You have a favorite TV show or movie? Just tell us and then you'll never have to hunt for it again as it'll be front and center in my TV. If you had to stop in the middle of one of your favorite shows, you don't need to worry because MyTV will have it ready for you to finish playback. And as MyTV grows, you'll see the addition of recommended content based on your viewing preferences. Over time, we'll add intelligence to show you content based on the time of day and your viewing device. And MyTV will become your go-to spot to find all of your content in one place. Popular content will also be presented as an option to make sure you never miss a must-see event. So today, we have the biggest news since the launch of Hopper 2, introducing Hopper 3, the best hopper we have ever made. It is fast, powerful, and full of amazing technologies 
that makes it the most advanced DVR in the world. Let's look at the basics. Hopper 3 is powered by a Broadcom 7445 chipset. That's a quad-core ARM processor with a 1.5 gigahertz clock running at 21,000 DMIPS. Let me put that into perspective. Hopper 3 is seven times more powerful than Hopper 2. It is seven times more powerful than DirecTV's newest genie, the HR54, and is twice as powerful as the most powerful retail DVR, the TiVo Bolt. This speed and power not only enables some amazing applications, it also translates to a smooth and snappy user interface. For example, if you look at the guide on Hopper 3, you can see it's fast and responsive. Hopper 3 continues to come with a two terabyte hard drive so users can store up to 500 hours of their favorite shows in high definition. It is also the first DVR to feature USB 3.0, 10 times faster than USB 2.0, so users can easily expand the storage space and never miss out on their favorite shows. Hopper 3, connected to wired, wireless, and 4K joeys, continues to be the center of the whole home DVR experience. And tonight I'm very excited to talk to you about relevant advancements that are designed and engineered to make your lives richer, fuller, and more meaningful. Now, with that in mind, I'm excited to share with you our newest 4K Handycam with an all-time best in 4K picture quality through the combination of a newly developed lens and sensor. The new 26.8 millimeter Zeiss lens, along with 20 times optical zoom, captures, captures stories in high resolution with even greater detail, be it a precious birthday or a memorable film screen. Its stability, compactness, and accurate color reproduction enables you to focus on capturing the right moment while the Handycam captures just the right detail. The resurgence of vinyl shows continuing passion for music in many, many forms. This year, our new PSHX500 turntable brings the emotional connection and novelty of vinyl to the portability and quality of a high-resolution digital file. We're listening to those who want to preserve their vinyl and high-res quality and those who want to easily enjoy their records in high fidelity, whether at home or on the go. This portable ultra-short throw projector throws up to an 80-inch image despite its compact size. And it can be set up anywhere, such as on a table or against a wall. You can take it to any room to enjoy your favorite movies, show your vacation photos, and enjoy your favorite content as part of your interior all day long. This week, we're showcasing our pinnacle model, the X93D Sony 4K HDR television, which takes picture quality to new heights. In addition to our 4K processor X1 and triluminous display technologies, the X93D features the new slim backlight drive which boosts peak brightness and black levels more precisely and enhances contrast levels. Picture quality is important to Sony and we recognize that a great viewing experience includes great design. So this year, we'll be broadening our ultra slim line to more models. And not only does that create an expansive borderless picture, it also sits close to the wall virtually disappearing into it and leaving behind nothing but the picture itself. I'd like to introduce you to Replay's 3D video format. It captures the sport and the action you love and turns it into a 3D experience that you can now watch on broadcast, in the stadium, or on your PC at home. 
and as if you're right in the game. It completely changes the experience and what it means to be a spectator. And with this technology, you'll be able to view the game from any angle you want. You will become the director. I know that's hard to believe, so let's take a look at this. Here is an NBA clip from a marquee matchup between LeBron James and Kevin Durant. And you can see LeBron break away. He's got a great uh, stuff there. Nice view, but it wasn't very immersive. I didn't feel like I was there. I didn't see it. Now here is the same experience that we're going to see with us really right there, using replay, real 3D technology. We're going to stop, and what perspective do I want to see it from? Replay is giving you the ability to change the highlights, and it's no longer just limited to broadcasters. So John here is going to show us that we can do replay on our system at home. Now, using a Microsoft Surface Pro 4, we can relive the top highlights of almost any perspective. You can see he's choosing where he wants to go and what perspective he wants to see it from. What you're seeing here is the power to redefine what it means to watch and experience sports. Craig, can you just show us a little bit what you've got and what we're going to do? Yeah, we're going to do something amazing. So again, on the quest to be the most immersive, the most unique experience for gaming possible, well, how about we put you right into the game? Does that sound like I think that would enough? be the best game there is if I'm in there. Well, it's going to be the uh, Brian Kozanich game, so let's go ahead and cue this up. But, and it's really easy to do so. All I need is a real sense enabled 2 in 1 like this uh, HP Spectre X2. And I'm just going to go ahead and using this 3D capture software to take a, little, uh, take a little 3D model of my boss here. And this is going to allow us to take the 3D capture and put it right into our game. So as you can see right now, I'm covering up all of Brian's skin here and capturing that digitally so I can go ahead and right into the game after that. So now he's captured, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at what a separate piece of software, Uranium, has printed out your digital avatar. OK? Yeah, Intel, yeah, huh? Intel blue jumpsuit, all of that. I mean, looking good, good, right? I think it looks great. Perfect. But now we want to take this to the next level. And with Uranium, it works with many, many supported games that we have across, including ones of the most popular type, like we have this beautiful sixth generation modded PC. And according to the theme, we're going to be playing Bethesda's Fallout 4, one of the biggest hits of the season. And uh, well, if you want to see this live, here we go. Ah, that look a little familiar? There I am, and that even looks better than my dog, too. I, I was going to say, that's your dog. OK, so you guys can make the decision. You know, Brian Krasanich, Intel CEO, or Raider of the Apocalyptic Wasteland. You guys can you know, choose your pick, but you're truly living the game. Thanks a lot, Craig. Thank you. Here at CES 2016, Dell has a series of new Latitude systems with some consumer flair. Uh, one of the coolest ones is this slim Windows tablet. It's the 7275, part of the Latitude line. It's a 12.5 inch display. This one I've got right here has a full 4K display. You can get just regular full HD, you can get quad HD, or of course you can get UHD, which is what we call 4K. Inside, they've all got new 6th generation Core M processors, a uh, processor that's finally uh, fast enough to really work for, for mainstream use, business use, casual use. And of course, for a Windows tablet like this, it's really all about how you're going to interact with it. Docking is very important. So Dell has a couple of different keyboard dock options. Um, the one that it ships with is what they call a contactless dock. And that means you basically just slide this tablet right in there, and it connects instantly uh, to the built-in keyboard and touchpad. There's no buttons, there's no switches, uh, or anything to click like that. You just plug it in, and it works. The full package altogether is going to start at less than $1,000 and be available in January. We knew that Alcatel was making a phone with Windows 10 Mobile on it, and here it is. Launching at CES, this is the One Touch Fierce XL that will be an exclusive for T-Mobile. You see that it's got this bright blue color, which we usually have seen on first Nokia and then Microsoft phones, but this time around, it's on this Alcatel here. Although it runs Windows 10 Mobile, it doesn't have two of the standout software features that you see in the higher-end Lumia phones. That's Continuum 
and the iris scanning called Windows Hello. Instead, you're going to find specs that are pretty entry level on the hardware front. You do have this 5.5 inch screen, which is really spacious. On the back, you've got an 8 megapixel camera with a pretty basic 2 megapixel camera up front. I don't have exact pricing details for you yet, but I do expect it to be affordable. You should look for this phone around January or February. So we're here with Android TV, the latest iteration on Sony televisions at CES 2016. What we're showing here, the Android TV is still the same version, it's still Lollipop. Uh, Sony says they're going to get the Marshmallow version of Android TV a little bit later in the year. But on the 2016 TVs, the processing power has been beefed up a little bit, so it'll be a little smoother, it'll run a little faster. There's also some improved capabilities. For example, you can now launch apps by just saying launch YouTube or launch Netflix. You can also search within YouTube, which you couldn't do before, so you can get a voice search within YouTube. You can search for YouTube videos just like you could on your phone, right on the Android TV. Sony has a new remote control that incorporates the touchpad remote and the voice control from that with the standard button remote. It also has a nice feel. The buttons are not really raised that much. So all told, it's a pretty nice improvement to the user interface from the 2015 models. That's a quick look at Sony's Android TV operating system. I'm it's David Katzmeyer for CNET, CES 2016. August announced its new suite of smart doorway devices back in October 2015. A new smart lock, a doorbell camera, and a connected keypad are all designed to give you full control of your doorway. They were supposed to hit the market in December 2015, but the latest hit Apple's HomeKit smart home platform held things back on the lock and the doorbell camera. The company says there is light at the end of the tunnel, though, and it expects to finally receive full sign-off from Apple in a week or two. You'll be able to buy each device individually once they ship, the lock for 230 bucks, the doorbell cam for 200, and the keypad for 80. If you have all three, you'll be able to open and close your door lock remotely, monitor and communicate with anyone at your door via the doorbell cam, and use the keypad to give discrete access to anyone you want to share a code with. We liked the original August Smart Lock when we reviewed it back in February 2015. It looked good, it had the most unencumbered policy around assigning digital access keys to other smartphone owners, and it generally worked pretty well. As this new suite embraces the HomeKit ecosystem, it could become a flagship product for Apple's smart home plans. We'll need to see not only how well it works, but also how well all the various pieces integrate with the HomeKit platform and the other smart home products in it. We hope to find out as soon as it ships, which should be early this year. Before electric cars really revolutionize the market, they need to be two things, cheap and practical. A lot of people have been waiting for Tesla to crack that nut with the Model 3, but Chevy's about to beat them to the punch with this. It's the new Bolt. It has a 200-mile range. It's going to be available for less than $30,000. We got to drive it. We're in the Bolt. We're going to take it for a quick spin. We're going to start with an acceleration test. The car will do 0 to 60 in under 7 seconds, and it's pretty good. That's certainly on par with pretty much any other uh, small economy car that you'd expect in this segment. Um, the car is very nice and roomy. There's a lot of room in here. Flat floor as well, which makes getting from the left side of the car to the right side nice and easy. Which, uh, given the partnership with Lyft, you can see being a good thing, dropping off partners or pedestrians, I should say, uh, be nice and easy regardless of which side of the curb you're on. You can adjust the regenerative braking here by shifting into low, which means that the car will basically allow one pedal driving, meaning you don't have to worry about using the brakes too often. That'll mean that the brakes will last longer. It'll also mean you can go longer on a charge, which is good. Of course, we're talking about uh, 200 miles to a charge, but of course, that'll depend on your driving characteristics, how heavy you are on that right pedal, weather and other factors will also affect your driving range. But ultimately, the car drives quite nicely. It's, of course, nice and quiet, as you would expect from an EV. And again, pretty good amount of power. Inside the Bolt, we have a customized version of Chevy's modeling system, which is completely different than what we've seen in any other cars. Um, it's actually quite customizable, and it looks a lot like Android, as a matter of fact. You can actually go through here and choose a variety of different layouts. You can even do a custom layout, and pick whichever widgets that you want to. These will then be tied back to the driver profile, so as you get in the car, remember who you are and show you the appropriate things. They'll even remember what you were listening to when you got out last time. And being an EV, of course, the car gives you plenty of information about all the electricity and where it's going in the car, how you're using it. You can also get information about your driving economy and also factors that will impact your range, things like terrain and temperature, basically things that will help you to optimize the amount of distance that you can get out of your battery pack. Also some other nice features in here like an LCD dashboard and a pretty cool mirror that actually uses a camera to see behind you instead of just optics. 
Like the Model S, the Bolt has its battery pack situated down low in the floor. This has a lot of advantages, one being handling, it'll help the car to corner better, but it also means you get a lot more room inside, a nice flat floor, plenty of room for plants or pets or pretty much anything else that you want to put into a compact car. Now again, Chevy isn't giving us a formal price for the car. This is just a pre-production model, which explains why these headlights are a little bit ugly and why there's lots of vinyl everywhere. But again, they're saying the price will be under $30,000 after the federal tax rebate and it will have over 200 miles. For the formal numbers, we're gonna to have to wait a little bit longer, but for my first time behind the wheel, it's a pretty impressive little car. Every electronic device you use today relies on one of these. It is a printed circuit board. Now, I know what you're thinking, it's just a circuit board, but this one is different. It's actually been 3D printed on this machine by Nano Dimensions. It's called the Dragonfly. Now, 3D printing a circuit board gives you a couple of different advantages over the traditional method of sending it out to a manufacturing plant. The first one is that your intellectual property can stay safe and be produced in-house. The second is the time it takes. Rather than a couple of weeks to get a prototype of a circuit board back for testing, this takes a couple of hours or even overnight, so it's pretty rapid indeed. Now the tech inside this particular 3D printer is a little different to an, any sort of other 3D printer on the market because of the inks it uses. There is a nano silver conductive ink that's used to print on the boards, as well as a proprietary dielectric ink that's used to make the boards. Size ranges between seven by seven inches as the maximum. You can even print down to as small as two by two millimeters. Now, because this machine is so large and bulky, it is not for the maker community. It is not for you and I. It is for engineers and companies looking to quickly and rapidly test circuit board designs. And for that reason, it's not gonna be available on the market until the end of 2016. The pricing is yet to be disclosed, but if you're an engineering or developing some products and you need a rapid prototyping solution for circuit boards, this could really change the game. Clip them on, pop them in your ears, and press a button. The Misfits Spectre are dual driver Bluetooth headphones, but they can also track activity. They're Misfits' new entry into audio. They get notifications put in your ears, and they're meant to replace your high-end fitness headphones that you may already have. However, are you going to use this in addition to a fitness tracker that's on your wrist? We don't know. We don't know price of Spectre yet, but it's coming out soon. We'll find out more when we get to put these in our ears. We're here at CES 2016 with the Netgear Arlo Q. So unlike Netgear's original Arlo model, this is an indoor only model. But that also means that because it's tethered and not battery powered, it has more features such as 1080p, motion and audio alerts and you can also set activity zones so you can say I do want to record my front yard but I don't want to record the cars going by on the street next to it. It can also integrate with the original Arlo app so if you already have Arlo's original outdoor security cameras you can link up to five on the free cloud storage option. That means that if you have three of the original Arlo cameras and one of these Arlo Qs, then you can still enjoy seven days of free activity-based alerts on your phone. This camera also offers night vision and they do plan to integrate it and other third-party devices in the future. It is available for $219 and be sure to check back for a full review. This is the Razer Blade Stealth, a new laptop from Razer that's a little bit different than what you've seen before. Instead of being an ultra-powerful gaming laptop, it's trying to be the best ultra book you can buy, a thin, quality machine with a USB-C charging port, so you can charge it anywhere using a simple adapter. And if you want a game on it as well, you'll plug it into this box back here, the Razer Core. You just use this single cable to charge it and add the power of a discreet external graphics card in one fell swoop. You can put any graphics card you like into this, AMD or NVIDIA, as long as it's fairly recent and has some support. It supports a double wide graphics card in this aluminum box. You can just pull out a handle and swap in your own graphics card whenever you like. 
Starting at just $999, this laptop will come with a Core i7 processor, 8 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of solid state storage, and you can trade up to a 4K screen and up to 512 gigabytes of storage for $600 more. We're not yet sure what the core is going to cost to get you that external graphics, but it should arrive in the first half of the year. The Razer Blade Stealth also has the first individually RGB backlit keyboard in a laptop, which is a fancy way of saying there's an LED under each and every one of these keys that light up in up to 16.8 million different colors, so you can have them cycle through all kinds of patterns. We've seen some cool ripples and waves that happen just when you tap on these keys. It's pretty neat to look at. That's the Razer Blade Stealth. This is the Razer Stargazer, and it's a webcam unlike any you've ever seen. It's got a pair of camera lenses with Intel RealSets technology to let me do things like this. Log right into Windows just by looking at a computer. It does some other cool things too, let me show you them. Since the Razer Stargazer's two cameras can see in 3D, you can do hand gestures right in front of the camera and launch applications just with a wave of the hand. There's a number of shortcuts you can use there, like a hand with fingers spread, or you can make a fist with the thumbs up right in front of the camera and just switch between apps by making those gestures repeatedly, one after the other, to go to the program you like. The other thing this can do, which I think a lot of people might buy it for, is game streaming. If you like to show off your video game antics online, streaming through Twitch or OBS, you can get a picture-in-picture -picture of your face reacting to the video game, kind of like a green screen, because the cameras can filter out the background from your face as you're playing the game. That's the Razer Stargazer. It'll be coming out in the second quarter of the year for $200. Hey, I'm CNET's Ryan Crisp, here with Samsung's new Wi-Fi equipped Flex Duo slide-in range. And this is a new smart oven from Samsung that is going to be available this spring. Pricing is still to be determined, but we know a little bit about what it's capable of. You'll be able to connect with it over Wi-Fi using your smartphone on a Samsung app. From that app, you'll be able to remotely start cooking or stop cooking, or monitor the progress of whatever you're cooking. Now, it's probably more useful for stopping a bake than starting one, since Samsung requires you to actually hit the start set button on the oven itself before you start cooking in the app. That's a safety feature so that your kid can't grab your phone and start cooking a 500 degree roast when you're away on vacation. Now the oven has the same Flex Duo feature that we've seen in a lot of previous Samsung ranges and thought is a pretty neat feature. The oven is actually able to be split into two cavities and the door either opens on its own together like this or if you squeeze this handle, just the top half opens up, kind of like a pizza oven. A cool feature and it's a cool way to kind of bring Flex Duo to the next level. We like that. The Samsung Wi-Fi Flex Duo slide-in range is available in electric gas and induction models and like I said, pricing is yet to be determined but it will be out this spring and we'll be keeping our eyes out for it.
2016. I'm Brian Cooley, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is Scott Stein. Hi. Dr. Scott Stein. Oh, now we're going to restart. Welcome to CNET's live stage here at CES 2016. I'm Brian Cooley with Professor Scott Stein. Got you another one. <laughs> you did, thank you. <laughs> Professor Pleasure of Technology Interpretation, yeah. Emeritus. Yeah. It's all over, <laughs> yes. exactly. Kind of the thoughtful Time beard stroke. Mm, yes. We're here for day two of CES to bring you what's exciting, which is a lot of stuff, including some new experiences in VR, which we're both excited about. Yes. So here we go. All right, let's get started now with televisions, which I think we kind of have sort of passed over until now. Mm -hmm. The most amazing one rolls up. Yeah, the literally. most amazing. We've seen a lot of TVs, but now we're seeing some concepts behind the scenes. Yes, concepts. LG was showing some some displays. Look at this stuff. David Kassemeyer checked these out. That's a rolling OLED display. It's like a sheet of paper. You curve it up, it shows how flexible these displays can be. And you know how you can tell it's really a breakthrough is that it more than just bends. It literally rolls up. Right. And they let us get near it. Usually when they have something <laughs> super out there like this, they have like five or six people on a velvet rope and we can't get near the thing. We're, we can almost touch this. Yeah, uh, and they show even, the, and this is fixed, but you see in one part of the video how it is actually being rolled, not just that, that mock-up. Not just and, static uh, like that. Right. So, so while it's on. Well, it's it. here, here, right here. Here we so, go. Okay, it's on right now. A little bit exposed, but they're showing it's, it's actually Pretty running. Amazing. Uh, you know, who knows? We're going to roll up your OLED newspaper, but it does show that you can do some interesting things with this, yeah. that the curving can go in all sorts of directions, not just this way. And you're starting to see some of those like S-shaped ones, and who knows, who knows what's going to come next, even beyond TVs. The screen tech is very flexible, can yeah. be adopted. And this has also got big uh, import for retail as well. We'll be talking about retail technology a little bit later in the roundup, but this is the kind of thing that retail installers love to do to create displays like you see at conferences like this, at retail stores. And I guess one of the ideas is, look, you could have a TV that you can roll up and put away when you're not using it, which appeals to a certain you know, lifestyle and design crowd that doesn't want that big black plastic thing out all the time. Magic posters. Some sort of thing yeah. we put on your wall. Uh, Justin Bieber's marketing crew will put these everywhere, like they <laughs> right. do with the chalk on the on the sidewalk. Like All right. Uh, there was also uh, this is cool. And the see-through OLED TV window. What is this weird mix-up? Yeah. So this is also LG, and it's showing what OLED can do. Uh, it, it's a funny thing about OLED. Uh, we talk about how an OLED is fired up, it's there, and when it's not, you get pure blacks, but that also means that when it disappears, there's nothing there, and this screen is showing transparency in place of that black. So you're seeing, oh, yeah, there, there he is, peeking through the window, hello. Uh, there yeah. are some smart windows we've seen, but this is getting to the point where I, th I think it looks more like Minority Report, where it, we keep talking about that as a movie touchstone, but this is, a, I think, this sort of trippy screen imagery like that uh, you can start doing some really interesting things with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, again, a great retail technology, as they're showing here. Also, a great possible tool in the future toolkit for augmented reality. Yes, and I mean, I, maybe maybe like installations, theme parks, theater, all sorts of things. That you head might. up displays. Uh, perhaps this feeds into head up displays in vehicles. Who's to say? I mean, there's, oh, a, there's a, a lot you can do there. A lot yeah. you can do. Yeah. Uh, now. We didn't talk about PCs yet either so far this week. We want no. to get covered on that. Uh, most of them are around a high performance vein. Uh, Origins PC with a wraparound form factor. Now we've seen curved TVs before. This is more pronounced, isn't it? Yeah, this is, uh, and, and PCs have been actually a pretty big story at this show. This is a, I think a 34 inches, a curved screen. Uh, this, this is a high end machine. Origin likes to customize and build out these machines. Yeah. This has replaceable parts though, so you can still go in and, and, and swap out what you need. Huh. So it is designed for, for a serious user, and it just kind of shows what you can do now in these forms. Uh, maybe we'll start seeing all-in-ones. It's usually, all-in-ones are not a thing you tend to see in, in gaming PCs, but this one was, this one was pretty yeah, stunning. It's so modular, they were able to get a curve. There isn't one big flat motherboard. They yeah. use lots of smaller boards, put them in an array around there, and it just looks cool, doesn't it? <laughs> I'd, rather, yeah, I'd rather have that. I want to get in there and stop modding right now. Yeah. There you can, I just want to get my hands on it. A little subwoofer <laughs> built into the back plane there. Get that in, get the VR headset, just set it up neatly. In that's the cool. VR room, it's pretty cool. Okay, that's cool. Another one that I thought was really interesting is um, the Razer 
R-A-Z-E-R, that's the mm -hmm. maker, Blade. Razer's always got an amazing system here, or a controller, or something. Every year, something wild and crazy. This is a laptop, high-performance, compact laptop for gaming, obviously high-perf. External outboard dock for graphics cards. Yes, now this is like, I feel like the MacBook 12 inches again, kicked off that uh, super small laptop trend we're seeing. This is tiny, slim, super thin. Super small, and uh, for a couple of years now, we thought about graphics and possibly being ported out. Yeah. Um, get USB-C, uh, it was talked about with Thunderbolt, but now that's the idea here, is you plug this in, and now, now it's a beefier, it's a big unit, but now you're playing games on it. You unplug it, it's an everyday laptop. Razer has a lot of concepts. The reason why I think it's kind of cool is that Razer's really had a nice track record recently. Uh, their Blade laptops have been great. They've been real, yeah. real deal, great laptops. So even though this looks like a kind of a pie in the sky idea, sometimes I go, oh, what's this, what's this gonna be? Yeah. This looks like a really nice laptop. You can pull it off of that graphics, then you have your desktop station, then you take it on the road and you don't have to get a gaming PC. And USB-C is a big enough pipe to yeah. move that heavy graphics load back and forth. Finally shows what you can do. Impressive, okay, uh, let's turn to some uh, smart home stuff. Now, everyone knows the sleep number bed, right? I mean, they buy more radio commercials than anybody on earth, I think, and TV commercials, so we know them. Uh, it tends to be a multi-thousand dollar fancy bed and all that. They came out with the techiest and, I believe, cheapest of their beds, an interesting intersection, $1,000 for what they call IT, lowercase IT, right. connected mattress, $1,000 that has both the usual sleep number side-by-side -side air variable inflation to get the different sleep number, but you've also got biometric measurement of heart rate, sleep style, respiration, and it has a smart component that will take that information and recommend to you how you should sleep better, when you should go to bed to get well rested, and give you the usual sort of report later of how you slept. Uh, it's, it, it's a smart mattress in, in a true sense. Yeah, and we've seen there are there are little unrollable things that they've had where you can track your, your heart rate and sleep, not have it built into the mattress, but right. to see like a big company doing this interesting, the price, considering it also does that is not bad. Will you use it? I mean, sleep numbers are already pretty good about like, you know, they, they're pushed the idea of like, they want to customize. Com combined, I think, with the idea that it would help customize your sleep, if it's not working for you, yeah. I think that's where it gets interesting as opposed to what does this really mean for me? And I think they're trying to get to a, a purpose. And this can then set the sleep number without you having to guess all the time. Right. Because whenever so I see those commercials exactly. and they say, well, my sleep number is 45, my wife's is 70, how much trial and error did that take? And how did you know it's the right number? Right. What feels good isn't necessarily going to give you the best sleep, but this supposedly will know and do it right. Um, from sleepables to wearables, this is, uh, this is the oddest one we've had yet. The Welt, the Little Samsung belt. Smart Belt. Wins worst name at CES. Yes, that's it. For, for a few <laughs> years now, it's gonna, it'll take that title probably Let's the next the year. There it that's is. The Welt. Wearable Smart Belt, and it does what all belts do, reminds you that you're fat. <laughs> right. By noticing that there's more pressure on sensors in it, it's holding in more girth than it did before Thanksgiving. And so lets you know and how much and gives you a track uh, of how much weight you're going to gain if you keep eating like this in the next few days and weeks. So this is like your enemy. I mean, it makes you miserable every day when you put this thing on. Now it just brings that to your phone right. and throws it in front of your face. <laughs> every day. So you will never be able to justify uh, it in, in any sense. lousy thing. Smart the, suit the from Samsung. Yes, they're exploring, you know, I think they're throwing stuff against the wall, but it bears noticing, keep an eye on things like fabrics and suits. Google with their Project Jacquard where they have this conductive fabric. Here the suit looked like it was trying to throw information yeah. to like digital business cards. It, it's this group, you know, Samsung's got their own, uh, their own research and development teams. Uh, they're showing off products that not even the, the our normal product representatives know about. <laughs> right. You know, these are the things where you go, there are what's coming? of Samsung that Samsung doesn't know about. Right, they literally, you ask the Samsung rep sometimes and you say, what's coming? They go, I don't know, go check it out. We're check. surprised as Let well. Uh, and okay. that's what's kind of cool to us. Great trivia, Samsung has a fashion clothing line Nothing to do with tech. They are a clothing maker in Korea. I had no idea. So they it actually make, plays in. And this plays into that. Uh, drones. We've seen all kinds of drones here at the show, of course. But none that you can ride in. That just changed. Our Ashley Esqueda is actually right with a drone that will carry you, not just take video of you. Let's take a look at what she found there. Ready? Hey guys, Ashley Esqueda with Cena down here on the show floor in South Hall. 
Drones are a really big story at CES this year, but what about a drone that can carry a whole person in it? This is the Ehang 184. It has eight rotors. They are humongous. Also, we're going to check out the cockpit. Check this out. You're going to get in here. You're going to check out this map. There's going to be locations you can tap on. You're going to tap on your location, and this is an autonomous aerial vehicle. It is going to take you exactly where you need to go, and you don't need a pilot's license. That's one of the goals of Ehang 184. The founder of the company actually was inspired by, unfortunately, the death of his friends who were small, pilot, uh, small plane pilots. So they wanted to design something that nobody needed a pilot's license to pilot, to go places, but could get them from short ranges without as much danger. Uh, you want to limit your danger here. So the Ehang 184 is designed to do just that, and it gets up to 65 miles an hour. You got 23 minutes of battery life. On top of that, it gets up to 11,000 feet in the air. That is really, really high. I think I'm terrified of heights. I don't want to go that high, but it'll hover generally about 500 to 1,000 feet. This thing is going to be available to real consumers, and the goal is that it's not going to be exclusive to the billionaire circuit. So get out your millions or your hundreds of thousands uh, and get ready to buy the Ehang. Once those regulations and the FAA approves this, I predict I'm going to have one of these to get through LA traffic. That's it from the show floor. Make sure you check out all of our coverage on CNET.com slash CES. Moving into an interesting one that has a retail angle, kind of like, oh. Okay, we're back with CES In-Depth, day two of the show here in Las Vegas. Brian Cooley with Scott Stein. Uh, another technology that has some retail import, kind of like a couple of displays we just saw. Again, in the display category, something called Memo Me's Magic Mirror. It's an evolution of a product that we have seen a year ago, but now apparently about to move into actual stores. This is a mirror that, uh, all right, here's BT doing his thing. It's a mirror you get in front of and you see yourself changed while you're in front of it in real time. So here's BT in his clothes and changing color of the clothing so he can try different styles and clothes on at the store without having to try different clothes on. See how they look, at least for color. Now, depending on what kind of a back end you've got on this, in terms of computation and AI, you could move beyond color, you could also move to fit, okay. fabric texture, garment. You can just run through the entire store without ever going to the store and get a pretty good approximation of how something looks on you. This is what I, you know, what I really want to do is I want to just basically see this move into my television. I want this, I, I want the software and the, and the cloud processing, and of course, you've got to be able to shake your butt because you're BT. Um, and be able to get that into something that I've got in my home so I never have to go to the store again and try on clothes. I hate that. I feel miserable. I know if I don't do that, then I'm going to regret it anyhow. Right, you have to bring it back. I don't want to just randomly order right. it, but yeah, I want that. 
I also want some sort of like uni suit that would just, I don't know how that would do that. Like three core items that would just keep changing colors and you could just pick just out. Just tons of drawstrings. You can make it yeah. baggy or tight depending on how you want to wear it each day. Okay, uh, let's move through the last couple things we've got going on here. Uh, that would be, uh, where am I here? I'm lost. Dragonfly, oh, I'm right here. Okay, yeah. the Dragonfly 20. Circuit board printer. This prints circuit boards. So you print things now, they're just all plastic or materials. What if you could print something that has integrated circuits, literally integrated circuits inside of it? But think of it, the traces, the electrical traces can just be another layer. As long as it's conductive ink that you've got from one nozzle, just draw the conductive part while you're adding case layers around it, substrate layers around it. It's actually brilliant. It's fantastic. You think about building prototypes for items, you can now 3D print circuit boards. Maybe you can 3D print an entire computing device uh, that you want to test out and prototype. And one of the biggest expenses in manufacturing electronics is all the discrete components and the expensive machines that place them and drop them on there. This is a step toward the idea that you literally print something that used to be complicated, discrete components. That's really solid state, if you get right down to it. Yeah, That's truly it's, solid it's state. I think we're going to start seeing things that use that very soon. All right, Mr. Porn Boy. Yeah. Wrap the show up. <laughs> Wrap it up, tell me what happened. It's got a lot of attention. It's going to get a lot of attention at the show. Big use for VR, adult entertainment. Turns out that there was one company uh -huh. that we've seen, Naughty America, that has been very forward-facing about putting this out there for us to experience. Yep. Brian Tong got to experience it. Vanessa got to experience it uh -huh. here on the stage. Uh, you, you may have seen their reactions. Pretty intense. This is... Uh, you have to sideload, get ready to sideload if you're going to experience this at home uh, because these, these developers, they, they don't want you to be using adult entertainment. So they're basically telling you to download these files. They're 180 degree 3D and I did try this out. Uh, and, and you download it to local storage and try to make sure that people don't discover some cache of it. They have about half a dozen videos or so, so far. They feel hallucinatory. Have you ever seen Strange Days? or the old movie Brainstorm. That's not Brian Tong's body. <laughs> no, I'm afraid it's yours. Yeah, it's my body. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm a stunt. That's how I, you know, it's my that's side job. That's Professor Stein. That's what I do. You're really about to side <laughs> Professor Stein That's my eyes. concern, yeah. Yeah, so um, this uh, is, it's very convincing. That's what I can say. The close range, not technically, it's close range, very high resolution, very well optimized, nicely done. Very disturbing. Bullshit. Well, yeah. <laughs> Very disturbing. No, ah. perif no peripherals yet. You there, Scott you there. I tried it on in there. Oh, I was. I tried out the uh -huh. full. I tried on the whole experience. The stuff wow. you should not ever see. I told my mother I was going to go into a nice, clean profession. Yeah. And here I am, with you. This is the future. <laughs> This All right. is the future. This is the future. Help us all. Okay, that's it for tonight. Don't judge me. What an experience. Never do. Brian Cooley and Professor Stein will be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock Pacific with the big roundup of the whole show with our picks for the top 10 products of CES 2016. So a really big zoom out. That's not nearly all that's happening here on the CNET stage, though. We've got the smell alarm clock waking us up at 9 a.m. We'll crack open a hoverboard with fire extinguishers standing by because, let's face it, your airline won't let you transport one anymore. Plus, our appliance team will discuss their favorites here at the show as well. So we'll see you bright and early, kind of mid-early tomorrow morning. Yeah. We'll sleep in a little bit. A little relaxing. You and your VR stuff. I get a download. Yeah, I bet, side, you, I bet you will. Got a side load. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>